Yu-Gi-Oh! has changed a lot since the first season of the anime, with the game having grown steadily more complex and cards more powerful as time went on. But even with this persistent power creep, Yami Yugi has remained as loyal to his cards as they have to him, no matter the era or timeline. Whether he's facing gods in Battle City, forging bonds beyond time, or exploring the dark side of dimensions, he's always treated his cards more like loyal companions instead of just creatures and has inspired thousands of real-life duelists to do the same. So in this video, we're going to go over the 10 most important cards in Yugi's decks, how they were used in the anime or manga, and whether or not these cards have had any kind of impact on the real-life Yu-Gi-Oh! metagame. And swarming in at number 10, we have Karibo, Yugi's favorite furball that managed to prove their worth despite how often they were mocked for being the weakest monster in the game by the likes of Pegasus, Kaiba, and even My Valentine. And looking at Karibo, You'd probably agree with them because it has a terrible stat line of only 300 attack and 200 defense. Which made it pitifully weak even against the Duelist Kingdom era, where just about every other monster in the game dwarfed it. But Karibo was always more than just its stats, since it also has an effect in both the anime and the card game, which allows you to discard it from your hand during the damage calculation of a battle where your opponent's monster declared an attack to make it so that you don't take any damage from that battle. This effect was used a bunch in the anime in order to save Yugi's life points in dire situations, which gave the Pharaoh an extra turn to try and fight back. This was an integral part in the Battle City semifinals against Kaiba in order to protect Yami from Obelisk's onslaught, and was ultimately one of the deciding factors that allowed for Yugi to win that duel and go on to face Merrick. But that's not the only way Karibo defended Yugi's life points, because it actually had a few hidden abilities and potential that only Yugi could see and was specifically strong when paired with Multiply, a card which was capable of swarming an infinite number of Karibos to create an impenetrable wall that no monster could break. This was especially effective when paired with Karibos' ability to detonate on contact with an opponent's monster, to either weaken them or destroy them outright, which ended up being pretty much the entire reason that Yami was able to deal with Pegasus' Thousand Eyes Restrict to save his grandpa. Essentially, Karibo was supposed to represent the idea that even though a card might appear weak at first, a smart duelist that cares about their cards is going to find a way to use it to its full potential, an idea that's still incredibly important to Yu-Gi-Oh! to this day, which is why probably every protagonist to date has had their own Karibo variant in either the anime or the manga, to show off how weak cards can have a huge impact. Although, despite how iconic Karibo is for representing this ideal, the card never really made too much of a splash in the TCG, with Karibo itself only having seen competitive play in old chaos strategies as a dark monster that could easily find its way to the graveyard for you to later banish for something like a chaos sorcerer. But other than in chaos, Karibo itself has never seen any competitive play. Multiply might generate you a ton of tokens, but it's an unreliable two-card combo and there are other cards which can do a way better job of protecting your life points. The most play it saw was probably in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, as stopping the damage from one attack from the hand was actually a pretty good effect in certain stall decks. With only three monster zones and before stronger X deck monsters came out, sometimes you only needed to stop one attack per turn in order to make it to your next turn. And with the plethora of back or removal options that people had in their decks, cards that could stop attacks from the hand did have some value. However, a ton of different Karibo variants, counterparts, and evolutions keep popping up within the TCG metagame, whether it's Sangan in older formats, Karibanded in Burning Abyss, or Link Karibo during Spiral's Tier 0 reign, Karibo has always managed to keep reappearing in some way, shape, or form, to guide and assist new generations of duelists just like how it aided Yugi. At times, even Yugi doubted Karibo, but no matter how often it was mocked or made fun of, he was an incredibly important part of Yugi's deck, and one that was responsible for winning him tons of duels, as a monster, as a deck master, and even as a friend. And while in the TCG it lacks the versatility that it had in the anime, Karibo and his variants still managed to find a way into the decks of duelists everywhere to show that even the weakest monsters have their strengths. Lighting the way to number 9 is Swords of Revealing Light the first spell card that Yugi ever activated in the anime, and one that saved him from defeat a ton of different times on different occasions. Because what this card does is lock your opponent's monsters under its light and prevents them from being able to attack, but only for three turns. Because during the end phase of your opponent's third turn after you activate it, the swords destroy themselves. This is the most iconic effect of swords, but it also comes with a lesser known effect when you activate it, which causes all set monsters your opponent controls to be flipped face up, revealing your opponent's hidden tricks. This second effect proved incredibly useful in Yugi's duel against Panic, who hid his monsters in the darkness of the duel field where Swords of Reeling Light managed to clear away the darkness. But of course, Swords of Reeling Light is best known as Yugi's main stall tool, and one that he'd activate in the face of impossible odds after opponent had brought out their boss monster in order to give himself three more turns to try and turn the duel around, 
trusting that the heart of the cards will eventually draw him to what he needs to defeat whatever insurmountable odds his opponent has set up. And the most famous example of this is when Yugi activated swords in the first duel of the anime, locking Kaiba's two blue eyes white dragons from being able to attack as he scraped through his deck for a way to win the duel, stalling out until he realized the power of his grandpa's cards and eventually drawing into the five pieces of the unstoppable Exodia. In the actual game, Swords Revealing Light isn't as effective of a staple as the anime would have you believe, since there are a ton of different ways to remove it from the field, and even if it resolves, it doesn't stop your opponent from actually building their board in the first place. Which is why it's so surprising that there have actually been a couple of times where Swords has been competitively viable, for the exact same reasons that Yugi would use it in the anime to stop your opponent's boss monster from ending the game while also guaranteeing that you remain alive for a few more turns so that you can draw onto your outs. This was important when Gladiator Beast was seeing competitive success, since it was a way to stop the Gladiator Beast from being able to battle and declare their effects. But even in the modern competitive games, Swords Revealing Light still sees play in runic stun strategies to floodgate the opponent out of ending the game by battle while accumulating a ton of free advantage from fountain draws. In the anime, Swords of Villain Light was a safety net that Yuki could cast in just about every situation that gave him enough turns to make a comeback. And while this effect is a lot more niche in the TCG, decks that can play Swords genuinely appreciate its ability to stall the game so they can draw to their decks versions of Exodia, which shows that even the most competitive decks out there still need to believe in the heart of the cards. And charging into number 8 is Gaia the Fierce Knight, a warrior monster that came in clutch for Yugi several times due to the number of different forms he could take. By himself, Gaia is just a vanilla monster that requires two tributes, and while its attack stat is decently high, it pales in comparison to a ton of other two tribute vanilla monsters. But for what Gaia lacked in offensive power, he makes up for it in his adaptability. You see, in the anime and manga, while Gaia was a powerhouse, he grew even stronger if you managed to evolve him into a new form in the middle of the duel. The most common way Yugi did this was by fusing Gaia with Curse of Dragon to form Gaia the Dragon Champion a vanilla fusion monster that had an impressive 2600 attack stat that was capable of packing a punch, and appeared as a focus as one of the most iconic moments in the Duelist Kingdom arc, where Yugi launched the Dragon Champion with Catapult Turtle into Panic's Castle of Dark Illusions to crush his monsters after the Sword of the Villain Light had dissipated. But the Dragon Champion wasn't the only form that Gaia took, because the other evolved form of Gaia occurs after the Black Luster Ritual occurs so that he becomes the Black Luster Soldier, one of Yugi's most powerful cards with an attack and strength that matches the Blue Eyes White Dragon. Now, just like in the anime, Gaia by himself has never seen a sustained amount of competitive success. But there are actually quite a few cards that are either linked to or evolved from Gaia that have had a metagame impact, with the best by far being Black Luster Soldier and Void of the Beginning. Envoy of the Beginning was an insane boss monster for any strategy playing Chaos Aptitude monsters, since it could act as removal for your opponent's monsters by banishing them, or could just OTK an opponent outright with its double attack. And thankfully for this BLS, you didn't need to perform a Ritual Summon, nor did you need the original guy to bring it out, as all of the power of the BLS came at a small cost of banishing a light and dark monster from your graveyard to summon him. In both the anime and the game itself, Guy is definitely not the strongest card on this list but was one of the first monsters in the game that showed us the strength of using one monster as material for another, whether that's for a fusion, synchro, axes, a link, or a ritual monster. And without Gaia, there is no dragon champion, and there's no BLS, which definitely makes him one of the most important pieces of the puzzle that is Yugi's deck. And thundering into number 7 is the Summon Skull, a key member of the Arcfiend archetype that actually holds the title of Yugi's first ace monster. Summon Skull is another vanilla beat stick, much like Gaia, but is specifically notable in the TCG for being a level 6 monster, which made it an impressive boss monster in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh! and in playground formats since it had an attack set that matched the Dark Magician, but required one less hull tribute. The anime version of Summon Skull was an important part of Yugi's arsenal for this reason, since it was a high attack beater that was capable of dealing with a ton of different threats based purely on its attack power alone all the way from Dula's Kingdom up until Yugi and Yami's final duel against one another. But it was actually within the original Yu-Gi-Oh! manga where Summon Skull shined the most, as Yugi's original ace monster. That, according to Kaiba, was one of the top 5 strongest monsters in the entire game. A fact that this manga showed off well with Summon Skull beating down each and every one of Kaiba's monsters, and forced Kaiba to cheat to bring out Sugoroku Moto's stolen Blue Eyes White Dragon. But this duel didn't just show off the power of the original ace Arcfiend, it also showed an ideal that was incredibly important to the events of Season Zero Yugi, and one that stuck with duelists to this day. 
respecting and having loyalty to your cards so they, in turn, will be loyal to you. Summon Skull appeared to Yugi after several turns of Kaiba's Battle Ox destroying Yugi's monsters, and rewarded Yugi for his faith in his deck by letting him stage a comeback. This in contrast to Kaiba's Summon of the Blue-Eyes White Dragon, a card which didn't belong to him that he cheated to his hand. And as a result, when Kaiba declared an attack with Blue-Eyes, the card simply refused to attack, and ended up destroying itself since it wasn't loyal to Kaiba and had Sogoroku's heart. Now, in the TCG, while Summon Skull boasts an impressive attack stat for its level, that's the only reason it's ever seen any success. And once the game moved past that point for big beat sticks, Summon Skull never really mounted to anything other than being a staple of playground formats. But the ideals with Summon Skull are still very much around in the TCG to this day. So many people will choose to play a deck or a strategy not because of how good it is, but because they're loyal to certain decks or even just cards they consider as their ace monsters leading some people to discover the hidden strength held behind weird or janky boss monsters that nobody else has been able to see. As a whole, Summon Skull is well past its glory days, and unless it gets a ton of good support, it's unlikely that it'll ever see play again. But there's no doubt about Summon Skull's importance, both to Yugi and the game itself, setting the standard and foundations for what an ace monster should be. Cool, interesting, and powerful. And reflecting into number 6 is Mirror Force, one of Yugi's strongest trap cards that was capable of turning an entire duel in his favor with a simple but game-winning effect in both the anime and TCG. And that effect is that whenever an opponent's monster declares an attack, you can activate Mirror Force to destroy all attack position monsters your opponent controls. This was an absolute boon in the anime, because no matter how dire the situation, Mirror Force was able to always act as the Apex Equalizer as a card that was capable of redirecting the attack of even the most powerful boss monster right back at them. This made it the perfect trap card, and one that Yugi used to great effect by mind gaming his opponent and making them think there was no way for them to lose, caused them to cockily declare an attack only for them to fall directly into Yugi's trap, wiping their field in the process and allowing for Yugi to stage a comeback. And this almighty power was a really important part in Yami and Kaiba's duel against darts in the culmination of the Wake in the Dragon art, where its power was absorbed by the Fang of Critias to form Mirror Force Dragon, who uses the effect to destroy every monster darts controls, thereby freeing the trap souls contained within the Mirror Knight tokens. But that's not the only place where Mirror Force came in clutch in this duel, as its power was also absorbed by the legendary Knight Critias to defeat the Oracalco's monsters after darts had grown scarily close to winning the duel, giving Yami yet another fighting chance. Meanwhile, in the actual game itself, Mirror Force is actually a really important part of the history of the TCG for similar reasons to why Yugi used it in the anime. Because in the first 15 or so years of Yu-Gi-Oh's lifespan, its effect had the potential to be a devastating blow if it was capable of wiping an entire field, giving you a fighting chance of winning the duel even after your opponent had managed to build up an impossible board. In fact, Mirror Force was so infamous and so powerful that not only did it spend some time on the Forbidden Limited list, it also changed the way people played the game. Because every card your opponent set had the potential to be Mirror Force, so if you wanted to play around it, you turned some of your monsters to defense position before attacking, even if you were guaranteed game if you attacked with all of your monsters instead, simply because you had to fear and respect Mirror Force. And this respect for Mirror Force isn't just something that was done in the ancient past, as it even managed to see a ton of competitive play in Zodiac lists during its Tier 0 reign. Unfortunately though, in the modern era of the past 5 years or so, battle traps as a whole have seen a sharp decline in use simply because it's now a lot easier for your opponent to prepare for the threat of something like Mirror Force, even if accidentally. Because it's very likely your opponent is just going to be able to remove it from the field before the battle phase, set up some kind of negate, or just summon a towers-like monster that Mirror Force and its variants can't beat. And that's honestly a shame, because there's no doubt that in both the TCG and the anime itself, Mirror Force is a really iconic and important part of Yu-Gi-Oh's history and one that's managed to turn duels around, winning games for both Yugi and real-life duelists. There are definitely still a ton of good equalizers around that fulfill the role of Mirror Force and allow you to deal with your opponent's oppressive fields, but none of them really encapsulate the fear and suspense that Mirror Force could generate. Obliterating the number 5 spot are the Exodia pieces, the ace monster of Solomon Moto's deck that, for a while, was the ultimate boss monster in the anime, and one that was deemed so unstoppable by the likes of Weevil Underwood that the only way he could think of beating it was by throwing it overboard before the Duelist Kingdom arc. And the reason why Exodia was deemed so overpowered in the anime was because, once you managed to collect each of the five pieces, it obliterated every one of your opponent's monsters and won the duel instantly. And there was no way to deal with it, or stop the oncoming attack once it had begun. A fact that Sato Kaiba learned the hard way in the anime. You see, in the first episode, Yugi was on the verge of defeat after Kaiba had managed to bring out three Blue-Eyes White Dragons, which he believed to be the strongest monsters in the game that only had been held back thus far by the Swords of Revealing Light. 
This gave Yugi a crisis of faith, and made him unsure if he was even capable of defeating Kaiba even with the heart of the cards, to the point where he began to struggle to draw the final card from the top of its deck. But due to the reassurance of his grandfather's spirit, and a reminder that his friends were always with him due to the friendship Mark Taya had drawn, Yugi's faith in his cards was bolstered, which gave him the confidence to draw the final piece of Exodia, the only card capable of winning the duel, and one that hadn't even been summoned before as no one else, other than Yugi, had ever managed to assemble all five pieces of the puzzle. This made for one of the most, if not the most iconic moment in the anime, and exists in the hearts and minds of thousands of duels to this day as a reminder that no matter how dire the situation is, believing in the heart of the cards can sometimes be enough to win a duel. Unfortunately though, this was actually the only moment in the Duel Monsters anime where Yugi uses Exodia in a game, as thanks to a certain insect duelist, most of Yugi's Exodia pieces were lost. The cards did reappear every so often though, either as Solomon Moto's Ka, or even in the hands of other duelists, such as the Bear Hunter in Battle City who used Exodia much differently to Yugi. Because while Yugi used Exodia as the ultimate trump card in his duel versus Kaiba, the Bear Hunter centered his entire deck around the Exodia pieces, with most of his cards either being designed to thin his deck, or style at your opponent so that he could eventually draw the five pieces. Which, funnily enough, is usually how Exodia decks are used in the TCG, because the Exodia pieces themselves are actually kind of bricky since until you have all five pieces, they don't really do anything. Which means playing Exodia as a plan B like Yugi did usually makes your deck worse, since you're filling it with a bunch of dead cards that are likely to never come up. But if you play your deck with a bunch of draw cards, as well as ways to restrict your opponent's actions like the Rare Hunter, you'll have a pretty effective Exodia strategy that can end up obliterating unprepared opponents by turboing the pieces to your hand. And it's this style of Exodia deck that managed to succeed in the 2012 Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship a championship that featured some of the best duels from around the world at the time, where Exodia managed to reach top 8 amidst a meta of Insector, Windup, and Dino Rabbit. As a whole though, Exodia definitely isn't the ultimate strategy as the anime portrayed it, with it only really being a gimmick deck in the modern era. But to a lot of people, that doesn't matter. And no matter how bad the deck might be, they're willing to play it just so they can resolve Exodia and feel like Yugi did in that first duel, solving the puzzle that is the invincible Exodia. Resurrecting to number 4 is Reborn the Monster otherwise known as Monster Reborn. In the anime and the TCG, Reborn works exactly the same. It allows you to target one monster in either player's graveyard and special summon it to your field. This made it yet another important tool in Yugi's arsenal, and one that he'd consistently use in the anime manga in order to return monsters from the graveyard back to the field, and was even an important part in his first duel in the manga against Kaiba, where he used Monster Reborn to revive Sogoroku's blue eyes to attack Kaiba for game. But the most important use of Reborn was actually in the final duel between Yugi and Atem. In this final duel, Atem activates Monster Reborn in order to special summon out Slifer the Sky Dragon from the graveyard and attack Yugi Silent Magician level 5, which would have won him the duel. If Yugi had activated Gold Sarcophagus earlier, a card that, in the anime, actually negates the effects of that card after your opponent activates it, which meant that Atem's Slifer the Sky Dragon was sent to the graveyard. According to Ishizu Ishtar, this negation wasn't just a tactical move by Yugi. It was also a message to the Pharaoh to say that the dead don't belong in the world of the living and the fact that Reborn was negated allowed for Yugi to win the duel, showing Atem his strength and giving him peace as he moved on to the spirit world. Thankfully, games in the TCG have a lot lower stakes, so if your Reborn happens to be negated, it doesn't mean that you have to be sent to the spirit world or shadow realm, it just means you might lose the game. Although, if your Reborn manages to resolve, that can result in a huge advantage, because just like in the anime, being able to return to monsters of the field is incredibly strong, and gives you a wide array of potential options when looking at both graveyards. Reviving is just a really strong effect, and Reborn was the first card in the game that allowed for that level of recursion. So much so that pretty much any card that revives a monster from the graveyard is usually referred to as a Reborn. And no matter the era, this effect is absurd. Whether you're using Reborn in older formats to steal an opponent's big beater, or using the archetypal Reborns of the modern day to extend your combo. Reborn and Reborn-like effects are always going to be good. Which is likely why, even to this day, Monster Reborn is still limited to one copy. As a whole, Monster Reborn is one of the most iconic cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! in both the anime and TCG as the cards capable of allowing your coolest monsters to return to the field in some way, shape, or form. And although Yu-Gi's final message to Atem was poignant, bringing monsters back to the world of living is one of the coolest effects in the game, and has allowed for a ton of different and fun strategies to see play over the years. Thundering in with force at number 3 is Slifer the Sky Dragon. Yami Yugi's signature Egyptian god card. Now, in the TCG, Slifer has a ton of different effects in order to match its anime counterpart. Because just like in the anime, Slifer requires three tributes of normal summon, its normal summon can't be negated, and cards and effects can't be activated after its normal summoned. It gains 1,000 attack for every card in your hand, it even has Slifer's second mouth attack, which reduces the attack of any monster that's normal or special summon to your opponent's field and attack position by 2,000. 
and if that monster's attack is reduced to zero, you can destroy that card. But Slifer also comes with the downside that during the end phase, if it was special summoned, you must send it to the graveyard. But this is actually a nerfed version of Slifer, because in the anime, the Egyptian god cards all shared extra effects that made them extremely powerful. With all the Egyptian gods being immune to the effects of non-god cards, alongside a bunch of other busted protection effects that made them almost impossible to deal with unless you also had an Egyptian god yourself. And as a result, Yugi pretty much made Slifer the main boss monster of his deck for Battle City, but only used it when it was necessary, as otherwise it would be too dangerous and could potentially put innocent people at risk. But he didn't hold back during the Battle City finals where he used Slifer to take on the other Egyptian god cards, facing off against Kaiba's Almighty Obelisk, Merrick's Winged Dragon of Ra, the two other god cards that, in the anime, were pretty much unstoppable. Unfortunately though, in the actual game, Slifer hasn't really lived up to its status as the ultimate boss monster, and has only ever seen fringe amounts of play due to its second mouth effect, which can technically act as a floodgate against decks that focus on low attack monsters as combo enablers. But even though Slifer never really saw any play itself, what it represented is still an important part of Yu-Gi-Oh! The boss monster. A monster that feels satisfying to bring to the field that makes you feel secure in your chances of winning. And to a lot of people, these boss monsters are an important part of the deck that makes them and their strategy feel special. It doesn't matter if your boss monster is as bad as the original Gate Guardian, or as used as Baron de Flo or Axis Kotaker, summoning these monsters just makes you feel cool. In a similar way to summoning out your ace card. Ever since he won in Battle City, Slifer has always been one of Yugi's coolest monsters and was the one that was vital to take on both Kaiba and Merrick during the Battle City Finals. And although it never saw play itself, the excitement it brought by being on screen inspired a ton of duelists to believe in the power of their own boss monsters, even if they were a lot weaker than anime Slifer. And appearing from behind the curtain at number 2 is Dark Magician Girl, the ever-faithful student of the Dark Magician who also happens to be Mana's Ka, the student in Mahad who vowed to grow stronger after her teacher's death. And this is reflected in Dark Magician Girl's effect, because she gains 300 attack and defense for every Dark Magician or Magician of Black Chaos in either player's graveyard. In the anime, this made Dark Magician Girl an excellent part of Yugi's arsenal, as a backup ace monster has the potential to be even stronger than the Dark Magician himself, a fact that was specifically highlighted with her first appearance as she gained an attack buff from both the Dark Magicians in Yugi's graveyard and the one in Arcana's to defeat his on-field Dark Magician. But the Dark Magician Girl represents more than just strength for the Pharaoh. Because as a card and as a character, Dark Magician Girl represents a Tim's humanity and his promise to destroy the Orichalcos. Which is part of why it was such a shock when Atem activated the Seal of Orichalcos, binding Dark Magician Girl, the Dragon Knight, to the Seal's powers, as he essentially gave in to the corruption of the Orichalcos in an attempt to win a duel, which caused Tamias to abandon the Pharaoh for a while. This made it seem like the Pharaoh had given up his soul completely, as he was even willing to sacrifice Dark Magician Girl and the promise he made to her. But after proving himself worthy of Tamias once more, Dark Magician Girl and her Dragon Knight form became a staple of Yugi's strategy and was even an integral part of Dart's defeat. You see, in the duel against Darts, after each of the Orichalcos monsters had been destroyed, Darts had brought out Divine Serpent Get and declared an attack on the legendary knight Tamias, destroying it by battle and reducing Yugi's life points to zero. But despite that, the duel wasn't over, because Yami activated Relay Soul to special summon Dark Magician Girl from his hand. And due to the effect of the anime version of Relay Soul, so as long as she remained face up on the field, Yugi couldn't lose the duel. But the catch was, if she left the duel, then he would lose the duel instantly. This made for a really intense moment in the anime, where in order to win the duel, Yugi had to literally hold on to his humanity, putting all of his faith into Dark Magician Girl while resisting the pull of the Orichalcos. A play that he was rewarded for because after redirecting the second attack of Ga to his legendary knights, Yami formed an infinite loop and combined Tamias with his other knights which gave him an infinite attack as well allowing to crash with Ge, winning Yugi the duel on the spot. Unfortunately though, Dark Magician Girl has never played too much of a pivotal role in the TCG. Her effect isn't really that useful out of Dark Magician decks, and Dark Magician strategies have never really been that competitively viable. But even in spite of that, Dark Magician Girl has become an icon of the Yu-Gi-Oh community, as a monster that's instantly recognizable by both fans of the anime and competitive players alike and is a really important part of Yu-Gi-Oh's cultural impact as one of these phases of the game. And while Dark Magician Girl has never been competitively viable, there's no doubt about the important role she's played in both the anime and real world as a pillar of Yu-Gi-Oh's identity. But every student needs a teacher. Which brings us to the number one spot. And at number one is his ever-loyal companion, the Dark Magician, the Ka Mahad and Yami Yugi's ace monster. Dark Magician is a 2500 attack beat stick that has no effect with it instead being a normal monster that, according to its flavor text, is the ultimate wizard in terms of attack and defense. And it was this power that allowed for the Dark Magician to contend with and face off against some of the most powerful monsters in the anime, from Relinquish to the Guardians, and of course against Sento Kaiba's Blue Eyes White Dragons. In a sense, Yugi treats the Dark Magician more like a friend than an actual card, 
which makes sense given the spirit of the card belongs to Mahat, a childhood friend of Atem that chose to live on as an eternal servant by sacrificing himself in order to become the Dark Magician. And Yugi is rewarded for that trust because no matter the duel or the opponents he's faced, Yugi could rely upon this card with his entire being to either get him out of rough situations or deliver a final blow. And true to his name, Dark Magician was more than just his stat lines, because he also had a series of magic tricks that made for some of the most intense and interesting duels in the anime. Magical Hats saved Yugi in a ton of different situations, allowing for Dark Magician and his other monsters to hide beneath the hats that potentially dodge an opponent's monster's attack. There was also Magic Cylinder, a card capable of sending an opponent's attack right back at them. And Mystic Box, a card that plays both Dark Magician and an opponent's monster within the two boxes. A Dark Magician's box is pierced by swords, only for it to be revealed that he's magically switched boxes with an opponent's monster leaving them to be destroyed by the swords instead. But of course, the magic that Dark Magician was best known was his Dark Magic attack. And that's not even where Dark Magician's utility ends, because just like Gaia, Dark Magician could evolve and either combine his power with other monsters or evolve. From the likes of Dark Sage to Amulet Dragon and of course the Dark Paladin. And this willingness to evolve or lend his strength to others is precisely why Dark Magician has managed to see play in the TCG. You see, as a strategy, Dark Magician has never been a key contender in the metagame because while the deck has some decent interaction, it's usually not enough to take on the strongest decks of the meta. But because of the power of the Red-Eyes Dark Dragoon, a fusion monster that specifically requires the Dark Magician as one of its materials, the card has seen a spike in competitive play in recent years, because the representation of Joe and Yugi's bond is strong. Really strong, since it's a monster with a high attack stat that can't be destroyed or targeted by card effects, can pop your opponent's monsters while burning for a ton of damage, and even has an Omni Negate. And as a result, a ton of different strategies throughout the years have willingly chose to play Dark Magician in their decks so they can access it in some way. Some decks did this by using Red Eyes Fusion by either activating it from the hand or copying its effect with Verte Anaconda. This made for a really strong plan B in case your main line of play was interrupted, while also being an extra piece of difficult to deal with interaction that you could just easily add to your end board. However, after Verte was banned in the TCG, Dragoon and Dark Magician saw a lot less play, since there weren't that many decks that could really take advantage of Red Eyes Fusion due to its harsh restriction. But it didn't stop seeing play entirely, because there's actually a deck that can play Dragoon without the need for Red Eyes Fusion, Branded, a deck that can choose to play Dark Magician to send with the effect of Branded Fusion in order to get access to the insanely powerful boss monster. Overall, no matter whether you're a fan of the anime or the TCG, Dark Magician is without a doubt one of the most important and iconic monsters in Yu-Gi-Oh! and his loyalty to a Tim shows just how strong the connections between cards and duelists can be. He was an important feature in just about every one of Yugi's duels as his ace monster, but more than that, he was a friend to a Tim, and one that refused to leave his side even at death. And although he's only ever been played in the TCG to facilitate Dragoon, it's a nice thought that the Spirit of Mahad is helping duelists in the competitive game, just as he did in the anime, and gives even the most competitive duelists a chance to feel like Yugi Moda themselves. Whether as an Egyptian priest or the head of his own company, Seto Kaiba has stood as Yugi's eternal rival, and one of the only duelists capable of keeping up with the King of Games, opposing Yugi's belief in the heart of the cards by instead believing in the objective strength of his deck, and his skill as a duelist. And it's for this reason that Kaiba is so iconic and well-loved, because no matter how arrogant he is, Kaiba always has the dueling strength and coolness factor to back it up. Which is why we're going to look at Kaiba's 10 most iconic cards, how Kaiba used their strength to his advantage, and whether or not the power actually holds up in the real life game. And snapping into number 10 is La Jin, Mystical Genie of the Lamp, one of Kaiba's earliest beat sticks who also showcased Kaiba's tactical ability. As a beater, La Jin has an amazing stat line for a level 4 monster, with an impressive 1800 attack, which for a while made it one of the strongest low level monsters in the anime dwarfing some of the other iconic level beaters like Alligator Sword, a Gazelle, and even some of Kaiba's other strong monsters like Battle Arts. This made Legend an absolute powerhouse, with it becoming an even stronger tool after the events of Duelist Kingdom, since, unlike some of the other high attack monsters in Kaiba's deck, Legend didn't need a tribute to be brought out. But Kaiba didn't just use Legend as a strong beat stick, he also used it tactically, by combining its strength with Ancient Lamp, a card that not only let Kaiba summon Legend, but also allowed him to act as a powerful defensive wall capable of redirecting the attacks of your opponent's monsters towards their allies. Which turned out to be an important tool in Kaiba's second duel against Yugi, where La Jin and Ancient Lamp managed to take down the comparatively stronger Curse of Dragon by redirecting the attack of Yugi's Dark Magician. But La Jin and Ancient Lamp's most iconic moment was in Kaiba's duel against his father, Gozaburo Kaiba, where they both were integral for the defeat of Exodia Necros since Ancient Lamp allowed for Legend to be summoned to the field to provide enough tributes for Blue-Eyes White Dragon, and Legend's Fiend typing allowed for Kaiba to activate Soul Demolition, banishing all of the Exodia pieces from the graveyard to reduce the attack of Necros to zero, leaving it vulnerable to an attack, ultimately allowing for him to defeat his cruel adoptive father and putting his awful childhood to rest. 
Unfortunately, Lao Jin and Ancient Lamp were never really as versatile in the actual card game, but both managed to see some minor success. Ancient Lamp was used in classic Monarch strategies as a way to ensure you have a tribute on your follow-up turn by using its redirect effect as a defensive option. And Lao Jin was once the best normal summon in the game due to its high stat line, which, just like in the anime, made it a solid offensive threat in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh that was hard to contest. But as a pair, they've never really been played together. Ancient Lamp's Warmune effect is definitely a cute reference to the genie, but it's too niche to really be useful. Especially because one of Lao Jin's strengths was that it was already easy to bring out to the field with a normal summon. But at the very least, it's really cool that both Lao Jin and Ancient Lamp saw playing the TCG for similar reasons to why Kaiba used him in the anime with Ancient Lamp being a defensive option and La Jin being one of the game's primary offensive threats. But, of course, only Seto Kaiba would have the genius to combine these two strengths into one strategy. And plugging into number 9 is Enemy Controller, one of Kaiba's most iconic quick play spells that came in clutch in the Battle City Finals. And a huge part of that is because of Econ's modularity and adaptability, which is evident in the TCG version of the card, which allows you to activate one of two effects making it so that you can either change the battle position of opponent's monster, or allow you to tribute one of your own monsters to take control of an opponent's. This is actually a simpler and nerfed version of the card in the anime, which required you to pay 1000 life points and enter a specific code to activate an effect. If you input up, down, left, right, A, enemy controller will cause a monster to destroy itself. If you input left, right, A, B, you can use Econ's effect to take control of an opponent's monster. And it's his second effect that made it such a useful tool in Kaiba's deck during Battle City, as he would use enemy controller in order to get an extra monster to tribute to threaten summoning either Blue Eyes White Dragon or the almighty Obelisk the Tormentor. Something that Yugi managed to delay in his Battle City duel against Kaiba, as after he used Change of Heart to steal Kaiba's X head cannon, Kaiba then stole back his monster ready to summon his Egyptian God card. And it was only through a lucky hit off of Light Force Sword that Yugi managed to temporarily stop Obelisk from entering the field. He also used the card in the runner-up duel against Joey Wheeler, stealing Joey's little wing guard and combining it with cost down to tribute seven blue eyes white dragon from his hand. But in this duel, Econ's modularity was his downfall, because after Joey used the effect of Grave Robber to steal it, he inputted the destroy code to blow up Kaiba's blue eyes, which, even though it was used against Kaiba, managed to prove how versatile the card could be. And it's this versatility that has allowed Econ to see a ton of competitive play in the TCG ever since its release even though it's a weaker version of its anime counterpart. Its first effect is a neat battle trick that can be used to stop an opponent's attack. This can be important for conserving your life points, but stopping an attack also prevents certain effects from activating, or stopping your opponent from accessing a Zeus. But it's Econ's mind control effect that's the most relevant. Like other mind control cards, it's a great going second tool, and one that can force an opponent's interactions because otherwise you'd steal their boss monster to use its effects or to use it as a material for a summon, just like what Kaiba did. And it's even great for going first, because you can just set enemy controller to use it like a trap card during your opponent's turn to steal one of their combo pieces, before they have a chance to use the monster for an extra deck play, making it a really powerful interruption, and one that's sometimes capable of ending an opponent's turn by itself. In general, enemy controller has a near infinite potential use, and the modularity has been an important tool in a ton of different strategies over the years, with its most powerful effect being its mind control ability allowing you to steal an opponent's monster and then use it for your own game. Which is precisely how Kaiba used Econ in the anime. And while most decks aren't summoning an Egyptian god, its strength in the TCG manages to mirror its anime counterpart, even despite being nerfed. And drawn to number 8 is Card of Demise, Kaiba's best comeback card that's been an integral tool for his victory in some of his most important duels. Just like enemy controller, Demise has two versions. The busted anime version, and the comparatively tamer TCG version. The TCG version allows you to draw cards until you have three cards in your hand but comes with a ton of downsides that prevents every deck from using it. Your opponent can't take damage for the rest of the turn, you can't spell to summon monsters for the entire turn, and you have to discard your entire hand during the end phase. The anime version, though, allows you to draw until you have five cards in your hand, with the only downside being that you have to discard your entire hand during your fifth standby phase after you use it. Which isn't really a harsh downside, because it's unlikely this effect will ever resolve, since it's pretty easy to finish up most duels within five turns. A fact that Kaiba used to his advantage, because in the anime, Kaiba only ever had to discard once for Card of Demise during the Pyramid of Light movie. Which actually ended up being a benefit anyways, because it further increased the attack of Blue Eyes Shining Dragon. But of course, the main benefit of Card of Demise was that it allowed for Kaiba to draw a ton of cards to stage an insane comeback. With its most important use being in Kaiba's last duel against Siegfried von Schroeder the head of Kaiba Corporation's rival company that aimed to humiliate Kaiba and ruin Kaiba Corp's stock price, so that he and Schroeder Corp would be the number one games company in the world. Kaiba wasn't going to let this happen, and dueled Siegfried to officially disqualify him from the KC Cup. And although Siegfried got extremely close to winning with his Valkyrie strategy, Kaiba managed to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat with Carter Demise, 
which allowed him to draw five cards, which were enough to set up his banish zone and grab dimension fusion from his graveyard so he could summon out his blue eyes white dragons and chaos emperor dragon to attack for a game. And this way of using Demise is really similar to how it's actually used in the TCG, and has given people the chance to drown in an overwhelming advantage so as long as they have few cards in their hand, which is why you'll see decks that play Demise committing their entire hand to the field so they can get as much advantage as they can out of a single activation. But because of the differences between the anime and the TCG version of this card, not every deck can play Demise since it prevents you from special summoning at all, and its end phase effects means that you're guaranteed to lose every card in your hand. But that didn't stop a ton of different control strategies from playing it anyway, since it was virtually guaranteed to net you a ton of card advantage. And it was well worth the commitment of its downsides in decks like True Draco, which didn't need to special summon at all, and Cosmo, which could special summon during your opponent's turn, which let this nerfed version of Demise being limited in 2020. It's definitely not surprising that one of Kaiba's most busted comeback cards received such heavy nerfs in the TCG, but unlike other insane card draws like Card of Sanctity, Demise's nerfs weren't enough to stop it from being insanely powerful in the TCG, and one that definitely showcases that Kaiba knew what he was talking about when it came to strong cards. And pillaging into number 7 is Vorse Raider, one of Kaiba's strongest all-level monsters that acted as one of Kaiba's most prominent offensive threats. And that's because, like La Jin, Vorse Raider was an incredibly strong, low-level beatstick that really represented Kaiba's belief in power, standing at an insanely powerful 1900 attack. This made Vorse Raider a powerful tool for Kaiba to use as an immediately strong monster that opponents would struggle to overcome due to its sheer attack power, and one that gave Kaiba a solid advantage in the early game of duels. Essentially, it was the truest definition of a beat stick. But, as we saw with La Jin, while Kaiba admired the pure power of his monsters, he wasn't dumb, and found a ton of creative and genius ways to use his vanilla beater. And its most interesting use beating Kaiba's Battle City duel against Ishizu, where he used Shrink on his own Vorse Raider in order to make it meet the requirements to activate Crush Card Virus. And once again, Kaiba's intelligent use of this card is really similar to why it's being played in the TCG. You see, by the time Voice Raider had actually been released in the real-life card game, the days of Caveman Yu-Gi-Oh were over, which meant that for a while, Voice Raider never lived up to the offensive threat that it could have been. But after the release of Rescue Rabbit, Voice Raider skyrocketed in use, becoming a meta threat in decks like Fire Fist, which appreciated Voice Raider being a normal Beast Warrior with decent stats that they could use to instantly set up rank 4 plays. Although, what really brought Voice Raider over the edge was its dark typing. You see, since it was dark, Voice Raider was a valid target for Deck Devastation Virus, a trap card similar to Crush Card Virus that is capable of wiping out all monsters in your opponent's hand or field with 1500 or less attack, which could devastate certain strategies. The other normal Beast Warrior target was Earth, so it couldn't be used as Deck Devastation Virus. But, because Voice Raider was dark, if you managed to increase its attack by 100 points with something like a Fire Formation 10 key, you'd actually get to mirror Kaiba almost exactly, and absolutely decimate an opponent's deck. For a card with zero effects, it's impressive how important Vorse Raider was in its particular niche. And even though lesser duelists may have treated Vorse Raider as a beat stick, those that were capable of thinking like Kaiba managed to find a use for this classic vanilla monster that manages to recapture its coolest moments in the anime. And biting to number 6 is the Fang of Critias, one of the three legendary dragon cards that chose heroes to wield them to defeat the evil of the Orichalcos. Tamias chose Yugi, Hermos chose Joey, and Critias chose Seto Kaiba, which turned out to be an excellent choice because the Fang of Critias lets you combine its power with a trap card, letting you send a trap card from your hand or field to the graveyard to summon a powerful fusion boss monster with an effect similar to the sent trap. This led to Critias being an important part of Kaiba's strategy during the Orichalcos arc, after he'd been chosen by the legendary dragon in his first duel against the Orichalcos agent, Alistair, who almost wiped out Kaiba after stealing two of his blue eyes white dragons. But, after a vision of Critias, Kaiba drew the Legendary Dragon and combined it with his Crush Card Virus to form a Doom Virus Dragon, wiping Alistair's field and giving him a chance to counterattack before the duel ended in a draw. But the most important use of Critias was of course in Kaiba and Yugi's tag duel against Darts, where it was used to signify the trust held between the two rivals by combining Critias with Yugi's Mirror Force to form Mirror Force Dragon to wipe out Darts' Mirror Knights. But that's not all, because within the same duel, the Fang of Critias was eventually banished by Yugi with a Legend of Heart, after Kaiba's defeat, to bring out Legendary Knight Critias, alongside Hermos and Tamias, all of which were integral in defeating Darts' infinite attack, Divine Serpent Ga. Now unfortunately, in the TCG, the Fang of Critias never quite reached the legendary status it had in the anime, because while the effect of each of the dragons it could bring out were solid and mirrored the power of the trap cards they were based on, it was just a lot easier to use the trap cards themselves rather than trying to force out the fusion monsters. This meant that even the extremely powerful Doom Virus Dragon, whose effects mirrors Crush Card Virus before its errata, has never seen any actual play. Because while its effect can be game winning, it's just a lot easier to set up Crush Card Virus in a suitable tribute, rather than hoping to draw it alongside Critias. 
and even Critias's most modern fusion monster, Destruction Dragon, is actively worse than just playing Ring of Destruction itself, because Destruction Dragon's effect is spell speed 1 and can't be used during your opponent's turn. So, unless you happen to be chosen by Critias, each of its forms are going to be fairly difficult to bring out. Still, there's no denying that despite Critias's lackluster TCG performance, it was still an amazing tool in Kaiba's arsenal that, in his own words, was comparable to an Egyptian god, and one that was necessary to defeat the Orichalcos. And far enough, number 5 is XYZ Dragon Cannon, another mini-boss in Kaiba's toolbox that acted as his main machine-based menace. And for good reason, because XYZ Dragon Cannon is the ultimate formation of X-Head Cannon, Y-Dragon Head, and Z-Metal Tank, and is one of the first fusion monsters in the game that didn't need polymerization, with its summoning condition instead requiring you to banish each of its component parts from the field. You can't special summon from your graveyard, but with no once per turn, you can't discard a card to target any card opponent controls and destroy it, making it a really impressive removal option for its era. An option that Kaiba used to great effect against the likes of Pegasus in the Pyramid of Light movie, and Alistair in the Orichalcos arc. But Kaiba's coolest use of Dragon Cannon was definitely in its first appearance in the Battle City Finals, where he showed off the modularity of the light machines combining them to form the Dragon Cannon and wiped out Yugi's Big Shield Gardna. And then, after Light Force Sword had returned Obelisk to his hand, he sacrificed Dragon Cannon as three monsters in accordance with Battle City rules in order to bring out his Egyptian God card. But despite how cool Dragon Cannon and its associated pieces were, they themselves haven't really seen any actual play in the TCG. Each of the individual pieces have lackluster effects, and it's difficult to bring each one of them out to the field to access their combo forms. But even though X, Y, and Z aren't that amazing in the TCG, there are still a number of ways you can embody Kaiba's use of this trio. In speed duels, these monsters were a meta threat when paired with Kaiba's skill union combination, which allowed you to banish the materials needed for your fusion monsters from the graveyard rather than the field, giving you a whole host of powerful removal options from your extra deck. Meanwhile, in the TCG, X, Y, and Z have a sister series of light machines composed of A, Assault Core, B, Buster Drake, and C, Crush Wavering, who, just like X, Y, and Z, combine to form the incredible ABC Buster Dragon. And this trench has actually seen a ton of competitive play in the modern era due to how easy ABC is to access, since it also allows you to banish materials from the graveyard as well as the field, but also due to its two amazing effects, each of which mirror how Kaiba used Dragon Cannon in the anime, with its first effect being a great removal option for your opponent's cards and its second effect even allowing you to special summon out its component parts as if you were activating Dimension Fusion or Return from the Different Dimension, giving you enough materials to summon an Egyptian god. So despite X, Y, and Z not having seen any real competitive play in the TCG, it's really cool that their ideas and themes are still alive in the modern meta, since they're so well represented in ABC. And even though it's unlikely you'll be summoning XYZ Dragon Cannon anytime soon, these cards still allow you to mirror Kaiba's Machine Menace. Exploding into number 4 is Ring of Destruction, one of Kaiba's strongest trap cards that show that he was willing to risk anything to win a duel, including his own life points. Because Ring of Destruction allows you to, during your opponent's turn, target and destroy one face that monster opponent controls, whose attack is equal to or lower than their life points. Then you take damage equal to that monster's attack, and then after that the same happens to your opponent. This is slightly different to its anime counterpart due to the number of erratas the TCG Ring of Destruction has received over the years, with the anime ring letting you activate it during either player's turn, target any monster on the field, and makes it so that both players take the damage at the exact same time. And as a result, ring was a really important part of Kaiba's toolbox, because it allowed him to remove some of his opponent's strongest boss monsters, all while burning a decent chunk of their life points. But ring is also somewhat reckless, because it burned both players which meant that if Kaiba wasn't thinking properly, there was a chance that he could lose duels to his own card. But Seto Kaiba is a smart duelist, and so often paired Ring of Destruction with Ring of Defense, which protected Kaiba's life points while still letting Ring of Destruction destroy and burn their opponent. This combo was used a few times in the series, but featured most prominently in the four-way duel between Yugi, Kaiba, Merrick, and Joey, where Kaiba attempted to use Ring of Destruction on Joey's Axe Raider, while protecting his own life points with Ring of Defense so that Joey would lose the duel, so it would be more likely that he and Yugi would face off in the finals. Now, in the TCG, this Kaiba patented combo was never really too relevant, because it's a specific two-card combo that's only going to be really useful in really niche situations. And what's worse is that the TCG version of Ring of Defense protects both players' life points, not just your own. But this never stopped Ring of Destruction from seeing competitive play by itself, and in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh, it was one of the strongest trap cards in the game, since it could either be used to destroy an opponent's boss monster, or just end the game outright by burning your opponent for a ton of damage, or sometimes both at the same time, just like how Kaiba would use the card in the anime. And this meant that, for most of his life, Ring existed permanently on the Forbidden Limited list all the way up until 2015, where the card received an errata that made it a lot worse. 
This errata didn't make the card entirely useless, but it changed a lot about what Ringo Destruction so strong. You couldn't target a monster with an attack that was higher than your opponent's life points, nor could you target your own monsters either, which made it a lot harder for Ring to close out games with its burn effect. And because of the way its burn now applied, you had to take the damage for your opponent, which meant the card could no longer end duels in a draw, and could even potentially lose you the duel if you activate it while your life points were low. This led to Ring becoming a shell of its former self. It has never really reached the same height of competitive play as it saw prior to its errata, with it only really popping up in niche burn strategies like Trickstar and Mystic Mine. But even though Ring is a lot weaker nowadays, you can still technically use it as Kaiba did in the anime, since it still lets you burn or remove an opponent's monster from the field. And there's no denying the legacy that Ring had on the TCG as one of the strongest early trap cards in the game. But Kaiba actually has multiple trap cards that were so busted that they had to receive an errata, such as the next card on this list. And infecting the number 3 spot is Crush Card Virus, Kaiba's strongest trap card that allowed him to destroy an opponent's entire deck. Now, Crush Card actually has multiple different versions depending on which series of the anime you're watching and what era you're looking at. But in the TCG, Crush Card Virus lets you tribute a dark monster you control with 1000 or less attack, so that you can look at all cards in your opponent's hand and all monsters on their field to destroy every monster your opponent has with 1500 or more attack. But your opponent takes no damage until the end of the next turn after Crush Card Virus resolves, and also lets your opponent destroy 3 monsters in their deck with 1500 or more attack. This is very different to Kaiba's anime version, which instead infected a dark monster you can control with 1000 or less attack with the virus, so that when the monster was destroyed by battle, it would infect an opponent's deck. It would not only destroy every monster in their hand and on the field with 1500 less attack, it would also destroy those monsters in their deck as well. Now, in the anime, Kaiba often made fun of weaker monsters, but even he was willing to play monsters with low stats, such as Sagi the Dark Clown, purely just to facilitate Crush Card Virus. Which made perfect sense, because the moment Crush Card was used, every strong monster in your opponent's deck would be sent to the graveyard. To Kaiba, this meant that your opponent would only have weak monsters left in their deck, all of which would fall to his overpowered monsters. A strategy that proved fruitful in his Duelist Kingdom duel against Yugi, where Crush Card destroyed the likes of Gaia the Fierce Knight alongside every other monster in Yugi's deck, pushing the King of Games into a corner and forcing him to rely on his weak monsters to try and win in the face of the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. But as powerful as Crush Card Virus was in the anime, there were also a number of times where it was turned against Kaiba, like in his duel against Ishizu Ishtar in Battle City, where after Kaiba had resolved Crush Card Virus, Ishizu used Exchange of the Spirit to leave Kaiba with only 6 cards left in his deck. And funnily enough, in the modern TCG, Crush Card Virus can be used against you, but in a different way to the anime, where instead of the effect being turned around onto you, like it was in Kaiba, your opponent will instead just gain a huge advantage by being allowed to foolish any 3 cards from their deck, letting them access a bunch of powerful graveyard effects. But this wasn't always how Crush Card Virus worked, because prior to its errata, it not only destroyed monsters in your opponent's hand and field, it also destroyed every card your opponent drew for 3 turns after it resolved, and didn't give your opponent a chance to destroy a card in their deck. This made Crush Card Virus absurd in the early days of the game, because even though it didn't destroy your opponent's deck, it would eviscerate every strong monster your opponent had on the field or in their hand, and kept them locked under a pseudo floodgate for 3 turns. That meant if they drew any powerful monster, it was just immediately sent to the graveyard. Which, for as oppressive as the card was, fits the same purpose that Kaiba used it for in the anime, depleting your opponent of every powerful resource they had and forcing your opponent to rely on weak cards. However, because of its 2015 errata, Crush Card Virus no longer sees any real competitive play. Even though it has the potential to win you games, giving your opponent a chance to fullest 3 monsters for free is just too big of a downside. But for a time, Crush Card Virus is one of the strongest and most oppressive cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! And crushing into number 2 is Obelisk the Tormentor, Seto Kaiba's signature Egyptian god card. Like Slifer, Obelisk's TCG version has a ton of effects designed to mirror the strength of its anime version. It requires 3 tributes to Normal Summon, its Normal Summon can't be negated, and neither player can activate cards or effects in response to that summon. Additionally, neither player can target Obelisk with card effects, and you can tribute two monsters to activate Obelisk's signature attack, Fist of Fury, by tributing two monsters you control, which destroys all monsters your opponent controls. But Obelisk can't attack the turn you use the effect. And Obelisk comes with the same downside as Slifer, where during the end phase, if it was special summoned, you have to send it to the graveyard. Now, just like the other Egyptian gods, the TCG version of Obelisk is a lot weaker than its anime counterpart. Because in the anime, Obelisk had a ton of other protections and effects that made it an absurdly overpowered boss monster, and one that only other Egyptian god cards were capable of defeating. Which is why Obelisk was deemed worthy enough by Kaiba to be his deck's main boss monster throughout the Battle City arc. Because unlike Yugi, who only used Slifer when necessary due to its immense strength, Kaiba constantly summoned out Obelisk throughout the arc in order to test its power, even against random no-name duelists. And each and every time, Obelisk proved why it was worthy of holding the title of an Egyptian god. 
Given the strength obsessed Kaiba, it takes to the power of the gods. As a result, Obelisk has a ton of iconic moments throughout the series. From its first appearance against Kaiba's dueling robot, to Kaiba's duel against Ishizu. But out of all of them, Obelisk's coolest moment came from Kaiba's duel against Yugi in the Battle City semifinals, where we got to see Obelisk the Tormentor face off against Slife for the Sky Dragon, where the two gods collided, destroying each other in the process, and causing both Yugi and Kaiba to see a glimpse of their ancient Egyptian past. Now, out of the three original Egyptian god cards, Obelisk is an anomaly in that it actually managed to see a decent amount of competitive play. You see, in the Dragon Ruler format, Obelisk was able to live up to its status as an Egyptian god due to its targeting protection. This, combined with its insanely high attack stat, made it so that the Dragon Rulers actually struggled to out the card, as their main sources of removal happened to target. And even their highest attack monsters couldn't stand out to Obelisk's mighty 4,000 attack. Which is really cool that, even if only for a brief time, Obelisk was able to be the ultimate boss monster that Kaiba in the anime made it out to be, even if it was only for one specific format. But overall, Obelisk is a great representation of Kaiba's love of powerful cards, and one whose strength actually managed to transfer over to the TCG. But there is still one more card that represents Kaiba's love of strength even better than Obelisk, so much so that he was willing to sacrifice a god to summon it. And burst into the number one spot is Dark Magician's eternal rival, Blue Eyes White Dragon, Kaiba's ultimate ace monster who holds the spirit of Kisara within it. Blue Eyes needs no introduction as it's one of the most iconic cards in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh. It's a level 8 vanilla beat stick with 3000 attack and 2500 defense, and doesn't have any effect due to it being a normal monster, and instead has flavor text that describes it as a virtually invincible monster. A statement that Kaiba truly believed as he constantly used Blue Eyes throughout the series as his main boss monster, using its power to eviscerate lesser monsters and duelists alike, and believed in the power of Blue Eyes so much that he's even willing to steal and tear up Solomon Moto's copy of the card, leaving only three copies left in the world, all of which belong to Kaiba. Just so the Blue Eyes' power could never be used against him, because to Kaiba, Blue Eyes represented distilled strength and his pride as a duelist, and he had so much faith in that pride that he dedicated a large portion of his deck purely around summoning and supporting as many Blue Eyes White Dragons as possible, with the likes of Lord of D with Flute of Summoning Dragon, Kaiser Seahorse, and even Cost Down all to facilitate to summon out the Engine of Destruction. But strangely enough, despite Kaiba's obsession with strength, Blue Eyes was more than just a monster to him, and he actually held a similar respect for Blue Eyes as a partner that mirrors Yugi's respect for the Dark Magician. Because Blue Eyes not only represents Kaiba's bond to his brother Mokuba, it also contained the spirit of Kisara, a slave that Pri Sento had freed who pledged her spirit to him in her death who would go on to serve Preseto and the modern day Kaiba as the Blue Eyes White Dragon. And these ideas of strength and spirit become one whenever Kaiba fuses each of his Blue Eyes monsters into Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, the combination of the spirits of Kisara, Preseto, and Seto Kaiba himself that was even capable of standing up to Zork. And strangely enough, this power is well represented in the TCG, because not only have there been moments where Blue Eyes was meta, it was once the undisputed best deck of the format, so much so that it actually ended up winning a Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship in 2016. And funnily enough, the way this championship was won was due to a monster that you would summon by combining the strength of Blue Eyes with Kisara. Blue Eyes Spear Dragon, a monster with a ton of effects that included a floodgate to stop two or more monsters from being summoned at the same time, which countered Pendulum Strategies, a Graveyard Negate which countered Burning Abyss, and even a Tag Out effect which could summon an Azure Eyes Silver Dragon from Yaksha deck, which allowed you to more easily bring the vanilla Blue Eyes to the field. And it was its effects combined that not only countered the other best decks of the format, but allowed for Blue Eyes White Dragon to have its own crowning moment as one of Yu-Gi-Oh's only world championship worthy decks. Overall though, Blue Eyes White Dragon is an icon of both the anime and card game itself, and just like Yu-Gi's Dark Magician, showcases how strong the bonds between a card and a duelist can be. And this bond is one that a lot of people in the real life game form with the Blue Eyes, because to a lot of people, while Blue Eyes does represent pure strength, it's also a fond reminder of their childhood and just how cool Seto Kaiba is. At the beginning of the anime, Joey Wheeler was a total beginner and barely even understood the basics of dual monsters. But after some intense training, support from his friends, and a ton of luck, Joey Wheeler became one of the strongest duelists in the world, third only to Yugi and Kaiba according to Pegasus himself. So today, we're going to look at Joey's 10 most iconic cards, how they turned him into the duelist that he is today, and whether or not they're as lucky in the TCG as they are in the anime. Slice in number 10 is Kunai with Chain, one of the strongest weapons in Joey's arsenal of equip cards. And that's because Kunai with Chain has two effects, and when you activate the card, you can either activate just one or both at the same time. Its first effect can only be activated whenever a monster declares an attack, and allows you to change that monster to defense position, immobilizing it and stopping its attack. Meanwhile, its second effect lets you target a monster you control and equip Kunai to it, which gives that monster 500 attack points. 
This made Kunaiwa Chain a really strong tool in the anime, and one that proved necessary in several duels as a way to stop an opponent's powerful boss monster from wiping the field, while providing Joey's monsters with the attack necessary to strike back. But as well as being an amazing weapon, Kunaiwa Chain also represented Joey's desire to protect his friends, as he'd often use it to stop an opponent from attacking an ally in tag duels. This was vital in Joey and Yugi's duel against the Paradox Brothers, because when their wall shadow moved to attack Yugi's Celtic Guardian, Joey managed to save the day by immobilizing the formerly invincible wall shadow by using Kunaiwa Chain, and kept it outside the wall long enough for the Celtic Guardian to take down one of the Labyrinth's strongest creatures. Now, unfortunately, for as iconic as Kunaiwa Chain was in the anime, it's never seen any real competitive play at the TCG. Its first effect can be a useful way to stop an opponent's attack, but there's tons of other, better ways to protect your monsters and your life points, even amongst some of the earliest cards in the game. And while its attack buff is a neat battle trick that can surprise an unsuspecting opponent, neither of Kunai's effects were ever that impactful in the physical card game. But with the Chain series of cards, it's seen some success in alternative formats, such as Duel Links where both Blast with Chain and Red Eyes Fang with Chain manage to see playing decks focus on the skill Red Eyes Roulette, which lets you add Gear Free the Red Eyes Iron Knight, as well as a random Red Eyes Spell or Trap card from your deck to your hand. And this particular version of Gear Freed could gain you a big advantage if you equip cards to it, because you could either use it to reborn a level 7 or lower Red Eyes monster from your graveyard, or you could instead destroy the card that equipped it in order to pop an opponent's spell or trap card. Overall, while it's definitely unfortunate that such a legendary card has never seen any play in the TCG, it's cool that the With Chain series managed to find a home in Duel Links and decks that use some of Joey's most important cards, letting you use their nature's equip cards to your advantage. And blowing into number 9 is Giant Trunade, a card that gave Joey a way of dealing with some of the trickiest spell and trap cards in the series. And that's thanks to its simple but powerful effect, which forces both players to return all spell and trap cards in the field to the hand. Now, in the earlier arcs of the Duel Monster anime, Joey used Trunade in a really simple way, to clear the field of your opponent's spell and trap cards. This was useful in a number of duels, but most prominently featured in the Battle City duels against Mako Tsunami where Trunade cleared the field of Mako's Umi and Tornado Wall, revealing the legendary fishermen that had been hiding beneath the water. This allowed for Panther War to declare an attack on the now defenseless monster, winning Joey the duel. But what's cool about this card is that it also helps show just how far Joey has come as a duelist. You see, in his duel against Otom, Joey was able to beat down Otom's ancient dragon, a monster that kept reviving itself during the end phase thanks to the ancient city field spell. Joey had the chance to remove Otom's back row for a turn with the effect of Giant Trunade, so that he could then use Premature Burial to revive Guildford and deal with his opponent's boss monster. But instead of rushing into a decent play, Joey thought for a moment longer and realized that by activating Premature Burial before Trunade, he could return his own card to his hand so he could use it again. Which is exactly what he did, and summoned both Guildford the Lightning and Goblin Attack Force who not only allowed for Joe to deal with Otom's Ancient Dragon, but also allowed for him to win the game outright against his former teacher. And funnily enough, this was exactly what made Giant Trunade so busted in the TCG. You see, Trunade already had stable status for its ability to remove your opponent's back row for a turn, which allowed you to play virtually uninterrupted. But because you also returned your own spell and trap cards, Trunade had a wide array of uses. Because, just like Joey did in the anime, you could use Trunade to return some of your most powerful spell and trap cards back to your hand so that you could use them again. This was useful for allowing you to play under your own floodgates, but could also be paired with cards with powerful on-activation effects like Premature Burial, allowing these effects twice with just a single copy. Now, unfortunately, due to Trunade's amazing versatility, it eventually found its way on the Forbidden Limited list, but it did get a retrain in Hey, Trunade a much weaker version of the card that can't return face-up cards. This makes Hey Trunade a great way to clear back row like its original counterpart, but means that you can't pull off Joey's anime combo to return a face-up spell card you control that has a soft once per turn, or strong activation effects to the hand so you can use it again. Still, Giant Trunade was an absolute absurd card, and one whose use in the TCG actually lines up really well to how Joey used it in the anime, because while most duelists could easily recognize Trunade's ability to clear back row, a great understanding of the game was needed to show how Trunade could be used to gain even more advantage. And Joey managed to prove that he had the understanding by the time of the Grand Championship, showing just how far he'd come since his first dueling. And rolling to number 8 is the lucky pair of Graceful Dice and Skull Dice, two cards that Joey often used together in order to take down some of the most powerful monsters in the anime. But both of these cards required a little bit of luck and a lot of confidence in order to be useful, because each dice card is based on a chance and requires you to roll a dice with the number rolling affecting how impactful these cards can be. If you roll Graceful Dice, you get to increase the attack and defense of all monsters you control by 100 times the number you rolled until the end of the turn. While with Skull Dice, your opponent's monsters will lose 100 attack and defense times the number you rolled. Both of these dice are actually a little bit stronger in the anime, where they instead either multiply or divide the attack points of monsters based on the number rolled. 
but this also came with a new downside that meant that Graceful Dice could only be activated on monsters with 500 or less attack. Which is why in the anime, Joey often paired these two dice with cards with his weaker monsters like Swordsman of Landstar, who on his own only had a measly 500 attack, which meant that every other decent beat stick in the anime absolutely dwarfed it. But when these weak monsters had the backing of these two dice cards, they were almost unstoppable and capable of taking on some of the strongest monsters in the game like Weevil's perfectly ultimate Great Moth, a monster that was even stronger than Blue Eyes White Dragon, who was taken down by the weak Parasite Parasite that Weevil had snuck into Joey's deck. But the most recognizable use of these cards was in Joey's duel against Esperoba, where the supposedly psychic duelist used his brothers in order to get information on what was in Joey's hand. Roba was confident he was safe to attack because he was told that Joey had two copies of Graceful Dice in his hand, and according to the rules, only one Graceful Dice could be used per turn. But the second card Joey had wasn't another Graceful Dice, it was a Skull Dice, which divided the Fiend Mega Cyber's attack points by 5. This not only allowed for Swordsman of Landstar to defeat Robo's monster, it also gave Joey the confirmation he needed that his opponent's psychic powers were all a lie. Unfortunately, these dice weren't so lucky in the TCG and have never really had a deck to call home. But what they represent is still a useful tool in Yu-Gi-Oh! even in the modern era, the Battle Trick. You see, because of the way the Battle Stab works, it's actually really hard to interact with certain battle phase effects, because once you declare an attack, you have to commit to it unless the conditions for a replay occur, which means that sometimes you can walk face first into your opponent's trap just like Espa Roba did. And this is especially rough once you enter the damage step, where only certain cards can be activated at all, such as stat modifiers, which makes it really hard to deal with your opponent's effects unless you have a way to negate activations. As a result, there's been a ton of cards over the years that have seen play for the ability to change the stats of monsters in the damage step, as it's a great way to take opponents off guard while removing their potential threats. Now in the modern era, battle tricks have seen a lot less success, as you'd much rather have strong going second tools that are capable of dealing with opponents board without needing to commit a monster to the field. But there are still a couple of cards in the modern day that can surprise your opponent in the same way both Graceful and Skull Dice did, with the strongest examples being the Forbidden series of cards, a set of quick play spells that have powerful generic effects that also manipulate stats. This makes these cards multi-purpose, because even though most of the time you're probably taking advantage of their negation and protection, you can also use the Forbidden spells as modern battle tricks, altering the stats of your own or your opponent's monsters to turn a battle in your favor. As a whole though, it's a shame that Graceful and Skull Dice never really saw any play. But despite that, similar cards and effects have had a huge impact on the game's history, and are even somewhat still relevant to the modern era due to their ability to take an opponent off guard, like how Joey would surprise his opponents in the anime, making his weak monsters suddenly strong. And scratching at number 7 is the Claw of Hermos, Joey's signature legendary dragon card that chose him to wield the power of Hermos in order to take on the darkness over the Aura Calcos. And with the power of this legendary dragon, Joey could combine Hermos with his monsters to create new weapons that his other monsters could wield in order to access their special abilities. Abilities that Joey used the great effect in the anime, such as in his duel against Valen, where he combined Hermos with Rocket Warrior to form a Rocket Hermos Cannon, a weapon that was so strong it destroyed all of Valen's armor in one attack. But the most important use of Hermos was during its first appearance in Joey's initial duel against the Orichalcos controlled Mai Valentine. Joey knew that if he won the duel, Mai would lose her soul, but wanted to do everything he could in order to save his friend from the corruption of the Orichalcos, and was even willing to concede the duel and his soul just to try and make Mai see some sense. But after choosing to fight on and try to save his friends, Hermos appeared to him and chose Joey as the third duelist to fight the Orichalcos. From there, Joey was able to use the power of Hermos to stage a comeback, combining the claw with Time Wizard to form Time Magic Hammer, which flung Mai's Harpy army into the future while being wielded by the Fiend Mega Cyber. But before Joey could win the duel, Valen, another person who cared for Mai, used his fragment of the Orichalcos in order to break the seal so that no soul was taken. Joey would go on to use Hermos in his second duel against Mai, and finally broke through to her at the cost of his soul, as he was too exhausted to continue, which caused Mai to take hold of the Claw of Hermos to try to take on darts herself. Essentially, the Claw of Hermos, while an important card in its own right, also represented the bond Joey and Mai shared, and the hope that Joey kept that he'd be able to save someone he cared for. But this card's legendary status isn't really carried over to the TCG, because like the other dragons, Hermos and its functions have never really seen any competitive play, and a big reason for that is just how awkward each of its fusions are to use. Every Hermos fusion monster has a battle phase oriented effect that ranges from an attack buff to even banishing your opponent's monsters, but none of these effects are worth the 3 card investment to make use of them, because while Time Magic Hammer can definitely act as decent removal, it's a lot more awkward to use compared to other strong going second tools like Raigeki, and even other equip cards like Moon Mirror Shield. Still, even though Clav Hermos and his associated fusions aren't the best cards in the game, the card's importance in the anime is almost unmatched, not just because it helped save the world, 
but because it helped Joey save Mai. Bleeding at number 6 is Scapegoat, a spell card that could summon out 4 monsters at the same time. The monsters this card summoned are just sheep tokens though, and you can't tribute them for a tribute summon, and you can't summon any of the monsters during the turn as you use the card. And this was never too much of a big deal for Joey though, because of the two main ways he would use Scapegoat to his advantage. The first way was as a defensive tool, using the sheep tokens in order to block direct attacks from an opponent's monster, thereby saving his life points. The second way though was by using them as an offensive option, because while he wasn't allowed to tribute a sheep token for a tribute summon, he could still tribute these tokens for card effects or costs. This paired excellently with Panther Warrior, a 2000 attack beat stick that dwarfed most of the low level monsters, but was held back by requiring another monster to be tributed in order to declare an attack. But if Joey activated Scapegoat, he suddenly had four monsters he could act as tribute fodder in order to allow his Panther Warrior to go on the offensive. And in the early days of the game, Scapegoat had the same modular utility. Because like Joey, you could use the tokens generated by Scapegoat as either a defensive option to protect your life points, or to apply pressure to your opponent. And if you manage to make it to your turn with a token still in your field, they could be used to your advantage. Because you could take control of an opponent's monster by trading your token with the effect of Creature Swap. Or you could even tribute the token with the effect of Metamorphosis to Special Summon Out Thousand Eyes Restrict. An amazing boss monster for the time that was capable of dealing with pretty much any monster in the game by equipping it. And this particular strategy was so strong and so infamous that not only did it have an entire deck based around using Scapegoat, this deck also ended up defining one of the most popular historic formats of all time, Goat Format, which a ton of different people still play to this day. But that's not even where Scapegoat's time in the meta ends, because after the advent of Link Summoning, bringing out four bodies to the field could result in a ton of advantage, since you convert these tokens into Link Monsters. This meant that Scapegoat reached staple status once again, it could be used during your opponent's end phase to avoid its restriction and allow a free Link 4 off of just a single card, basically winning games all on its own. Overall, it's really neat that Scapegoat managed to see similar play in the TCG as it did in the anime, as a defensive option that you could use offensively if you had the right cards to pair it with, and one that's managed to see play across generations for that reason, potentially giving us a little insight to how Joey might have played in the modern era. Predicting the future at number 5 is Jinzo, one of the rare cards that Joey won through his duels in Battle City. And out of all of the cards he won, Jinzo was easily his greatest ally. Which makes a lot of sense because while Insect Queen, Legendary Fisherman are all strong cards, they aren't as generically powerful as Jinzo, who not only prevents trap cards and their on-field effects from being activated, but also negates the effects of all trap cards on the field. And in the anime, Jinzo also came with an extra effect that allowed to destroy all trap cards in the field, whether they were face up or set. Now, to an extent, every monster that Joey won in Battle City is an important card, as each one is a victory that helped to carry him to the Battle City Finals. Insect Queen represents his win over Weevil Underwood's cunning tactics, and the Legendary Fisherman represents his newfound respect that Joey and Mako Tsunami gained for one another after their battle. Jinzo is no exception, being the first card that Joey won in his duel against Espa Roba, where he was able to use a lot of luck in order to overcome Roba's cheating as well as his machine menace. But the two duelists ultimately ended up respecting one another because they both realized that they were fighting for the sake of their family. And these cards each proved to be an integral part of Joey's victory over Odeon, especially Jinzo, who allowed Joey to stage an impressive counterattack against him where he shut down the fake Merrick's trap cards and destroyed his trap monsters as he was about to lose the duel. But every one of Joey's Battle City victories was necessary for him to win this duel as each one defended his life points long enough for him to figure out that Odeon wasn't the real Merrick. And the way Joey used Jinzo is exactly how it was used in the TCG, as it's always been an excellent way of dealing with trap cards and trap based strategies. Because even though the real life version of Jinzo is technically weaker than its anime counterpart, it's still an absurdly strong card that shuts down one third of the game's card pool. Which is why in the early days of the game, Jinzo saw a ton of success for its ability to shut down game winning trap cards, like Mirror Force, Torrential Tribute, and Sakurata Armor. All of which were common staples in a ton of different strategies, since trap cards featured some of the most easily accessible removal in the game at the time. Removal that Jinzo made worthless. And with its impressive 2400 attack, it sometimes felt almost impossible to deal with. Now, in the modern era, Jinzo sees a lot less play because trap cards are no longer the staples they used to be. And so there's no guarantee that his effect is going to be valuable in every duel. But that doesn't make Jinzo useless, because his effects are still amazing, just a lot more niche. Which explains why Jinzo still sees playing side decks as an auto win against trap strategies and decks that can access him. With Jinzo most recently being used in Branded, a deck that can special summon out of the graveyard with Albion the Sanctifier Dragon, and Super Heavy Samurai who can search for a Jinzo with the effect of Cleefort Genius. So even though Jinzo might not be as common as it used to be, it's still an absolute powerhouse of a card. And it's cool to see that this icon of early Yu-Gi-Oh can still be as much of a threat today as it was in the anime, leaving every trap card in its way completely useless. And infecting the number 4 spot is Parasite Parasite. Wait, no. 
How did that get in here? Stopping the infection at number 4 is Gearfree the Iron Knight, another one of Joey's most reliable offensive threats that he used to lay a beat down on his opponent. And a huge part of that was because of Gearfree's solid 1800 attack, which made it quite the beat stick even during Battle City, especially because it happened to be a level 4 monster, which meant that Joey was able to bring out this powerhouse on the field without needing to tribute. But instead of being a vanilla beat stick, Gearfree came with a couple of unique traits that separated from Joey's other strong beaters. The most obvious quirk of Gearfree was its effect, which destroys any card that was equipped to it, an effect that was a deciding factor in Joey's Battle City duel against Weevil Underwood, where Gearfree's Iron Armor prevented Weevil's Parasite token from equipping to it. This kept Gearfree's type as Warrior and allowed for him to attack through Weevil's Insect Barrier. But that's not the only interesting thing about this card, because in his duel against Rex Raptor during the Wake in the Dragons arc, Joey showed off his love for the lore of the game and talked about a legendary swordsman who limited his own power by encasing himself in a suit of armor. Before activating Release Restraint to free Gearfree the Swordsmaster, and equip with a Red Eyes Black Dragon Sword to destroy Rex Tyrant to Dragon with his effect, and reduce the Dino's Duelist Life Points down to zero. But Gearfree's most common use was as a beat stick, and one that almost allowed him to single handedly beat Yami Merrick in the Battle City semifinals, where Joey managed to withstand the full force of the Winged Dragon of Raw. And after taking the attack of the Egyptian God card, Joey was still standing and Merrick's Life Points were wide open which allowed for him to summon out Gearfree the Iron Knight, who had just enough attack to reduce Merrick's life points down to zero. But before he could declare an attack, Joey ended up fainting due to the amount of damage he'd sustained, which according to Battle City rules meant that Merrick was declared as the winner, with Joey only having been seconds away from victory. Thankfully, duels in the TCG aren't so taxing, but Gearfree is still a strong monster to have in your corner regardless. In the days of classic Yu-Gi-Oh, Gearfree was a decent beat stick just like how it was in the anime but was most well known for its equipped destruction effect, because instead of destroying Parasite tokens, Gearfried instead allowed you to loot Butterfly Dagger Elma, which when destroyed would return itself to your hand and allowed you to gain infinite spell counters on a Royal Magical Library to draw your entire deck, allowing you to FTK your opponent with Exodia. Although even back then, this FTK was somewhat unreliable. But there were a few decks back then that realized Gearfried's potential with other equipped cards, like Blast with Chain and Smoke Grenade of the Thief. In the modern era though, the original Gearfree no longer sees any real play, but that doesn't mean that Gearfree has fallen into obscurity, because there's a version of the card that still sees common play in Infernoble strategies, another deck that also just so happens to take advantage of Smoke Grenade when it was legal. But this version of Gearfree was never used for its synergy with Smoke Grenade, it was instead used for its great extension and powerful monster negate. Overall though, there's no doubt about Gearfree being an iconic part of Joey's arsenal and one that would have altered the events of the entire series if Joey had been able to declare his attack. And that's something that's been realized in the TCG, as the modern version of Gearfried has enough power to rival that of another immortal phoenix. And cutting into number 3 is the Flame Swordsman, one of Joey's original ace monsters that he even declared as his favorite card during the events of the Duelist Kingdom arc, which resulted in his soul being placed into the card during Yami Yugi's Shadow Game against Bakura. Now, in the TCG, Flame Swordsman is a vanilla fusion monster that requires two specific materials in order to summon. But in the anime, this card was actually a regular, normal monster that featured a strong 1800 attack. This made Flame Swordsman an amazing card during the event of the Duelist Kingdom, where its high attack managed to cut down a ton of other monsters. And because of the Duelist Kingdom rules, Joey didn't even need to tribute a monster in order to bring out this level 5 beat stick to the field. This made it one of Joey's most reliable offensive threats, and one that was even made stronger when paired with an appropriate equip card. A strategy that was integral during Yugi and Joey's tag duel against the Paradox Brothers, where Flame Swordsman equipped with Salamandra managed to take down the Dungeon Worm due to his weakness to fire. But Flame Swordsman's most interesting use was probably as Joey's deck master during the Virtual World arc, because as a deck master he could transfer his strength to any of Joey's other warrior monsters, which was a representation of Joey's desire to protect and strengthen his friends. And this desire proved vital in his and Yugi's tag duel against the Big Five, where Flame Swordsman was not only necessary to summon out Dark Flare Knight, but its effect to strengthen other warriors gave Yugi's Dark Magician Knight just enough attack strength to take down the Big Five's Berserk Dragon. But as you can expect, Flame Swordsman has never really been too strong of a card in the actual game. And a big reason for that is because instead of a normal monster, Flame Swordsman is a fusion monster with two specific materials, a downside that made it nearly impossible to summon in the early days of the game. And you'd never really want to go out of your way to summon him since he's just a vanilla beat stick, and a pretty bad one at that with only 1800 attack which is not only weaker than some modern normal monsters, but also weaker than some of the other earlier fusion monsters. But strangely enough, there are ways that Flame Swordsman's and its retrains can be useful, and that way happens to strengthen other warriors while also working alongside equip cards, and that's by being a way to bridge into Isolde, a lane 2 monster that's capable of summoning any warrior from your deck, provided you send equip spells equal to the warrior monster's level from your deck to the graveyard. 
You can do this with the regular Flame Swordsman by using Instant Fusion or Ready Fusion, but the most common Flame Swordsman version available for your Soul Day is actually Ferocious Flame Swordsman. Who saw playing Lurmancer in can Codex for its ability to convert two non-warrior monsters into a warrior? This meant that by summoning Lurmancer Agent and linking off Fire and Geek Boy into Ferocious Flame Swordsman, you had an easy way of accessing a Soul Day. Which, in a weird way, keeps the spirit of Flame Swordsman alive. Because even if he isn't on the battlefield himself, he's still supporting the warriors to this day and lending strength to his comrades to combine into even stronger monsters. And that is definitely something Joey would be proud of. And watching over the number two spot is Time Wizard, one of Joey's most unique monsters that was gifted to him by Yugi on the boat to the Duel's Kingdom in order to strengthen his deck, and Yugi saying that it might be helpful in a tight situation. And that's because of Time Wizard's powerful effect. You see, in the TCG, Time Wizard's effect allows you to flip a coin, and if you call it wrong, you have to destroy all monsters you control and take damage equal to half of their combined attack stat. But if you call it right, you get to wipe your opponent's field of monsters. In the anime, this effect worked slightly differently and would spin a roulette instead of flipping a coin. If the roulette landed on a skull, Time Wizard's time magic would end up opening a time warp and force your monsters to be scattered across time, removing them from the field. But if Time Wizard was successful, their time magic would age every monster in the field by thousands of years. This was a huge benefit for Joey in a ton of different ways, and one that managed to get him out of numerous tight spots throughout the series. Because in the face of overwhelming odds, Joey would gamble on Time Wizard's effect, and usually succeed, aging up his monsters and causing a whole host of different downsides depending on the monster's age. The Harpy Ladies, for example, ended up becoming old and brittle, which caused their attack strength to lower. But Rex Raptor's Red-Eyes Black Dragon ended up being turned into a complete fossil. But that's only half of the benefit of a successful Time Wizard, because it wasn't just your opponent's monsters that would age, it was Joey's monsters as well. And you'd think that would be a pretty bad downside. But it meant that Time Wizard paired perfectly with another one of Joey's ace monsters, Baby Dragon. Because if Time Wizard succeeded while Baby Dragon was on the field, Baby Dragon would turn into Thousand Dragon a monster with attack strength to dominate over a field of aged monsters. Now unfortunately, for as cool as Time Wizard was in the anime, its TCG effect was never that useful. Destroying all monsters your opponent controls is a beneficial effect, but it relies on chance, and unless you had Joey Wheeler's luck, it was unlikely that you could actually guarantee that Time Wizard went in your favor, even if you had a second chance at it. Especially since there are easier ways to clear the field without risking your own monsters. And as a whole, it's a shame that Time Wizard isn't amazing in the TCG because of how iconic it was in the anime, where it really felt like one of Joey's best backup plans that managed to get him out of even the most dire of circumstances. And it was a reminder to Joey from Yugi that the strength of some cards, while seen in their attack points, can remain unseen with their synergy. And burning into number one is the Red-Eyes Black Dragon, Joey Wheeler's ace monster that serves as proof that he's as strong of a duelist as both Kaiba and Yugi. Just like the other two main ace monsters of the series, Red-Eyes is a vanilla beat stick with no effect, that according to its flavor text is a ferocious dragon with a deadly attack. But between the three aces, Red-Eyes actually has the weakest attack at only 2400, and that makes a lot of sense because while Kaiba's blue eyes is supposed to represent pure power, red eyes instead is supposed to represent a great potential. And that idea mirrors Joey's arc in the anime, because initially, Joey was terrible at the game when he played against his friends at school. But due to the intense training of Grandpa Moto, as well as some last minute trades make his deck stronger, Joey was finally able to break his losing streak, and not only managed to beat My Valentine in his first duel of Duel's Kingdom, he also defeated Rex Raptor, who initially wielded the power of Red Eyes, managing to prove himself as a duelist while living up to his true potential. And from there on in, Red Eyes became a staple part of Joey's strategy and one of his strongest monsters all the way up until the Battle City, where he actually ended up losing Red Eyes to a rare hunter only for Yugi to win it back. But instead of accepting Red Eyes from Yugi, Joey wanted to prove himself as a duelist once more throughout this arc, and so Red Eyes became part of Yugi's deck. And part of that was vital for Yugi's victory in his duel against Kaiba during the Battle City semifinals. This culminated in the final duel of Battle City after Merrick's defeat, where Yugi and Joey had one last duel where Joey could prove himself worthy to earn back his Red-Eyes Black Dragon. We never got to see the results of this duel in the anime, but it's implied that Joey actually managed to beat the King of Games, as we once again see Red-Eyes in his deck during the Wake of the Dragon's arc. And it's this desire to change and grow that made Joey so worthy to wield the card. Just like how Red-Eyes wasn't just as powerful as a boss monster, but had hidden strength when it was combined with other cards or evolved into a greater threat. We saw a ton of Red Eyes evolutions across the series from Red Eyes Black Dragon Sword to Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon. But the one that most people remember is probably Black Skull Dragon. The fusion between Yugi's Summoned Skull and Joey's Red Eyes, a representation of strength of the friendship between these two duelists. And weirdly enough, Red Eyes' strength in the actual game mirrors why it's so strong in the anime. You see, in the TCG, Red Eyes itself is never a card you really want to play. Because while it's a strong beat stick, it doesn't really do anything on its own. 
and most red eyes focus strategies are usually pretty messy. But across the years, different evolved forms of red eyes have seen a huge amount of competitive success, with all of these forms living up to the potential of Joey and red eyes in different ways. There's of course monsters like Dragoon that can be summoned out with the likes of Red Eyes Fusion, who have been splashed into a ton of different decks throughout the years. And there's also the likes of Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon, which became a permanent staple in Dragon Link decks, and was so strong it even needed an errata to limit its effect to once per turn. Essentially, Red Eyes has never been an amazingly strong card on its own, as even in the early days of the game, it was outclassed by other strong beaters like Summit Skull and Blue Eyes White Dragon. But despite being the weakest of the original aces, a few Red Eyes cards have actually made a big splash in the competitive metagame, which is honestly really cute, that the spirit of Red Eyes is alive to this day, showing that even the weakest cards can become some of the strongest threats, just like how even the worst duelists can become world champions. My Valentine was one of the strongest duelists in the original anime. It managed to reach the finals of both Duelist Kingdom and Battle City. Most other duelists struggle to keep up with the likes of Yugi Moto, Seto Kaiba, and Joey Wheeler, but Mai managed to hold her own consistently, proving her worth as a player with her Harpy Lady strategy. So today, we're going to look at Mai's 10 most iconic cards, how Mai used them to her advantage, and whether or not her strategies actually hold up in the TCG. And at number 10, we have Shadow of Eyes, one of Mai's strangest trap cards and also played an important role during the Duelist Kingdom arc. What makes this trap card so weird though, is the difference between its anime and TCG version. In the TCG, Shadow of Eyes is a normal trap card that can only be activated when an opponent sets a monster to the field and forces that monster into face-up attack position while also preventing the flu effects from being activated. But in the anime, Shadow of Eyes is actually a card that equips to a monster you control and allows that monster to use pheromones in order to force an opponent's monster into attack position while tempting them to declare an attack. This all came with one big downside though. These pheromones don't work on female monsters. Now, despite this strange effect though, Shadow of Eyes was a dominant threat in Mai and Yugi's Duelist Kingdom duel. You see, in this duel, Yugi was struggling with an internal conflict after his defeat with Kaiba which caused him to hold back and be distracted in his duel against Mai. This disappointed the pro duelist as earlier Mai had surrendered a duel to give Yugi the star chips he needed to meet her in the finals, where she had hoped the King of Gangs would go all out against her. But because of Yugi's struggle, Mai held a huge advantage. And the ice on the cake was Shadow of Eyes, which when paired with the Mirror Wall was forcing Yugi's monsters to attack, having their strengths so they could then be destroyed by Harpy Lady, a nearly unbreakable strategy that almost won Mai the duel. And if this had been my Valentine at the start of the series, she would have been happy with her victory. But instead, she was dissatisfied, and so gave Yugi some more words of encouragement, reminding him to face his fears. Just like how Yugi and his friends had taught Mai to face her own fear of defeat. This encouragement resonated with Yugi, allowing for him to stage a comeback, which would eventually lead him to winning the duel, putting him one step closer to facing Pegasus and saving his grandpa. But if Mai had just been even a little less caring for her new friends, Shadow of Eyes would have secured her victory against Yugi Moto. Unfortunately though, for as powerful as the anime made this card out to be, Shadow of Eyes has never really been a strong card in the TCG. Its effect isn't entirely useless. It can technically be okay against strategies focused on flip monsters as a way to prevent their effects from activating, while force them into attack position which could help with the potential OTK. The issue is, there are a ton of better ways of dealing with set monsters in the field that are way less awkward to use and don't require a turn of setup, and can instead be used instantly to not only prevent that monster from activating its flip effect, but also remove it from the field entirely. So overall, it's a shame that Shadow of Eyes wasn't really able to successfully transition into TCG, as not only was it a card that pushed Yugi to his limits, it also allowed for Mai to show off the lessons she had learned from her newfound friends. And burning to number 9 spot is Harpy Lady Phoenix Formation, a card that showed just how much the Orichalcos had influenced Mai. And that's because of Phoenix Formation's powerful removal effect, which pretty much just makes it a Raigeki for the Harpy Lady strategy. Because if you control three or more Harpy Ladies or Harpy Lady Sisters, you can target and destroy a monster's opponent controls up to the number of Harpy Ladies or Sisters you have on your side of the field. Then you get to inflict damage to your opponent equal to the attack of the monster with the highest original attack. In the TCG, this effect comes with a bunch of different downsides, as it prevents you from conducting your battle phase or special summoning any monsters from your main or extra deck. But the anime version of this card is actually a lot stronger, as it does damage equal to the attack of all monsters you destroy, and only has one restriction which prevents harpy monsters you control from attacking for the turn. This made the card a strong tool in the anime, and one the Orichalcos influenced Mai would use to great effect during the Wake of the Dragons arc, where she felt a desperate need to prove herself as a top duelist to step out of the shadow of Yugi, Kaiba, and Joey. Which is why Mai made several choices to her deck from Battle City, making her strategy more merciless. This included incorporating the power of the Orichalcos, which not only strengthened her monsters, but enabled the power of Phoenix Formation by allowing Mai to summon out even more Harpy Ladies to the field in the back row. These new cards coincide with the now Orichalcos controlled Mai's new Ruthless strategy, 
with Phoenix Formation being particularly cruel as not only did it destroy your opponent's monsters, it burned your opponent's life points based on the total attack of every monster it destroyed, and was so strong it allowed for Mai to defeat Maximilian Pegasus, the creator of dual monsters. But this card isn't quite as cold blooded in the TCG, and so even when Harpies had their chance to shine in the competitive game, no one ever played Phoenix Formation. A big part of that is because of how difficult it is to use. Phoenix Formation's effect can definitely be useful to clear an opponent's board, and because of its burn can even be the reason you win a duel. But the downside makes it a really awkward to use card. Controlling three or more Harpy Lady or Harpy Lady Sisters definitely isn't impossible, as a Harpy strategy can easily swarm the field with a ton of Harpy Ladies, thanks to Harpy Channeler and Elegant Egotist, both of which make Phoenix Formation a little stronger. If it also didn't have the downside that prevents you from special summoning from your main or extra deck, as this makes it a lot harder to actually swarm the field when you're locked out of using your best combo pieces. But even if this card didn't have this restriction, it's still just a lot worse to clear the field because of the setup it requires, as it's a lot easier to use a Raigeki, Dark Hole, or Lightning Storm if you want to wipe away your opponent's board of monsters and then don't decay them with your other cards, rather than relying solely on the burn of Phoenix Formation which skips your battle phase. So it's pretty unlikely that Phoenix Formation will ever see any real success. The Harpy Lady strategy has evolved to the point where using the card is more of a detriment than anything else. And even though this is somewhat unfortunate because of how powerful the card was in the anime, it's cool that the more cruel cards in my strategies aren't that amazing, showing that she was already a good duelist and didn't need to rely on the Oracle Coast to compete. And roaring into number 8 spot is Harpy's Pet Dragon, a level 7 dragon monster that gave Mai's Harpy ladies a powerful beat stick that could even take in the likes of the Summoned Skull. And that's because of Pet Dragon's effect, which lets it gain an extra 300 attack for every Harpy lady on the field, which with enough Harpy ladies can turn Pet Dragon from a decent beater into an absolute powerhouse. As a result, Harpy's Pet Dragon became one of Mai's strongest monsters, and one that could reach ridiculous levels of power, such as Mai's first Oric Calcos duel against Joey, where Pet Dragon's attack grew to even stronger than likes of the Blue Eyes White Dragon and Blacklisted Soldier at an impressive 2400 attack points thanks to its own effect, and the power of the Oric Calcos. But most people likely remember Pet Dragon from Mai's duel against Yugi in the Duelist Kingdom's final, where it appeared as a terrifying force that pushed Yugi to his limits and had an attack power so great that when Yugi mounted it onto Catapult Turtle, it was capable of breaking Mai's mirror wall. Now, in the TCG, Harpy's Pet Dragon wasn't really the strongest boss monster the anime made it out to be. It could still be decently strong with the right setup, but by the time Harpies were competitively viable, the game had long gone past the need for huge beat sticks as a win condition. That doesn't mean Pet Dragon was terrible though, but its role in Harpy Lady strategy changed quite a bit. Instead of being just a decent beat stick, Pet Dragon instead saw play because it went as an amazing target to special summon the effect of Harpy Channeler, a level 4 monster that becomes level 7 while you control a dragon monster. This meant that by summoning Pet Dragon with the effect of Channeler, you had instant access to any rank 7 in the game, which was actually really valuable in 2013 and 2014, as it gave the deck access to the likes of Draco Sack, a powerful removal option, and Big Eye, which could steal your opponent's best monsters. And in the modern era, while Harpy strategies usually don't see much success, an evolution of Harpy's Pet Dragon, known as Fearsome Fire Blast, actually features in a few different win-focused strategies as a free extender. As a whole though, it's really cool to see how Harpy's Pet Dragon has evolved. While Mai use it more as a boss monster, the more modern Harpy support cards have given greater utility beyond just being a beat stick, and allowed for Harpy's Pet Dragon to remain by her side even in the modern day. And at number 7, we have Mirror Wall a staple part of my strategy that made her monsters almost invincible. Because with Mirror Wall, the attack of any monster your opponent controls that declares an attack is cut in half. This also comes with a maintenance cost though, as during each of your standby phases you must pay 2,000 light points or destroy the card. But the anime version had no such cost, and even negated the attack of your opponent's monsters as they would instead attack their mirror image. This made Mirror Wall a really effective part of Mai's arsenal, and a card that protected her harpy ladies from battle against comparatively stronger monsters effectively creating an almost impenetrable wall since it's a continuous trap, which meant that it always stayed on the field. So if her opponent didn't have any way of dealing with Mirror Wall, Mai's monsters were always safe from battle since if a monster did declare an attack, their strength was halved permanently, which allowed for Harpy Lady to stage an effective counterattack on the next turn. And it made sense for Mai to run such a defensive card because before she had met Yugi, Joey, and the rest of the gang, she saw her Harpy Lady monsters as her only friends and couldn't bear the thought of watching them being destroyed. In the modern TCG though, Mirror Wall is rarely going to have the chance to protect any monster. You see, like other battle tricks, Mirror Wall can technically catch an opponent off guard by forcing their boss monster to crash into a much weaker card, giving you a major advantage. But because of the abundance of removal options most decks have, as well as how easy it is to set up an early negate, battle phase focused traps don't really see too much success in the modern era. But in the early days of the game and even in Duel Links, Mirror Wall did actually see some minor success, 
and was used just like how it was in the anime, to create a wall that can weaken your opponent's monsters, leaving them as easy targets for your own. Which made it an effective battle trick for as long as it stayed in the field, but not one that was guaranteed to be impenetrable, as it eventually be forced to leave the field when you could no longer pay its hefty cost. So it's nice to see that a card that was used to protect Mai's most sentimental monsters in the anime once had its place in the actual game to protect monsters other duelists cared about, even though it no longer has its place in the actual meta. And capturing the number 6 spot is Amazonas Chainmaster, one of the Amazon monsters that Mai included in her Battle City deck that allowed her to reach the finals. And each Amazon has their own role to play in Mai's strategy. Amazon Fighter and Swordsman were great beat sticks. Amazon Archers were a great battle trick, and Amazon Chainmaster could be used to turn your opponent's cards against them. You could do that in the TCG whenever it was destroyed by battle if you paid the cost of 1500 life points. Letting look at your opponent's hand is still one of their monsters. Although the anime version of this card works a little differently, it only requires 1000 life points and triggers whenever an attack vision Chainmaster is sent to the graveyard rather than just when it's destroyed by battle. And instead of letting you add a monster from your opponent's hand, it lets you add any monster from their deck. This effect led to one of Mai's most important moments in the series during her shadow game against Merrick where for every monster that was destroyed by Merrick, Mai would lose a memory of one of her friends. Of course, she wasn't going to let this happen, and with a genius play, she sent her own Chainmaster to the graveyard, which prevented one of her memories from being lost, and allowed for Mai to trigger her effect to steal the Winged Dragon of Ra. If all had gone to plan, this would have actually been a game-winning move, as not only would it prevent Merrick from using Ra against her, it would have allowed for Mai to wield the power of the Egyptian god. But because she didn't know the ancient chant to transform Ra from its spear mode, Mai was left helpless as Merrick performed the chant to take control of the god card, leading to his victory. Leaving Mai helpless and trapped within the Shadow Realm after Yugi and Joey had saved her from taking the full force of an Egyptian god. Thankfully, Shadow games don't come up that often in real life, so if you want to use Chainmaster to steal your opponent's Egyptian god card, you're not going to lose your soul. But because of the way Chainmaster works in the actual game, she hasn't seen any real competitive play. And that's because in order to activate her effect, she needs to be destroyed by battle. In the modern day, effects that float when destroyed by battle usually aren't that viable because there's a ton of different ways to remove a monster from the field without using the battle phase. But even back in the earliest days of the game, Chainmaster wasn't really that good, as other floaters like Mystic Tomato and Sangin were guaranteed to always net you advantage and work with your deck. And while Chainmaster could be used as a decent hand control card, there was no guarantee that your opponent had a monster in their hand, or that the monster you steal from them would be useful in your deck. But even though Chainmaster never really saw too much use, the Amazonas archetype actually had a big impact on the metagame of Duel Links, where thanks to its modern support, there was a time where it was one of the best decks you could play thanks to Onslaught's amazing removal. So even though Chainmaster has never really been too important to the TCG, the legacy of the Amazonas cards can still be felt in Duel Links, where their powerful playstyle even put some of their cards in the Forbidden and Limited list. And while it's not likely that you're going to be able to use Chainmaster to steal your opponent's Egyptian God card, it's cool to see that one of my stable archetypes actually had its time of day in a different format. And circling to number 5 is the Seal of Orichalcos, a card that promised anyone that used it greater power, with my being no exception. And part of that power is instilled in your monsters, because while the power of the Orichalcos is on the field, all your monsters you control gain 500 attack. But that's not all, because it also protects itself one time each turn from being destroyed by card effects. And it even protects weaker monsters in the field as well, because while you control two or more face-up attack position monsters, your opponent can't target any monsters you control for an attack except the monster with the highest attack. But for this power, you must pay a price. Because not only must you destroy all special summon monsters you control after activating it, you're also locked out of the extra deck entirely while you control it. And you can only activate this seal of Orichalcos once per duel. And this is the TCG version of the card, because the anime version had some big differences. Because this version of the card allowed you to put monsters into your spell and trap card zone, allowing you to swarm the field with up to 10 monsters at once. And your opponent couldn't attack your monsters in their back row unless the front row was clear first. The anime version also gave them the same 500 attack boost, but without the downside of the TCG. Although, you might instead have to pay an even greater price. Because if you happen to lose a duel while the Seal of Orichalcos was in either player's field, you will lose your soul. This made the Orichalcos an evil card, and one that was used by Dards at the Domo organization in the Waking the Dragons arc in order to capture souls to awaken the Great Leviathan. So, why did Mai use the card? Well, you see, after the events of Battle City, Mai was left heartbroken and traumatized. She was still a successful duelist even after her loss to Merrick and managed to do well in a ton of different tournaments. But despite her skills and achievements, Mai was led to believe that she was still far weaker than the likes of Yugi, Kaiba, and Joey, and constantly lived in their shadow. What's worse was that Mai was having near-constant nightmares of her time in the Shadow Realm, which caused her fear of loss and defeat to steadily increase its grip over her. And without Joey or her other friends to help her, 
Mai was left lost, scared, and alone, until Valen and the Orichalcos reached out to her and promised the victories that she was so desperate for. From there on in, Mai allowed the Orichalcos to have influence over her and her monsters, and would use the card consistently even against her former friends, such as Joey Wheeler, just so she could prove her strength as a duelist uncaring for the fact that her victory would have resulted in him losing his soul. This made Mai absolutely ruthless with this card, because not only did it boost all of her monsters' attack, it allowed her to swarm the field with lots more Harpy Ladies, giving her access to new cards like Harpy Lady Phoenix and Sparrow Formation. But the sad thing about the Orichalcos was that, even though Mai gave into her fear of defeat for its strength, the power that it promised her was hollow. Because in every duel where she faced Joey, he could have beaten her, but he held back in order to find a way to prevent Mai from losing her soul. This turned out to be a costly mistake in the last duel together, where Joey was so exhausted from the prior duel against Valen, he ended up fainting before the duel was over, which caused the Orichalcos to take his soul, and for Mai to realize how foolish she had been to give up on her friends out of fear. However, as touching as this moment was, a situation like this isn't likely to happen in the TCG, because of the way the Orichalcos has been nerfed. The biggest difference between the two versions of the card is, of course, that if your opponent loses the vaults on the field, they no longer actually lose their soul. But it's the card's other nerfs that make it so hard to use. Destroying all special summon monsters you control on activation technically isn't the worst thing, as you can just activate the Aura Calculus before you combo off to give your monsters a free 500 attack boost. But because the card also locks you out of special summoning from the extra deck entirely, it means that if you activate the Aura Calculus before you perform your plays, you can't use one of the most important tools in the game. And if you activate it after you summon out from the extra deck, those monsters will end up being destroyed. This makes it really awkward to use for most strategies, as most decks in the game would much prefer access to their extra deck options rather than gaining an attack boost. Which, in a way, actually makes a lot of sense. Because just like in the anime, the power the Orc Calcos gave Mai ultimately wasn't worth it. It required her to give up far more than she would gain. And while the Orc Calcos can give you some power, you have to give up a lot more in order to use it. A 500 attack boost is rarely ever worth it. Just like how for Mai, it really wasn't worth it to give up her friends just so she could ensure victory, a fact that she realized a little too late. And slashing into number 4 is Cyber Harpy Lady, a version of Harpy Lady that comes pre-equipped with Cyber Shield. This gives the new version of Harpy Lady 500 more attack than its original counterpart, with the only other real difference between this card and the original being that this card is an effect monster. And funnily enough, it's actually one of the only effect monsters in the game that actually doesn't have an effect and instead has the condition which makes it so that it's always treated as Harpy Lady, even in the deck building process, which makes it so if you run three Harpy Ladies of this card, you actually can't run the original Harpy Lady. Regardless of this downside though, Cyber Harpy Lady was a great upgrade from the original counterpart that Mai used for the Battle City onwards, and was a great way for Mai's strategy to keep up with the even stronger monsters. But arguably, the most iconic use of this card wasn't even by Mai herself because after Mai had fallen into the Shadow Realm, the rest of the group were suddenly distracted by the interference of Noah Kaiba, who forced everyone's minds into the virtual world. While most of the people trapped there wanted to escape for their own sake, a big reason why Joey was desperate to leave the simulation was that so he could defeat Merrick and rescue Mai from the Shadow Realm. This caused Joey to actually incorporate a small harpy package as part of his deck in his and Yugi's tag duel against the Big Five, where he selected this card alongside Harpy's Feather Duster as a way to pay homage to Mai, as well as vow that he would save her. And this combo of cards ended up being really useful, as not only was Feather Duster vital for clearing away the Big Five's Legendary Ocean, Cyber Harpy had enough attack to take down the Legendary Fisherman. And it just so happens this attack strength actually led to Cyber Harpy Lady's success in the TCG as well. Because during the time where Harpy Lady was a viable strategy, you didn't actually need to run the original Harpy Lady at all. Because there were a few different cards that always treated themselves as Harpy Lady no matter where they were, allowing them to be summoned off of Elegant Egotist. This opened up some options for your choice of Harpy Lady. One of the better cards you could pick was Harpy Lady 1, as it increased the attack of all of your wind monsters by 300 points. But another great choice was Cyber Harpy Lady, due to it being the highest attack Harpy Lady that you could play, which could potentially be incredibly useful to take down an opponent's high attack monster. This made the card a genuine upgrade over the original Harpy Lady in the TCG and anime. But of course, even though this card is definitely the stronger of the two, both Mai and some duels in real life often still play the original card out of sentimentality. And reflecting into number 3 is Elegant Egotist, a card that could turn one Harpy Lady into three. In the TCG though, this was only technically true though, because if you controlled Harpy Lady, you could either summon another copy of Harpy Lady, or Harpy Lady Sisters, a monster that's a combination of all three original Harpy Ladies with their attacks added together and then cut in half. But in the anime, Egotist would actually summon the other two Harpy Ladies to complete the trio. And this combo was something that Mai used a great effect across most of her duels with Egotist allowing her to swarm the field with her powerful Harpy Lady sisters. These were decently strong beat sticks, but also paired excellently with Cyber Shield, 
as the sisters would gain the same buffs as the original Harpy Lady. Mai was a smart duelist though, and didn't just use these Harpy Ladies purely as beat sticks. It also took advantage of the swarm capabilities in order to boost the power of her other cards like Harpy's Pet Dragon. And this card's most iconic use was definitely in Mai's duel against Yami Merrick, where she used Harpy Lady alongside Elegant Egotist in order to bring out the three tributes necessary to summon up Merrick's Winged Dragon of Raw. And it's his strength as a swarming tool that made Elegant Egotist a really strong part of the Harpy Lady strategy. Now, unfortunately, the TCG version of the card is still weaker than its anime counterpart, since you only get the chance to summon one monster. And while you can still technically summon out Harpy Lady Sisters, the TCG version of Sisters is really lackluster. Because even though it's stronger than the original Harpy Lady, it's usually not worth playing because it can only ever be summoned out by Egotist. But Egotist has still seen a lot of success in competitive Harpy Lady decks, because of how easily it lets you bring out a free Harpy Lady directly from your deck, so long as you just control Harpy Lady on the field. Which is really easy as an activation requirement, because most Harpy monsters are usually treated as Harpy Lady while in the field or in the graveyard, which makes Egotist a great way of summoning out a free monster from your deck to bridge off into an easy rank 4. And what's even better is that Egotist is even searchable from the deck or graveyard with the effect of Hysteric Sign, an excellent continuous spell for the strategy that allows you to search one of your best swarming tools, and it can even let you add three Harpy Lady cards from your deck to your hand during the end phase if it happens to be sent to the graveyard. And overall, it's really neat to see the way my use Egotist in the anime is actually the best way to use the card in the TCG, as a swarming tool that can allow you to bridge off into other plays. Like how in Duel Links it was used to go into their synchro boss monster, that was enough to make them a top tier meta threat. And while you're not likely to use it to summon an Egyptian god, it's currently a great way to get free materials on the board for Xyz, Link, and even Synchro plays, especially when paired with their support around it. And sweeping into number 2 is Harpy's Feather Duster, one of Mai's most prominent and iconic staples, and one of the strongest cards in her deck. Because Feather Duster allows her to destroy all spell and trap cards her opponent controls with a single card. This led to Feather Duster being used by Mai throughout the series, and is a card that often gave her a huge advantage by either dealing with an opponent's tricky back row setup, or by clearing away their dangerous set cards before your opponent had a chance to activate them. This made Harpy's Feather Duster an absolute boon to her strategy, as it meant that Mai's Harpy Ladies were always safe from battle traps or even your opponent's equip cards, and was actually the main reason Mai was able to defeat Joey Wheeler in her last duel of the series. Where Feather Duster not only cleared away both of Joey's battle traps, it even managed to destroy Red Eye's Black Dragon Sword, giving her Harpy Ladies a path to attack. But arguably, the most interesting use of Feather Duster in the series was back in the Duelist Kingdom arc during Mai's duel against Taya Gardner. This duel was set up after Yugi was defeated by Kaiba, where not only had Yugi lost his starships, he was also going through an internal crisis. Thankfully, Mai had come along and offered Yugi some of her spare starships to repay her debt, but because Yugi was still struggling with his inner demons, he couldn't answer her. This annoyed Mai, so she tried to coax him into taking the starships by challenging him to a duel, but to no success. Taya then took Yugi's place in the name of friendship, and while she was an okay duelist, there was no chance of her being able to stand up to Mai Valentine who could have easily defeated Taya's Shining Friendship by activating Feather Duster to destroy her Silver Bow and Arrow. And while she considered it, ultimately Mai allowed Taya to defeat her, surrendering the duel to give Yugi back his star chips, and also trying to inspire him to go all out in their eventual duels in the finals, all the while giving Taya's friendship a chance to actually shine. Because even though Mai could have won, in her own words, there are some cards out there that just aren't worth it to be played. But in the TCG, Feather Duster is always worth it. Having the chance to clear where your opponent's back row has always been a strong effect, even to this day, with the likes of MST, Heavy Storm, and Twin Twisters all being great staples that could be found in competitive decks across the game's history, as these cards allow you to deal with your opponent's oppressive floodgates or destroy their set cards before they get a chance to activate them. But out of all the ways to clean up your opponent's spell and trap cards, Feather Duster is one of the strongest in the game's history, as it has the chance to clear away up to 6 of your opponent's cards for the price of 1, with no activation condition, cost, or risk. You don't even have to worry about destroying your own macro. In fact, the card was so good that it was banned in the TCG for over 16 years. Up until 2020 where it was limited and became a near instant inclusion in the side and main decks of a ton of different strategies as a way to destroy trap decks for virtually no cost. As activating Harpy's Feather Duster leaves these decks with nearly no way to strike back. Which is actually really cool that the way Mai used Harpy's in the anime is exactly the same as why it's so good in the TCG. Destroying your opponent's spell and trap cards can lead you to a huge advantage no matter which world you're in, and Mai teaches us a useful lesson with the card. If you want to remain friends with people who are on back row decks, you better probably not activate this card. And flying into number one is the card that, for a while, was Mai's only friend, Harpy Lady. Now, there are actually a few different versions of Harpy Lady that span across the eras. There's the likes of Harpy Conductor, Harpy Channeler, and Harpy Perfumer, who are always treated as Harpy Lady while in the field or in the graveyard. 
There's the Cyber Harpy Lady, Harpy Lady 1, 2, and 3, who are always treated as Harpy Lady no matter where they are. And of course, there's the original Harpy Lady, who unlike the other Harpy Ladies, is actually just a level 4 vanilla with 1300 attack and 1400 defense, with a flavor text that describes it as beautiful but deadly in battle. And that makes perfect sense for Mai's ace monster. As while other duelists would sometimes underestimate Mai, she proved time and time again how much of a deadly force she was, with a lot of that power being concentrated behind the versatility of her Harpy Lady strategy. And like many of the other ace cards in the series, Harpy Lady also had a special connection to its wielder because Mai had grown up alone without a real friendship, which led to her seeing her Harpy Ladies as her only friends up until she met Joey, Yugi, and the rest of the gang. But overall, the card was just amazingly versatile in her hands, and was used by her throughout this series as her main ace monster that could adapt to a ton of different situations as a beat stick, a swarming tool, and even as the center of a control strategy. And this versatility was given the chance to shine in the TCG, because in 2014, Harpy Ladies managed to showcase how useful they could be in the right hands by actually winning a YCS. And a huge part of that is thanks to its modern support centered on the Harpy Lady strategy around swarming the field with as many Harpy Lady variants as possible giving you easier access to the extra deck, all the while giving you more opportunities to trigger Harpy's Hunting Ground, which you could use to either clear your opponent's back row, or pop your own sign in order to gain some kind of advantage. And this same use carried over into Duel Links, where Harpy saw some time as a dominant strategy for similar reasons as to why it was stronger than TCG, and was even slightly better there thanks to its access to the previously mentioned Cyber Slash Harpy Lady. And funnily enough, Harpies were actually very meta for a long time, where they would constantly hit cards using Harpy decks on the ban list to try to rein in their power. But they just kept being the best deck. They even once tried to nerf the Harpy Lady field spell skill in a hilarious turn of events that actually made the skill stronger by mistake, where they had to nerf it again to actually make it worse. Now in the modern TCG though, the Harpy Lady strategy has fallen off somewhat and rarely ever gets a chance to shine competitively anymore but echoes of this strategy can still be found in a ton of different modern decks. Harpy's Feather Duster is a great stable you can find in just about every deck. Harpy's Feather Storm is a powerful floodgate that can sometimes win games all on its own and was used in flu strategies. And even Harpy Conductor once saw play in Tri Brigade strategies for being a winged beast monster that could be used to bridge into some morgue. So it's nice to see that the same versatility the cards had when Mai was using them carries over into the TCG, and even though the Harpy cards are oftentimes used differently, it's a testament to how adaptable the Harpy strategy is and how smart Mai was as a duelist to get the most out of her favorite card. Ryo Bakura was a kind-hearted ally of Yugimoto's who would cheer on his friends on the sidelines throughout most of the series. However, Bakura also held a dark secret, as he was possessed by the spirit of the Millennium Ring, a malevolent fiend who constantly oppressed the pharaoh in a quest for vengeance. So today we're going to look at Bakura's 10 most important cards, how he used them to control destiny, and whether or not they'd make him much of a threat in the TCG as he was in the anime. Trading into number 10 is Exchange, a card that showed off just how tactical and adaptable Yami Bakura could be. Exchange actually had a ton of interesting and important uses throughout the series, and the main reason for that was its unique effect, which forced both players to reveal their hands and then select a card from their opponent's hand to add to their own. But the reason why this card is so important to Bakura was that it almost allowed him to take down Yami Merrick with the help of the real Merrick spirit. You see, in this shadow game, Bakura couldn't rely on his usual occult strategy as Yami Merrick had the opportunity to study every one of Bakura's tactics in his previous duel against Yugi, which gave Merrick's dark side a huge advantage. This wasn't a deterrent for Bakura though, as Merrick's soul had promised Bakura he could read the engravings on Merrick's back if he could take down his evil half. But rather than relying on his usual tricks to win the duel, Bakura instead altered his strategy to bring out enough tributes for an Egyptian god. The only issue was that Bakura didn't actually own an Egyptian god card. However, Bakura wasn't called the King of Thieves for no reason, as his new strategy was based around bringing the winged dragon raw to Merrick's hand as quickly as possible so that Bakura could then still raw with the effect of exchange. The idea behind this move was genius, as not only did it allow Bakura to wield the power of raw, it prevented Merrick from using his Egyptian god against him. Or at least it would have, because for as tactical as this move was, Merrick still wound up being the victor of the shadow game. And a big part of that was because of the card he'd taken from Bakura's exchange, Monster Reborn, which later allowed him to revive Ra from the graveyard and then use its point-to-point -point transfer ability to banish Bakura to the darkness with a one-turn kill. Now, while Bakura lost his duel, the way he used Exchange manages to show off the card's strengths and downsides in the actual TCG. You see, Exchange isn't always guaranteed to be useful because the card you steal from your opponent isn't likely to synergize with your particular strategy. 
And what's worse is that the card you end up giving them could potentially end up backfiring against you just like how Monster Reborn that Bakura gave Merrick was instrumental in Bakura's defeat. But that doesn't mean exchange is always terrible either, because just like how Bakura used the card to sell raw, stealing away your opponent's cards can actually have a ton of benefits with hand traps making an exchange a really interesting tool. You see, hand traps are generic options that you can play in your deck to interrupt your opponent during their turn and are pretty much seen everywhere in the modern game. And you can use exchange to sniff out these interruptions before you combo off. This gives you the perfect information on the cards in your opponent's hand, while also giving you the opportunity to steal their interruptions before they have a chance to use them against you. And by the time their turn rolls around, you can just use their hand trap against them as an extra way to stop their plays. So even though these generic tools aren't quite on the same level as the Winged Dragon of Raw, the way the card is used in the TCG perfectly mirrors how Bakura uses it in the anime, preventing Merrick from using Raw against him while also taking advantage of the Egyptian God card by altering his usual strategy. And although Bakura ended up losing the duel because of exchange downsides, it at least showed off how adaptable he was as a duelist. And haunting to number 9 is the Headless Knight, who alongside the Earl of Demise and a ton of other creepy feed monsters, acted as some of the key foundations for Bakura's strategy. These monsters are all normal monsters with no effects, and were mainly used by Bakura for their decent stats, with both Headless Knight and Earl of Demise specifically acting as some of his main offensive threats throughout the series. For the most part though, these monsters were usually outclassed by other strong beat sticks, and so even though they could hold their own, they would quickly find their way into the graveyard, which is exactly what Bakura wanted. Because in Battle City, Bakura's deck was based around an occult strategy where it was extremely beneficial to have a bunch of fiend monsters in the graveyard, allowed him to use the graveyard as an extra resource. In fact, this strategy was so graveyard reliant that in his battle city duel against Yugi, Bakura initially appeared like a total amateur. Because during the first few turns of the duel, he kept summoning his low attack fiends to the field in attack position, allowing for Yugi's more powerful monsters to easily destroy them. But this was all an elaborate ploy that showed just how manipulative Bakura could be, as Yugi had played right into his hands, and gave Bakura the three fiend monsters in the graveyard necessary in order to bring out Dark Necrofear. Unfortunately though, these particular fiend monsters haven't really found a place in the TCG. There's definitely ways you can use vanilla fiends to your advantage, but for the most part, these iconic parts of Bakura's strategy don't really have a deck to call home. But the way Bakura used these cards actually represents a really interesting aspect of Yu-Gi-Oh that's still important to the modern day, the graveyard strategy. You see, if a deck is capable of interacting with or using the graveyard in some way, that usually gives a strategy a huge advantage as it just opens up extra resources that can allow you to interact with your opponents, swarm the field, or even summon out your boss monster. And as a result, decks that can take the most advantage of the graveyard have seen prominent play across the game's history from ancient chaos and dad strategies who required certain cards in the graveyard to bring out their power boss monsters, to modern day decks like tier limits which cemented their tier 0 status due to their strong affinity with the grave which allow them to swarm the field with tons of fusions. Essentially, if your deck can use the graveyard well, you're going to have a big advantage against decks that can't. So while Bakura's terrifying fiends never really saw any play themselves, the way he used them to feel a graveyard strategy was actually an incredibly smart tactic, and one that's been strong in the TCG throughout the game's history. Reviving into number 8 is Zoma the Spirit, a trap card that's born from Bakura's imagination that almost allowed him to defeat Yugi Moto in their final duel of the series. You see, Zoma the Spirit is a trap card that summons itself as a monster, and when it's destroyed by battle, inflicts damage to your opponent equal to the attack of the monster that destroyed it. Although this is the weaker TCG version of the card, Bakura's version of Zoma instead deals damage equal to double the attack of that monster. This made Zoma a deadly force in Bakura and Yugi's duel during the Feral's memory arc where the fate of the world was on the line. Because if Bakur had won this duel, he would have prevented Yugi and his friends from revealing the Pharaoh's true name, which was the only way they had left to reseal Zork after Bakur had unleashed his darkness upon the world. And Zoma nearly assured Bakur the victory as he paired it with Call of the Earthbound, which forced Yugi's Silent Magician to attack Zoma, destroying the spirit in the process. This would have dealt lethal damage to Yugi, but Yugi used Turn Jump at the last second, which forced the duel to jump forward several turns and prevented Zoma's effect from resolving. But if he hadn't had this last minute play, Zoma would have secured Bakura's victory, and left the world and Yugi in darkness. Thankfully though, if someone who wanted to destroy the world was using Zoma the Spirit in the TCG, it wouldn't be too much help to them. Because while Zoma can be a decent way to either stall or deal a ton of burn damage, it's unlikely to win you games, especially in the modern era where a ton of removal options exist to deal with Zoma before the battle phase. 
And even back when Zoma was first released, there were a ton of better ways to deal burn damage to your opponent. But in speed duels, Zoma the Spirit lived up to its near world ending legacy by being a generically powerful tool that just about any deck could play. In speed duels, removal options are a lot more limited, and life points matter a lot more since you start off at only 4,000 rather than 8,000. This makes the card incredibly difficult to remove without the battle phase. And if you do remove it, it's going to take a huge chunk out of your life points. In fact, Zoma was so strong in this format that in the official speed duel events, Zoma the Spirit is the only one of the cards in the game to ever be limited for its versatility. And so, while Zoma wasn't the best card in the actual game, it's cool that one of Bakura's most pivotal cards actually managed to showcase why it was so strong in a different format, and for the exact same reason that it was used in the anime. And flipping into number 7 is Morphing Jar, one of the many flip monsters that Bakura used to gain an underhanded advantage during his first shadow game against Yami Yugi. And the way he did this was by using Morphing Jar's flip effect multiple times during the duel, forcing both him and Yugi to discard their entire hand so they could both draw 5 cards. If this had just been a normal game, Morphing Jar would have benefited both players equally by replenishing their hands. But this was more than just a regular game. It was a shadow game. And the rules of this particular shadow game meant that the souls of Yugi's friends had been placed into their favorite cards, which were now a part of his deck. But if those monsters were sent to the graveyard and remained there for too long, a spirit would come and take their souls to the afterlife. And Morphing Jar, alongside a ton of other cards in Bakura's deck, gave Bakura multiple ways to send a Tim's monsters to the graveyard as quickly as possible. Because the moment one of Yugi's friends were sent to the graveyard, Yami only had a short while to bring them back before their souls were lost forever. This led to Yami making some pretty bad plays just so he could save his friends, and would have even let Bakura win the duel if it hadn't been for the meddling of his other half. Now, Morphing Jar has seen a fair amount of competitive success in the TCG, so much so that it's actually one of the only flip monsters that's still on the Forbidden and Limited list, but for different reasons to why Bakura used it in his shadow game. You see, while there are strategies like Empty Jar that revolve around Morphing Jar's ability to deck an opponent out, filling up your opponent's graveyard is actually one of the major downsides of the card, as you can accidentally trigger some powerful graveyard effects. But even with this big downside, Morphing Jar saw a ton of success in the early days of the game, as replenishing your hand was a really strong effect that had the potential to be game winning as it gave you a whole host of new options you could use to strike back against your opponent. Now your opponent did get the same benefit, but because you're aware of your own Morphing Jar being set, you could commit as many cards as possible from your hand to the field so you can get more advantage out of it than your opponent, with it having the potential to go plus 5 in terms of card advantage. Overall, the way Bakura uses this card is a lot different to how it's used in the actual game, but that makes a lot of sense given that he was using the card in an evil way to kill off the Pharaoh's friends. And you can even see the same in the TCG with the Empty Jar deck. But if you ever find yourself trapped in a shadow game in the TCG, it's better to rely on Morphing Jar to draw your cards rather than to deck out your opponent. And possessing into the number 6 spot is Dark Necrofear, one of Bakura's most iconic cards that acted as his ace monster during the Battle City arc. And it worked especially well with Bakura's occult strategy, as Dark Necrofear requires three fiend monsters to be banished from the graveyard in order to summon it. And if it's sent to the graveyard in some way, you get to trigger a powerful effect. But what graveyard effect gets activated will depend on the version of Necrofear being played. The TCG version of Necrofear activates during the end phase whenever it's destroyed by an opponent's card, and lets you target and take control an opponent's face-up monster by equipping Necrofear from it from the graveyard, essentially possessing the monster. Although the anime version of this card is actually quite a lot simpler, as all it does is activate Dark Sanctuary from your hand deck or graveyard. This made Necrofair an excellent part of Bakura's new strategy, as not only was it a powerful monster in its own right, but if Bakura's opponent managed to defeat it, they were now locked under the power of Dark Sanctuary, which prevented them from attacking or else they'd risk losing life points. The manga version of the card had similar utility and was even more important in the graveyard than its anime counterpart, as its destruction was necessary to allow Bakura to activate Destiny Board. As a result, Necrofear became a core part of Bakura's deck in both the anime and manga, and was even willing to sacrifice both his monsters and his life points to bring it to the field. Unfortunately though, for as iconic as Necrofear was, it's never seen any real competitive success. The TCG version of the card is a lot stronger than its anime and manga counterparts, as it isn't relying on Dark Sanctuary or Destiny Board to make it useful, with its new graveyard effect being a pretty good way to steal an opponent's monster, especially during the early days of the game. But because there weren't that many amazing fiend monsters in Classic Yu-Gi-Oh!, it was pretty difficult to build around Necrofear's summoning conditions, especially after Sangan was limited. And in the modern day, even with a plethora of strong fiend monsters to choose from, Necrofear is simply outclassed by other, better mind control cards that don't require a ton of graveyard setup to use. And that's honestly a huge shame as Necrofear was one of Bakura's coolest monsters that lay at the heart of his occult strategy. But at the very least, it's cool that the TCG version of the card is still capable of possessing monsters, 
just in a different way to how it did so in the anime and manga. And watching over the number 5 spot is Dark Sanctuary. The next part of Akura's occult strategy that he used in Battle City thanks to its excellent stalling capabilities. With Dark Sanctuary on the field, it's difficult for your opponent to declare an attack, because the moment they do, there's a chance that the Spirit of the Dark Sanctuary will negate the attack, also inflicting damage to them equal to half that monster's attack. Now, in the TCG, whether or not your monster is possessed is determined by a coin flip. But in the anime, Bakura secretly chooses a monster to be possessed each turn. But that's not the only strength of Dark Sanctuary, because it actually synergizes a ton with Bakura's Destiny board. It allows you to bring the spirit message to the field without clogging up your spell trap card zones, with the TCG version of the card letting you special summon the spirit monsters as unaffected monsters that can be attacked. The anime version of the card also increases your life points by half the attack of the monster that's possessed that attacked, but also comes with a couple of big downsides, as it requires tributing each of your end phases, and it can only be activated while Dark Necrofair is in your graveyard. Regardless of these downsides though, Bakura made excellent use of Dark Sanctuary in his Battle City duel against Yugi, because the moment Yugi managed to deal with Necrofear, Bakura immediately activated Dark Sanctuary. This put Yugi in an immensely difficult situation, because now every attack he declared was a risk that could potentially lose in the duel, especially because he had no way to tell which monster Bakura had possessed. This was already a huge threat by itself, but was especially strong with Bakura's Destiny board, as not only did Dark Sanctuary give Bakura lots of extra time to try to finish Destiny Board's word, it also gave Bakura enough space to use his other spell and trap cards, like the Dark Door, a continuous spell that meant that Yugi could only attack with one monster per turn, making his choice even more impactful, and Dark Spirit of the Silent, which meant that even if Yugi made the right decision, Bakura could force his possessed monster to attack anyways. And these tools combined to create the ultimate stall strategy, and one that almost allowed Bakura to fully complete his destiny board, sealing the Pharaoh's fate forever. But as terrifying as this strategy was in the anime, Dark Sanctuary hasn't seen any real competitive success. It can definitely act as a competent way to either stop an opponent from attacking, or punishing them if they do, but there are just more better cards out there if you want to stop an overzealous opponent. And even though Dark Sanctuary itself has never really seen any play, the way Bakura used the card is exactly what makes Floodgates in the real game so strong. Restricting an opponent from acting can be incredibly powerful, and sometimes even game winning by itself as the right Floodgate can shut down an opponent's entire strategy. And if your deck can play without caring about the Floodgate, you have a huge advantage over your opponent. And that's shown us in the anime because while Yugi was forced to no longer rely on his beat sticks, Bakura didn't have to worry about his own Dark Door, as they didn't need to attack in order to win. Now, usually, the best floodgates are ones that negate effects, or limit what types of monsters your opponent can summon. But floodgates that stop attacks, like Dark Sanctuary, have seen some minor success in some of these strategies like Runic, where stopping an opponent's attack can be pretty valuable to give you extra turns to draw even more cards off of Runic Fountain. Overall though, while it definitely is unfortunate that this icon of Battle City hasn't really seen any play in the TCG, it's pretty cool that, even back then, Bakura showed us the potential power that floodgates could have, and just how evil they truly were. And spelling the doom at number 4 is the final part of Bakura's occult strategy, Destiny Board. Destiny Board works the same exact way in both the anime and TCG, with the only minor difference being that in the manga, it requires Dark Necrofear to be in the graveyard. But no matter the version, Destiny Board allows you to place a spirit message on the field to your spell and trap card zone during each of your opponent's end phases. And if you manage to finish Destiny Board's word, you win the duel. In the TCG and English dub, the word you're trying to spell out is final. But in the OCG, manga, and Japanese anime, the word you're spelling out is death. This was the most frightening part of Bakura's occult strategy, as it gave him an alternative win condition that meant he didn't need to rely on attack and defense values to win his duel against Yugi, as instead all he had to do was wait, and watch his opponent struggle for a solution for Bakura's floodgate as he slowly spelled out Destiny Board's final word. It was nearly the perfect strategy, as Yugi had almost no way to deal with both Bakura's floodgates and his Destiny Board, which was only one letter away from being complete. But because he luckily managed to draw Slife of the Sky Dragon, Yugi reduced Bakura's life points to zero, as the Spirit of the Dark Sanctuary was incapable of possessing an Egyptian god. But if Yugi had drawn any other card, Bakura would have assured his victory over the Pharaoh with the final letter of the Destiny Board, winning both a Millennium Puzzle and Slifer from Yugi. But just like most of Bakura's occult strategy, Destiny Board is a lot less scary in the TCG. As a whole, most alternative win conditions are usually pretty bad, because you have to focus your entire deck around that specific condition, which can put you at a huge disadvantage when compared to more orthodox strategies that can flood the field with boss monsters, or leave you locked under their trap cards. And win conditions like Destiny Board can be especially rough, as you're forced to play a bunch of bricks that do nothing on their own in order to actually win the game. 
But even with these disadvantages, a couple of alternative ways of winning the game, like Destiny Board, have seen some solid competitive success. But the most famous example being Exodia, which can use a bunch of draw cards in order to get all five pieces in your hand as quickly as possible, which could even lead to winning the duel on the very first turn. Destiny Board doesn't have this luxury though, as the main way to bring spirit messages to the field is with its own effect, which means that it takes at least four complete turns to win the duel, and in that time your opponent has plenty of opportunities to either destroy your back row, or just win the game outright. But there's actually a win condition that plays a lot more like Destiny Board and relies on flooding in your opponent just like Bakura did in his duel against Yugi. Final Countdown. With Countdown, if you can stall for 20 turns after its activation, you automatically win the duel on the spot. This is a lot longer than the four turns required by Destiny Board, because Final Countdown doesn't require anything to be committed to the field. There's nothing your opponent can do to stop it once the card is resolved. This has made it into an excellent tool that has paired well with a ton of different floodgates throughout the years, but was most infamously used with Mystic Mine, a field spell that was capable of preventing an opponent from using monster effects and attacking so as long as they had more monsters than you. So if you controlled zero and instead relied on a turn of win condition to win the duel, your opponent could do nothing but struggle to find it out as the clock for final countdown slowly ticked down. And so, even though Destiny Board isn't really an amazing win condition, there are still alternative win conditions out there that can make you feel like just as much of a game master as Bakura, and let you watch your opponent squirm under your floodgates. And slithering the number 3 spot is Diebound Colonel, Bakura's main boss sponsor throughout the Dawn of the Duel arc, and the Ka of the Thief King Bakura. The anime and TCG version of this card are a little different from one another, but achieve the same goal. In the TCG, Diebound Colonel gains 600 attack whenever it declares an attack and has a quick effect to target a monster your opponent controls, reduces attack by the attack of Diebound, and then you have to banish your Diebound until the next standby phase. Meanwhile, the anime reduces the attack of an opponent by letting you equip Diebound to it, so that the monster is equipped to it loses the attack equal to Diebound's. Now, Bakura technically only ever used Diebound in a single duel, but its importance to the Thief King cannot be understated. Because Diebound wasn't just a regular monster, it was a manifestation of the rage born from the massacre of the Kol Elno village, the place that Bakura called home, just so Akhnadin could facilitate the creation of the Millennium Items. Essentially, Diebound represents Bakura's anger, and the promise he made to his people that he would have revenge on the Pharaoh, his family, and all who stood with him. And with Diebound by his side, Bakura intended to fulfill that promise. As Bakura's Ka, Diebound also had another power that allowed it to evolve and grow stronger based on what it destroys, essentially stealing the power of other monsters to use as its own. This led to one of Bakura's most genius moves of the series, because during his duel against Kaiba, after Diebound had managed to destroy Blue Eyes in battle thanks to the effect of Mirror Tablet, Bakura simply quit without finishing the duel. This was an incredibly strange move, especially from such a strong duelist like Bakura, but the reason why he had walked away is because he'd already gotten everything he needed from his duel. Because after entering the world of the Pharaoh's memories, Bakura's Diebound was suddenly a lot stronger. This allowed for Bakura to challenge the Pharaoh and the High Priestess head on, where the representation of his rage powered through every one of their attacks, until the pharaoh managed to summon an obelisk the tormentor. But even against an Egyptian god, Diebound held its own, and it's all thanks to Bakura's careful planning. Because when obelisk attacked, Bakura then countered by using the power of his Diebound that had absorbed the Kaiba's blue eyes white dragon, unleashing its burst stream of destruction and allowing for Bakura to escape. And from there on, throughout the final shadow game, Diebound grew stronger and stronger the more victories it obtained becoming an almost unstoppable force that even managed to absorb Slife with a Sky Dragon's Thunder Force attack. As a card though, Diebound Colonel leaves a lot to be desired. In the TCG, Diebound doesn't have any kind of effect to copy the abilities of an opponent's monster, and so its only benefit as a card was its stat manipulation. This would be an okay tool back in the early days of the game, but Diebound Colonel was released in 2017, long after the point where stat modifiers were genuinely viable. And what's worse is that Diebound is a level 5 monster, so it requires a tribute in order to bring it to the field, which means you're investing quite a lot of resources in order to use Diebound's effect, when there are better stat modifiers out there that can weaken monsters even more than Diebound can. Or you could instead just use a card that removes an opponent's monster from the field entirely without needing to worry about the battle phase. So for as powerful as Diebound was made out to be in the anime, the TCG version of the card doesn't live up to its anime status at all. And while you could use it to weaken monsters like Bakura did in his duel against Kaiba, it's never going to have the same potential as Bakura's Ka did. And heralding the darkness at number 2 is Dark Master Zork, the true avatar of Yami Bakura and his ultimate boss monster. As a card, Zork can be summoned with Contract with the Dark Master, and when it's on the field you can roll a die once per turn to apply a different effect based on the number that you roll. If you roll a 1 or 2, you get to activate Zork Inferno, wiping your opponent's field of monsters. 
If you roll a 3, 4, or 5, you get to activate Dark Catastrophe to instantly destroy one monster your opponent controls. But if you roll a 6, Zork's attack will backfire, causing all monsters you control, including Zork, to be destroyed. Despite being such a notable aspect of Bakura, he never actually used Zork in a game of Duel Monsters, but Zork still had two incredibly important appearances throughout the series. The first instance of Zork came up in the Monster World arc of the manga, and is actually the version of Zork that inspired this card. You see, this version of Zork was actually Yami Bakura's avatar in the Monster World RPG, Bakura's favorite game that he would play with the rest of his friends. But Yami Bakura had turned Monster World into a shadow game, and so whenever his friends lost, their souls were trapped within their miniatures. And so, when Yugi and his friends wanted to play this game with Bakura, Yami Bakura took this as an opportunity to strike. The avatar he used within the game was Dark Master Zork, a powerful being with 500 HP who almost managed to capture the soul of Yugi and his friends, all thanks to Bakura using the double hit technique and brainwash dice in order to cheat his way to victory. Thankfully, the spirit of the real Bakura lay dormant. And when he was awakened, not only did he cause Yami Bakura to fumble a roll, he also appeared on the side of Yugi as the White Wizard Bakura to shield the party from the super critical Zork Inferno attack. But that wasn't the only instance of Zork in the anime, because we later saw it during the Millennium World arc, where we learned the Spirit of the Millennium Ring was actually a composite soul made up of both Bandit King Bakura and Zork a being born from pure darkness that could annihilate all life. Within this arc, Bakura had set up the final shadow game between him and the Pharaoh. If the Pharaoh could prevent the Zork from being released, he won. But if Bakura managed to release Zork and defeat the Pharaoh, he would win and the entire world would be plunged into darkness. And Bakura came so close to that victory, assembling every Millennium item needed for his resurrection and allowing for Zork to sow chaos across Egypt. But after Yugi Moto managed to defeat Bakura in their final duel, he and his friends managed to reach the Pharaoh to reveal his name. Atem, which gave him the strength to fight against Zork and combine the Egyptian gods together to summon Halakti, the creator of light, banishing Zork and Yami Bakura back to the darkness. Unfortunately though, Zork doesn't live up to his world-ending status. Even in the early days of the game, where its effect was a strong removal, Zork being a ritual monster meant that it required a ton of investment in order to summon. And even if you did manage to bring it out, there was a chance that Zork could end up blowing up in your face, just like the Monster World RPG. And as a result, the only decks that really used Zork were janky chaos strategies that used Senju and Manju as good light monsters that could be used as graveyard fodder for cards like Chaos Sorcerer. What's worse for Zork is that it was even power crept incredibly early on, as if you wanted to invest the resources into a ritual monster, you could have a guaranteed filled wipe in Demise, or if you wanted to roll a dice, you could just play Snipe Hunter as a great removal option. And so, it's a genuine shame that the representation of Yami Bakura's soul and the main villain of the anime is almost unusable in the TCG, especially because it was apparently so powerful that it was capable of taking down Exodia and the three Egyptian gods by itself. But at the very least, if you do manage to bring it out to the field, you can still get lucky and roll a super critical to command the power of Zork. And taking control of the number one spot is Change of Heart, Ryo Bakura's favorite card. And it's a pretty powerful favorite card to have, as Change of Heart allows you to target a monster your opponent controls and take control of it until the end phase. Now, this card was used in his most iconic moment in the anime during Yami Bakura and Yami Yugi's first duel. Within this duel, Yami Bakura had sealed the soul of Yugi's friends within their new favorite cards. And if Yugi had lost the duel, he and his friends would have been sent to the Shadow Realm. And Yami Bakura held an overwhelming advantage, and was ready to deal the killing blow with Change of Heart to take control of the Dark Magician Yugi and force him to destroy his friends in battle one by one. But this plan backfired as Ryo Bakura's soul was contained within this card and so instead of taking over Yugi, Bakura took over Yami Bakura's Lady of Faith and begged for Yami Yugi to attack him to end the duel, willingly sacrificing himself for his friends. Thankfully though, with the power of the Millennium Puzzle, Yugi managed to switch the places of Bakura and Yami Bakura, allowing for Dark Magician Yugi to attack and send the spirit to the graveyard. But if it hadn't been for the strength of Bakura and his willingness to fight back against the evil spirit within him, his friends would have been lost to the Shadow Realm forever, showcasing the real Bakura's kindness towards those he cared for. But if Change of Heart had resolved, Yami Bakura would have definitely won the duel, because its effect is incredibly powerful, and is equally as powerful in the TCG. Taking control of an opponent's monster is game-winningly strong and is the best type of removal in the game, as you're not only removing an opponent's threat, but gain a monster so that you can use their effect or to use them for an extra deck seven, or just to even attack your opponent. And even amongst mind control cards, Change of Heart is especially absurd, because there's no restriction on what you can target, or what you can do with the monster you have, unlike Brain Control, which can only target monsters that can be normal summoned or set, and Mind Control, which prevents the monster from attacking or being tributed. And as a result, Change of Heart was deemed so powerful in the early days of the game that it was banned for over a decade. 
up until 2022 where it was finally released for the ban list at one copy. And ever since then, it's been seen near constant play in a ton of competitive strategies for being an insanely powerful and generic going second tool. Capable of either forcing interaction or letting you use your opponent's monsters against them, just like how Yami Bakura intended to turn Yugi against his friends. Now, it's unlikely that Change of Heart is ever going to turn against you like it did for Yami Bakura, but it's cool to see that the representation of Ryo Bakura's humanity and soul turned out to be incredibly strong in the actual game, even stronger than any other card on this list, showcasing that despite Yami Bakura's manipulation and cunning, Ryo Bakura's soul had a lot more strength than his evil counterpart would care to admit. Maximilian Pegasus, otherwise known as Pegasus J. Crawford, was the inventor of the modern dual monsters as the wielder of the Millennium Eye, an item that afforded him great power but influenced him to perform evil deeds by kidnapping Salamoto, which made him the main villain of the Duel's Kingdom art. But after his defeat, Pegasus was released from the Eye's control and became one of Yugi's strongest allies throughout the series, and even helped out Jade and Yugi during the events of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. So today, we're going to take a look at Pegasus' 10 most important cards, why he loved to use them, and whether or not the creator's cards were as strong in the TCG as they were in the anime. And parading into number 10, we have Flying Elephant, a card which showed off just how much Pegasus loved to humiliate his opponents while also being a cute reference to his love of American cartoons. And that's because this card is actually a direct reference to Dumbo, one of Disney's classic animated movies where the main star happens to be a flying elephant. This is technically reflected in its TCG art, where the card's flying abilities make it immune to destruction by card effects once per opponent's turn. But that's not all, because if you apply this effect during your opponent's turn, then you can activate another effect during the end phase, which makes it so that during your next turn, if you manage to inflict battle damage to your opponent by a direct attack using Flying Elephant, you automatically win the duel. Although in the anime, this card is just a regular normal monster, with flavor text that says it's immune to ground-based attacks because it floats in the sky. Now, Pegasus technically never used the card himself, but it did feature as part of his duel against Bandit Keith at the Intercontinental Championship. However, after the two duelists had both sat down, Pegasus used the powers of Millennium Eye to see every card in Keith's hand, which allowed him to figure out the perfect strategy he needed to win. But Pegasus wouldn't just be satisfied with the victory and wanted to completely humiliate his opponent. So instead of dueling, Pegasus called forth a boy from the audience, wrote him a small note, and had him duel in his place. And the note ended up being enough to defeat Keith because after he summoned Garnetia Elephantis, the boy countered with Flying Elephant which won him the duel while humiliating Keith in the process. This caused Bandit Keith to swear revenge on Pegasus, which led to his involvement in the Duelist Kingdom art, but also allowed for the creator of Duel Monsters to show the entire world that at his game, even a child was capable of beating a world champion. And that statement is still true to this day, because with the knowledge of the meta and the right deck, anyone can win a Yu-Gi-Oh event, but not with the effect of Flying Elephant. The TCG version of the card is actually a bit stronger than its anime counterpart due to the new effect, which adds a solid bit of protection and even alternative win condition that can lead you to winning the duel. The main problem with the card though is that it's really difficult to use and awkward to build around. It's unlikely that your opponent is ever going to go out of the way to pop your flying elephant, and even if they do, you have to go through extra steps of clearing away their field so your elephant can attack directly on the next turn. This isn't impossible, and there are even some janky FTK strategies centered around giving your opponent Yadro Invader to force them to pop flying elephant. But for the most part, it's really unlikely you'll be able to resolve this win condition, meaning that Flying Elephant will never terrorize the meta the same way it terrorized Bandit Keith. And so it makes sense that the only way Pegasus managed to get some use out of Flying Elephant is because his Millennium Eye let him cheat and predict Bandit Keith's moves down to the letter, as it's a card that most duels in the real game would never lose to. But it did at least allow for Pegasus to show that anyone had the capacity to win, even against the best duelists in the world. And snatching to number 9 is Comic Hand, which showcased how skilled Pegasus was at the game when he used it to defeat two duelists at the same time. And that's thanks to Comic Hand's absurdly strong effect. You can only activate it while you control Toon World, and it must be equipped to an opponent's monster. When it is, you get to take control of that monster, and it's also treated as a Toon. It also gains some Toon properties, which allows for you to attack your opponent directly if they don't control any Toon monsters. But if Toon World is ever not on the field, Comic Hand destroys itself and gives your opponent control of their monster again. Despite this downside, Pegasus used Comic Hand to great effect in his triangle duel against Dr. Vale and Crowler and Jean Louise bought apart, who were working together as Pegasus had promised that if either of them had managed to defeat him, they'd both be employed in industrial illusions. This promise had turned the duel from Battle Royale into a two versus one. But even with these odds, Pegasus absolutely dominated the pair by turning them against each other while the Toons crushed both Ancient Gear and Toy Soldiers. This left both Crowler and Bonaparte heartbroken and ready to surrender. But after some motivational words from Jade and Yugi, both of the teachers were suddenly re-energized and staged an impressive comeback, and even managed to take down Toon Dark Magician Girl. But despite this incredible effort, Pegasus still had one more trick up his sleeve, and ended up taking control of Ancient Gear Golem by equipping it with Comic Hand, stealing Crowler's monster and turning it into a Toon. 
And because Toon Ancient Gear Golem is still an Ancient Gear monster, Pegasus then used the effect Mimicat to steal Ancient Gear Explosive from Crowler's Graveyard to finish off both teachers. But if it hadn't been for Kamikan, both Crowler and Bonaparte might have gained a victory over one of Duel Monster's most prestigious duelists. Unfortunately though, Comic Hand doesn't carry the same strength in the TCG that it did in the anime, and a huge part of that is because of the archetype that it supports, Toons. Within Toon decks, Comic Hand is an amazing tool that gives a strategy a really strong going second play by letting you take control of your opponent's strong end board pieces. And the best part is, because the monster you take becomes a Toon, whatever you still is guaranteed to synergize with the rest of your deck. But because the Toon strategy as a whole isn't that strong, Comic Hand has never really had the chance to see competitive success. However, Comic Hand has a non-tune variant in Snatch Steel, a very similar equipped spell that allows you to take control of an opponent's monster, and that card is so strong that it's been banned for most of its lifespan. And that's because taking control of an opponent's monster is one of the strongest forms of removal in the game, as not only does it deal with an opponent's boss monster, but it gives you control of them, allowing you to use them for their effects, to OTK, or even just as free materials for an extra deck summit. So while it's definitely a shame that Comic Hand has never really seen much use, its effect is actually incredibly strong and Pegasus does a great job of showing off how strong still a monster can be. And hopping into number 8, we have Dark Rabbit, a regular normal monster with a similar appearance to Funny Bunny, Pegasus' favorite cartoon character. And that makes a lot of sense because according to Dark Rabbit's flavor text, nobody is capable of laying a hand on this Funny Bunny. This made Dark Rabbit a card that was close to Pegasus' heart and one that embodied his love of cartoons. But Pegasus also uses particular monster in a really strategic way in his duel against Seto Kaiba. Because of his power of the Millennium Eye, Pegasus knew that Kaiba was looking to use his Crush Card Virus in order to destroy Pegasus' deck, and with his knowledge, he planned a counterattack. By using negative energy, Pegasus doubled Saiga's attack and made it ineligible to be infected by Crush Card. But that's not all, because Pegasus also had a set Dark Rabbit on the field, and so negative energy doubled its attack stack, making it a really strong beat stick. And the card became even stronger after Pegasus activated Toon World, where Dark Rabbit gained two properties and could hide within the pages of Toon World to dodge Kaiba's attacks making it a really difficult to deal with monster. But the same can't be said for the TCG version of the card. And the main reason for that is because despite looking like Funny Bunny and being a parody of Bugs Bunny, Dark Rabbit isn't actually a Toon monster. It's just a regular normal monster. This means that the card doesn't benefit from any Toon support. And so there's no real reason why you'd play it in a dedicated Toon deck, as it just won't turn your strong spell or trap cards online. And that's really unfortunate, because Dark Rabbit is iconic in its own right, being one of the first monsters ever that was turned into a Toon. But at the very least, its legacy as a beat stick remains alive in the anime as one of Pegasus' favorite characters. And stealing number 7 spot is Mimikat, otherwise known as Doppelganger, another card that lets Pegasus use his opponent's cards against them. Mimikat can only be used while you control Toon World and a Toon Monster, and allows you to target card in your opponent's graveyard, and lets you either special summon to your field if it's a monster, or set it to your field if it's a spell or trap card. But most people are probably familiar with the DM version of the card, which instead of stealing an opponent's card, transforms it, and either special summons itself as a monster, or copies the effects of the monster's spell or trap card. This made Mimikat an excellent part of Pegasus' tune strategy that he used throughout the series as he could use it to create copies of his opponent's strongest monsters so that he could later turn them into tunes, or he could just steal his opponent's powerful spell and traps, which is precisely how Pegasus managed to defeat Sendo Kaiba. You see, in this duel, Pegasus was absolutely crushing Kaiba, who had challenged Pegasus for the right to release Mogubo Soul from the card Pegasus had trapped it within. This had already put Kaiba under a ton of pressure, and midway through the duel, he began to crack. Pegasus, however, was simply having fun, and used his duel as an opportunity to mock Kaiba and demolish his pride by playing around every one of his threats, talking about his love of cartoons and even stealing his blue-eyes white dragon to turn it into a tune. This angered Kaiba, especially when Pegasus threatened to make a second blue-eyes tune dragon, causing the CEO of Kaiba Corp to make a rash decision and attack Pegasus' dragon viper. Which is exactly what Pegasus wanted, because his set card was Mimikat, which allowed him to copy Kaiba's Crush Card virus, and infect his Dragon Piper with it. Which meant that when Sword Saga destroyed it, Crush Card activated, destroying every single strong card in Kaiba's deck, and leaving him with nothing other than a single copy of Monster Reborn, and the crushing reality of his defeat. But if Pegasus were playing the TCG, he might have been a little less cocky in this particular duel, because Mimikat is a lot less usable compared to its anime counterpart. Its effect is actually really strong as several cards across the years have seen competitive success by stealing cards from your opponent's graveyard, so that you can use them against your opponent. But, like Kamikan, while Mimikat has an impressive effect, it's limited by the Toon archetype, because instead of just being a generically impressive card, it instead requires Toon World and a Toon Monster in the field in order to use. This isn't an impossible requirement for Toon strategies, and they can easily take advantage of Mimikat's strong effect. But because the archetype isn't really that competitively viable, Mimikat hasn't really had the chance to see any real success in the TCG. 
which is definitely a little sad as the way Pegasus used the card was often incredibly inventive and showed off his creativity as a duelist and was the main reason that he managed to defeat Seto Kaiba. But at the very least, there are similar cards which can let you make fun of your opponent by showing them that you could use their deck better than they can. And still in number 6 spot is Dragon Capture Jar, one of the first cards introduced to the anime that had the capability of countering the Blue Eyes White Dragon. But the way this card does this differs depending on the TCG or anime version. The TCG Dragon Capture Jar just forces all Dragon type monsters of the field to defense position and prevents them from changing their battle position, meaning that something like Blue Eyes White Dragon won't be able to use its battle prowess against you. But in the anime, Dragon Capture Jar does something entirely different, and instead summons itself as a monster that literally captures all dragons on the field and steals them within the jar, preventing them from being used and absorbing their defense points. This made Dragon Capture Jar an incredibly strong tool in the early days of the anime, where dragon monsters were at their most fierce. But Pegasus didn't use Dragon Capture Jar as a strong removal option, as he also paired it with Dragon Piper, a card that in the anime could summon out the dragon that was sealed within Dragon Capture Jar, potentially allowing him to use his opponent's monsters against them. This deadly combo was used a couple of times by Pegasus, such as his very first duel against Yugi, where he used Capture Jar and Piper to steal Yugi's Komori Dragon to gain a major advantage. As a result, when Pegasus dueled Kaiba, Yugi did his best to warn Seto about Dragon Capture Jar to give him every advantage he could to save Mokuba's soul. Unfortunately though, this put Kaiba on edge, as he now had to predict when Pegasus had drawn Dragon Capture Jar, and whether or not it was safe to summon out Blue-Eyes White Dragon, giving Pegasus a major advantage. This came to a head when Pegasus finally ended up drawing Dragon Capture Jar, sealing Blue Eyes inside of it, and then later summoning Dragon Piper so that he could summon out Kaiba's Blue Eyes White Dragon so he could turn it into a second Blue Eyes Toon Dragon. However, the TCG version of this card isn't something to be feared, and a big reason for that is because of Dragon Capture Jar's new effect. If it had worked like it did in the anime and removed Dragon Monsters from the field, it actually would have been a really impressive trap card, especially for its time period. But its new effect is relatively weak because while it can prevent dragons from attacking, there are just better cards that exist that can either stop attacks or just remove your opponent's monsters from the field entirely. What's even worse is that Dragon Piper, the card that made Dragon Capture Jar an insane payoff in the anime, was also nerfed in the TCG. As instead of working alongside Dragon Capture Jar, Dragon Piper now just had a flip effect which destroyed all Dragon Capture Jars in the field and turned all dragon monsters to attack position. But while the TCG version of these cards are unimpressive, anime Dragon Capture Jar showed off how impressive Pegasus was as a tactician. It makes center stage as an incredibly strong card during one of the most important duels of the Duelist Kingdom arc, and in a strange way, managed to show that even the strongest of monsters have their counters. And at number 5, we have Toon Summon Skull, one of Pegasus' most iconic Toon monsters that he uses the main Toon based threat in his duel against Yugi. Now, the TCG version of this card was actually based on the card that appeared in the Pyramid of Light movie. This version of the card can't be summoned through regular means and requires you to tribute a monster while you control Toon World. And while it's on the field, it has the same upside as most Toon monsters, letting it attack directly if your opponent doesn't control a Toon. But it also comes with the same downside shared by most Toons, which gives the card summoning sickness, and if Toon World is ever destroyed, Toon Summon Skull also destroys itself. Toon Summon Skull has a couple of unique things about it though. Because it's still a Summon Skull, it has a condition which makes it so it's always treated as an Arc Fiend card. But it also comes with its own drawback, which it shares with the Blue Eyes Toon Dragon, that makes us leave to pay 500 life points in order to declare an attack. However, the original anime version of Toon Summon Skull was a lot simpler, because it was Summon Skull that was being affected by Toon World, which prevented it from being destroyed by battle, and even allowed it to hide within the pages to prevent it from being selected as an attack target. And that was enough for Toon Summon Skull to be a genuine threat in the anime, as its high attack strength made it an amazing offensive option. And because of its Toon properties, there was no way for Yugi to deal with it head on. But Toon Summon Skull was more than just a regular beat stick. He was an example of Pegasus making fun of his opponent, and was especially poignant because Summon Skull was the monster that almost defeated Pegasus in the duel against Yugi. And so, the once terrifying demon was transformed into a silly cartoon character, who squashed, stretched, and taunted his opponents by pulling faces. But, despite his goofy nature, Toon Summon Skull, alongside the power of Pegasus' Millennium Eye, pushed Yugi and Yama Yugi to their limits and forced the King of Games to rely on an unconventional strategy. You see, because of the power of the Millennium Eye, Pegasus was always one step ahead of Yugi, preventing him from being taken off guard by spell and trap cards. Which forced Yugi to employ the Mind Shuffle technique and use the Millennium Puzzle to constantly switch between Yugi and Yami Yugi. This prevented Pegasus from using Mind Scan to figure out Yami's cards, as Yami himself wasn't even aware of Yugi's cards and simply trusted his other soul. This technique ended up being enough to catch Pegasus off guard. It allowed for Yugi to surprise Pegasus by activating Living Arrow, which ended up destroying Toon World, and Mirror Force to destroy Pegasus' remaining monsters. But if it hadn't been for Yami and Yugi's quick thinking, Toon Summon Skull would have been enough to leave the King of Games defeated. However, Toon Summon Skull is a lot less of a threat in the real life game. In general, Toon Focus strategies are rarely ever competitively viable. But even within the Toon strategy, Toon Summon Skull just isn't the boss monster the anime made it out to be, and is rarely ever played even in its own deck. A 2500 attack beatstick can potentially win you games, especially with the ability to attack directly. 
but is a trait shared by most Toon Monsters. And in the modern era, there are a plethora of better tunes that you can play. The likes of Toon Blackbuster Soldier or Toon Barrow Dragon have higher attack points and even removal effects to make ODK easier. Toon Summon Skull just doesn't have the same versatility, and since it's comparatively harder to use, and doesn't have a beneficial level, there's no real reason for modern Toon decks to use it. But at the very least, you can use Summon Skull in the actual game the same exact way that Pegasus use it in the anime, taking advantage of its Toon properties while also beating down your opponent. It's just that this particular tactic is a lot stronger in the anime than in the actual TCG. Misleading us to number 4 is Illusionist Faceless Mage, one of the first ever illusion monsters introduced to the game, but only technically. You see, in the TCG, Illusion was never established as a real card type at the time, and so Faceless Mage just became a spellcaster monster with the flavor text which said that it can manipulate enemies with the power of illusions. But the manga version of this card was established as an illusion monster, which made it strong against black magic users and weak against demon magic. This made it a great card when Pegasus faced off against Yugi's Dark Magician in their first duel against one another, where Faceless Magician could have potentially destroyed Yugi's ace due to its illusion magic. But Pegasus wanted to do more than just destroy Yugi's monster, and activated Eye of Illusion to strengthen Faceless Mage even more, and immediately attack Dark Magician. This seemed like a strange move at first, because this battle actually ended up in a draw, where neither player took damage and no monster was destroyed. And so, Yugi believed that the coast was clear and summoned Celtic Guardian to attack the Faceless Mage. But Pegasus was a master manipulator, and Yugi had fallen right into his trap of Eye of Illusion, which allowed for Pegasus to take control of Yugi's ace monster and redirect Celtic Guardian's attack to it, destroying Yugi's new monster and leaving his life points devastated. This might not have been an issue for the King of Games, as after Pegasus' past turn, he immediately drew Summon Skull, a demon monster with the strength to bypass illusion magic, which might have allowed for Yugi to win his first encounter against Pegasus and immediately save his grandpa's soul, if it hadn't been for the timer that Pegasus had put in place which counted down to zero a split second before Summon Skull could complete his attack, leaving Solomoto's soul trapped and forcing Yugi to embark on his journey to duel his kingdom. But for being such an important card in the anime, Illusionist Faceless Mage has never seen any real competitive success. It's never had a deck to call home, and a huge part of that is because it's a level 5 normal monster. This means that Faceless Mage requires a tribute to bring to the field, and with such a low attack stat, it's never been worth its summon, especially since it doesn't have any kind of beneficial effects. However, the illusionist type that Faceless Mage represents was actually introduced to the modern game very recently, and although it isn't centered around countering dark magic, it's said to be a really strong engine thanks to its new fusion monsters, fusion spell, and illusion support that allow the deck to be a pretty competent engine in fusion-focused strategies. And you'll even be able to enact Faceless Mage's iconic anime moment as the Eye of Illusion that Pegasus uses is actually coming to the TCG, and can be activated if you control either an Illusion or Spell as a type monster to apply one of three effects. You either prevent both monsters from being destroyed by battle, take control of an opponent's monster until the end phase, or redirect an attack to another one of your opponent's monsters. So while Faceless Mage has never seen any real use in the TCG, it's really cool that the way Pegasus used in the manga was part of the inspiration for the newest and most interesting type introduced to Yu-Gi-Oh, which could potentially lead to this iconic monster one day getting a proper retrain. And bursting into number 3 is the Blue-Eyes Toon Dragon, another one of Pegasus' most iconic Toon Monsters. The TCG Blue-Eyes Toon Dragon comes with a lot of traits that define early Toon Monsters, such as Summoning Sickness, the ability to attack directly if your opponent controls no Toon Monsters, and even the downside that forces Blue Eyes to blow itself up if Toon World is destroyed. But Blue Eyes Toon Dragon also has a lot of traits that make it really similar to Toon Summon Skull. They both require you to pay 500 life points in order to declare an attack with them, and they have the same summon condition which requires you to tribute monsters while you control Toon World, but Blue Eyes Toon Dragon requires two tributes instead of one. Likewise, the early anime version of Toon World is very similar to Summon Skull, as they're both just regular normal monsters that have been affected by Toon World. Which means the only effects that Toon Blue Eyes has is its regular Toon properties, as well as the ability to hide within the pages of Toon World. But the strongest aspect of Toon Blue Eyes was its ability to absolutely humiliate Seto Kaiba. In their first duel against one another, Pegasus was destroying Kaiba, and took the time to taunt, annoy, and laugh at his opponent as Kaiba desperately struggled to save his brother Mokuba. But the biggest insult of this entire duel was when Pegasus stole Kaiba's Blue Eyes with the effect of Prophecy and transformed into Blue Eyes Toon Dragon. This enraged and disgusted Kaiba as Blue Eyes respected his pride and power as a duelist, and so seeing it reduces such a pathetic form sickened him, and caused him to grow even more annoyed that Pegasus was treating this duel like a joke. And this is exactly what Pegasus had wanted, as not only was Toon Blue Eyes an excellent beat stick that even Kaiba struggled to deal with, the rage that it brought about forced Kaiba into making rash decisions to prevent Pegasus from gaining a second copy to his field, which ultimately ended up in his own defeat after he fell to his own crush card virus. Although despite how iconic Blue Eyes Toon Dragon ended up being, it rarely ever sees play in Toon decks. Since like Summon Skull, Blue Eyes Toon Dragon is outclassed as a beat stick since there are better, stronger boss monsters you can play that come with beneficial effects. 
However, Blue Eyes Toon Dragon actually manages to see a decent amount of competitive success in Magical Explosion FTK strategies. You see, Magical Explosion is a trap card that deals 200 damage to your opponent for each spell card in your graveyard, meaning you can do a ton of damage to your opponent with enough spell cards in your graveyard, easily FTK an opponent when paired with Life Equalizer. And so these strategies would play a ton of different consistent cards to either draw or thin their deck to ensure they'd always see both Magical Explosion and Life Equalizer on their first turn of the duel, while also putting a ton of spells in the grave. And one such card was Toon Table of Contents, which allowed you to add any Toon card from your deck to your hand, including another copy of itself. So these decks would use Toon Table of Contents to add another copy of itself to your hand, and because it doesn't have a hard once per turn, you can use the Toon Table to add a third Toon Table to your hand and thin your deck even more. But because you can only play three copies of the card, you won't be able to activate the third copy of Toon Table unless you have another Toon in your deck. And the best choice for these strategies was Blue Eyes Toon Dragon, because Blue Eyes Toon Dragon just so happened to be a level 8 monster, which meant that it was a great target for trade-in to put another spell in the graveyard and draw even more cards. So while Blue Eyes Toon Dragon isn't the powerhouse the anime made it out to be, it's cool that it manages to see some amount of success thanks to its advantageous level. And in a way, it's funny that it's still Mox Kaiba, as his ultimate boss monster has been reduced to a simple discard fodder. And opening the page at number 2 is Toon World, Pegasus's favorite card. However, Toon World in the TCG and Toon World in the anime are pretty much two different cards. In the TCG, Toon World is a continuous spell that pays 1,000 life points in order to activate and has no effect, making it a pretty big disappointment compared to its anime version, which turned any monster you controlled into a Toon monster, protecting them from being destroyed by battle, and allowing them to hide within the pages of Toon World. This made the card an absolute powerhouse in the hands of Pegasus, because as soon as he got Toon World on the field, he suddenly had a major advantage that made every one of his monsters almost impossible to deal with, turning even the weakest of normal monsters into strong threats. But Pegasus played Toon World for more than just its tactical strength. He played it because he loved cartoons. You see, unlike most of the other characters in the series, Pegasus grew up in America and was raised on cartoons and comic books, such as Funny Bunny, a parody of Bugs Buddy, who constantly evaded his rival Rough Rough McDog. And Toon World allowed for every one of Pegasus' monsters to keep the spirit of these cartoons alive, squashing, stretching, and always avoiding attacks, just like the cartoon characters he loved. Which is why it's so unfortunate that the TCG version of this card just doesn't really do anything. For a while, Toon strategies were forced to run Toon World in some capacity, since most of the cards relied on it being face up on the field in some way in order to use them, which pretty much made Toon World mandatory. Up until the release of Toon Kingdom, which is always treated as Toon World while face up on the field. This gave Toon decks a Toon World that was finally worth running, as it gave Toon monsters extra protection, preventing your opponent from targeting them with card effects while also allowing you to banish cards on top of your deck to prevent the Toon monster from being destroyed. This turns Toon monsters into threats that actually mirror the anime counterparts, as now these monsters can never be caught by targeted card effects, nor can they be destroyed by regular means, which lets them live up to the title of invincible cartoons. But as a result of how good Toon Kingdom is, Toon decks no longer actually play Toon World, and while it's a shame that such an iconic card doesn't even see use within its own archetype, it's for the best. As Toon Kingdom better represents the power that Toon World had in the anime, and can actually protect your Toon monsters and turn them into anime level threats. And sacrificing to the number one spot is Relinquished, the representation of Pegasus' darker side after he allowed the Millennium Eye to influence him. Relinquish is a ritual monster, so you need to use Black Illusion Ritual in order to summon it. But if you manage to bring it to the field, you get access to its powerful effect, which allows you to target a monster your opponent controls and absorb it, turn it into an equip card for Relinquished. And while it has a monster equipped to it, Relinquish gains the attack and defense of that monster, and if it would be destroyed by battle, you destroy the monster that's equipped to you instead. But that's not all because any battle damage that would be inflicted to you while Relinquish has a monster equipped is instead inflicted to your opponent. This made the card an insurmountable boss monster in Pegasus and Yugi's duel of Duelist Kingdom. In this duel, Yugi had managed to overcome Pegasus' mind scan with the Mind Shovel technique, allowing them to destroy Toon World and turn the duel around in their favor. However, this destruction caused Pegasus to finally take the duel seriously, as he used the power of the Money Mind to turn the duel into a shadow game, showing off his darker side once more. And the biggest indicator of this was that Pegasus was no longer using the fun-loving tunes he was known for, and instead relied on a weird and grotesque illusion monster to summon out Relinquish. Relinquish seemed almost impossible for Yama Yugi to defeat, as not only was it capable of dealing with every one of his monsters, he couldn't even destroy it by battle, as any attack he declared would end up destroying his own absorbed monster and dealing damage to himself. What's even worse is that because Pegasus had started a shadow game, an immense amount of pressure was being exerted into the regular Yugi, which meant that the Mind Shovel technique was taking a huge toll on his physical health, and even caused him to faint within the middle of the duel, leaving one last card to Yami. Thankfully, because of Yugi's strong friendship to Joey, Tei, and Tristan, Pegasus' Mind Scan powers were blocked, which allowed for Yami to take him off guard, saving Dark Magician with Mystic Mox, and then summon out a Magician of Black Chaos with the Black Magic Ritual that Yugi had left for Yami. 
This was Yami's trump card, but Pegasus still had one more trick up his sleeve, and he fused together Relinquish and Thousand Eyes Idol to form Thousand Eyes Restrict, an even stronger version of Relinquish whose eyes prevent an opponent from attacking, and who managed to absorb Magician of Black Chaos with ease, which would have allowed for Pegasus to defeat the King of Games. If it hadn't been for Yami's genius planning, as Thousand Eyes Restrict ended up absorbing Yugi's set Karibo, which allowed for him to activate Multiply, spawning infinite Karibos that smothered Restrict's Thousand Eyes. And because in the anime, Karibo exploded on contact, Restrict was left weakened and unable to absorb Magician of Black Chaos, which allowed for Yami to strike the final blow to save his grandpa's soul. But if it hadn't been for Yugi's favorite furball, Relinquish and the Thousand Eyes would have easily carried Pegasus to victory. But for as iconic and powerful as the anime version of Relinquish was, the card itself has never been a huge threat in the TCG. Relinquish's removal effect is actually pretty strong, and so managed to see some minor success in the early days of the game. But the reason why it rarely ever saw a large amount of competitive play was because it was a ritual monster. This means that to summon Relinquish, you need to have it in your hand alongside Black Illusion Ritual, as well as a monster to act as tribute fodder, meaning that you have to invest quite a few cards in order to bring it out. But while Relinquish itself didn't see too much competitive success, its evolved forms have actually seen a ton of play across the game's history. Thousand Eyes Restrict was format warping in GOAT format, as you could easily cheat it out with the effect of Metamorphosis by tributing a scapegoat token, and it acted as a great removal option to deal with your opponent's threats, causing Thousand Eyes to eventually find its way to the Forbidden Limited list. Then the retrain of Thousand Eyes Millennium Eyes Restrict saw competitive success due to its ability to be cheated out with Instant Fusion, which allowed for it to be used as a generic removal option that could also help a deck play around hand traps in a similar fashion to Called by the Grave. And last but not least, Relinquish Anima sees play in just about any deck that runs level 1 monsters as yet another great removal option that's so infamous that it's changed the way people play the game to avoid accidentally playing into an Anima's Link Zone. Which is actually really cool that Pegasus's ace boss monster has genuinely had a huge lasting impact on the history of the game, even if its original form hasn't seen too much success in it itself. And it's a cool reminder that even the most fun-loving duelists can have a cool and mysterious side to them. Merrick Ishtar held hatred in his heart for the Pharaoh, and for good reason, as he and his family lived a life of suffering in its service. Merrick, however, refused his unfair fate and set off on a crusade to defeat Yamayugi so that he could claim the title of Pharaoh and free himself and his family from their duty as tomb keepers. But because of all the pain, hurt, and hatred Merrick had endured throughout his childhood, he had also developed a second personality known as Yami Merrick, who was even more twisted than the regular Merrick and was only held back by the love that he felt for his family. So today, we're going to be looking at Merrick and Yami Merrick's 10 most important cards, how he used them to torture his opponents, and whether or not they'd be capable of defeating the Pharaoh in the actual TCG. Taking up the mantle number 10, we have Zera the Mant, a ritual monster that, in the anime, was an extremely rare card. In the anime, rarity often coincided with the card's strength, and Zera the Mant, despite not having an effect, had an impressive 2800 attack. But because it's a ritual monster, you need to use its associated ritual spell, Zera Ritual, to summon it by tributing monsters from your hand or field whose levels equal to or more than 8. Regardless, its stats made Zera the perfect boss monster during Yugi's duel with Bandit Keith, where Keith had actually stolen Yugi's Millennium Puzzle and forced him to play for it and couldn't rely on Yami Yugi's help. But all throughout this game, something was off, as Bandit Keith wasn't acting like his usual self. And while he played his regular machine-focused strategy, he also played some new rare cards that seemed quite strange in his deck. The reason for this is because Yugi wasn't actually dueling Bandit Keith. He was dueling Merrick, who had been using Keith as a puppet the entire time with the power of his Millennium Rod. Which is why Keith's deck was so different, as Merrick was a leader of the Rare Hunters an organization centered around winning, stealing, and counterfeiting rare cards so that Merrick could eventually track down all three Egyptian god cards to eventually defeat the Pharaoh. And because he had such a surplus of rare cards, Merrick would often gift his servants and puppets with powerful cards so they could use them against his enemies. In the case of Bandit Keith, Merrick had gifted him Zera the Mand, whose monstrous stats made it extremely difficult for Yugi to deal with, especially when paired with Keith's cheating tactics. In fact, it was so powerful that Zera almost won Merrick the duel. As while Yugi eventually destroyed it, Zera's Rampage took down Summit Skull and Dark Magician, both of Yugi's ace monsters. Thankfully though, Yami Bakur interfered with the power of the Millennium Ring, which caused Keith to struggle against Merrick's control, leading to one of the most terrifying moments of the series, where Keith ended up smashing the puzzle into pieces, and accidentally set fire to the warehouse, forcing Yugi to attempt to build the puzzle from scratch as the flames grew around him. But if it hadn't been for Yami Bakura, the uncommon power of Zera could have potentially led to Merrick's victory. However, in the TCG, Zera the Mant is a lot less powerful than its anime counterpart. Zera's stats are fairly impressive, but the fact it doesn't have an effect makes it ineffective at being anything but a decent beat stick. 
And what's worse is that Zera is a ritual monster, which requires a copy of itself, its ritual spell, and 8 stars worth of tributes to bring out to the field, which is an insane amount of investment for a vanilla beat stick when there are stronger cards out there that are easier to use. But at the very least, the anime version of Zera showcased an interesting aspect of the game that's still important today card prices. Yu-Gi-Oh! can be an expensive game, especially when a ton of decks are reliant on pricey cards to ensure their victory, and can often feel demoralizing when your opponent has an edge because they spent more money. However, Yu-Gi defeating Zera proves one thing. Every card, even a rare one, has a weakness. In the case of Zera, it was defeated by monster removal. But if you happen to face a similar rare card, common staples can sometimes be enough to defeat even the most expensive decks out there. So while it's definitely a shame that Zera isn't as much of a threat in the TCG, it's where status not only helped to establish Merrick as the leader of the Rare Hunters, but its defeat also helped to show that a card's worth isn't tied to its price. And if nothing else, that's a really cool part of the modern game, as if you have the right knowledge of the meta, you can deck build to defeat pricey strategies with cheap cards. Tributing over the ninth spot, we have Lava Golem, a card that let Yami Merrick torture his opponents by literally burning them while they're trapped in the golem's cage. The way Lava Golem enables this strategy is actually really interesting. Lava Golem can't be normal summoner set, and instead requires two tributes in order to special summon. But instead of tributing your own monsters to special summon to your side of the field, you instead tribute two of your opponent's monsters to summon it to their field. However, if you use the effect, you can't normal summon or set for the entire turn. And then, during each of their standby phases, Lava Golem burns its controller for 1,000 life points, which is actually a little bit stronger than the enemy, which only burns for 700 life points during that player's end phase. Still, that version of Lava Golem proved how powerful it could be in Merrick's shadow game against Joey Wheeler. For the most part, Merrick dominated the third-rate duelist. And while Joey proved that he had the spirit to fight in a shadow game, Merrick had complete control of the duel, and was constricting Joey's options with the likes of Helpamir. However, despite the suffering that Joey endured, he managed to stage an impressive comeback using Question. This turned Helpamir's effect against Merrick, as now he didn't know what car was in the bottom of Joey's graveyard. That monster turned out to be Jinzo, who was summoned to the field and eviscerated all of Merrick's traps, giving him another chance to strike back and freeing his rocket warrior from the Nightmare Wheel. But Merrick wasn't shaken, and on the next turn, attributed over both Jinzo and Baby Dragon to summon out Lava Golem to Joey's field, trapping Joey within Lava Golem's cage and burning through his life points. Wheeler tried to make the best out of a bad situation and use Lava Golem as a powerful beat stick, but Merrick was prepared and easily defended his life points while keeping Joey encased within his cage. And funnily enough, the way Golem was used in the anime is exactly how it's used in the TCG. It might seem like a bad idea to give your opponent a 3000 attack monster, as they could just use the card against you as a strong beat stick. But most of the time, you're not just tributing over low attack monsters. You're using Lava Golem to tribute your opponent's powerful boss monsters and interactions before they have a chance to use them against you. So if your opponent ends on an impossible to break board, you can tribute over the monsters so you don't have to deal with them. Just like how Merrick tributed over Jinzo so you can get access to the rest of his trap cards. What's even better is that other than only ending on a single monster, there's very little counterplay to Lava Golem, as its ability to summon itself isn't an activated effect. It's a summoning condition, so your opponent doesn't get a chance to interact with it before their monsters leave the field. And so it's really cool to see the way Merrick used Lava Golem is precisely what makes it so strong in the TCG. Tributing two monsters for virtually no cost is really strong. Slash to the number 8 spot is Makura the Destructor, one of the many staple fiend monsters that made up Yami Merrick's strategy during the Battle City Finals. And out of every one of those fiends, Makura has the most interesting effect because it allows you to activate trap cards from your hand during the turn it's sent to the graveyard. In the modern TCG though, this effect has actually been eroded, so you can only activate a single trap card from your hand that turned Makura sent there from the monster zone to the graveyard. Now, Makura was just a small part of Merrick's fiend army, but it made itself known during his and my Valentine's shadow game. This shadow game's rules differ depending on if you're watching the anime or manga. In the anime, Mai's monsters each represent the memories she shared with one of her friends. And if that monster was destroyed, Mai would lose her ability to remember or even see that person. But the manga, the shadow game's rules meant that you would feel the same suffering that your monsters would endure. So when Mai's Amazon ended up decapitating Makura, Merrick's head appeared to fall off, with Mai looking on in disgust while Merrick gleefully picked out the trap card he'd used from his hand. In both versions though, the card Merrick ended up choosing is Rope of Life, which revives Makira with 800 more attack, allowing for Merrick to stage a counterattack and destroy her Amazon. The manga painted a brutal picture of this attack, as three slashes appeared across Merrick's body. This injury was an illusion, but the pain that Mai felt was very real. However, the anime was arguably even more cruel to Mai, as this attack caused her to lose memories of Joey Wheeler, and would have left her fighting spirit broken if it wasn't for Yugi's intervention. And the scary thing about Makira in the TCG is that if your opponent ever had the chance to use its old effect, you would have an equally painful experience. 
There are a lot of powerful trap cards in Yu-Gi-Oh with absurdly strong effects that are balanced by the fact that they're inherently slow and need to be set for a turn before you can activate them. But if you could send the unerotted Makira to the graveyard by any means, you could bypass that restriction and use these busted trap cards on your first turn. Even back in the early days of the game, this effect was crazy and enabled a ton of different combos, the likes of Chick the Yellow TK with Call the Haunted, to even Exchange of the Spirit FTK, which used the pre-erotic Exchange of the Spirit to mill your opponent's entire deck on turn 1 with the effect of Makira, which meant that they could no longer draw on the following turn and lost a deck out. And as a result, Makira soon found its way onto the Forbidden Limited list, where it remained for over a decade until its eventual errata. This errata made Makira much more awkward to use, as it needed to be sent from the Monster Zone to the Graveyard, so you had to commit it to the field in some way. But even if you got access to its effects, you'd only be able to activate a single trap card from the hand. And both of these factors combined pretty much killed most of Makira's competitive viability. But despite how weak its current errata made it, Makira is a legendary card in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, and one that reflects Merrick's genius as a tormentor even in the TCG, where its past effect could put a swift end to most opponents. Reform into number 7 is Egyptian God Slime, who in the anime was actually just Metal Reflect Slime mimicking the power of Obelisk the Tormentor. But that was only the first stage of the Egyptian God Slime, as Merrick fused this version with the card Revival Jam so that it would gain immortal properties and be capable of reforming to make an invincible wall. And the TCG version did a pretty good job of translating this monster to the actual game, as you can either summon it by fusing an Aqua Monster and a level 10 Water Monster together, or by tributing a level 10 Aqua Monster with zero attack. While it's on the field, it can be treated as three tributes for a tribute summon, cannot be destroyed by battle, and if your opponent tries to target a monster with an attack or an effect, they must target Egyptian God Slime, making it so it protects all of your monsters from both battle and effects. These immortal properties and its ability to protect cards are what made God Slime so valuable to Merrick in his final shadow game against Yami Yugi, where each life point loss would cause the gradual decay of the host's body. In this duel, Yugi had already just managed to survive Ra's onslaught with the help of Kaiba's Feet Sanctuary, and although Slifer was defeated, Yugi brought out his second Egyptian God card, Obelisk the Tormentor, and attacked in Merrick's life points. But Merrick was a cunning duelist and Yugi had fallen right into his trap, as the damage he took let him activate Metal Reflect Slime to copy three-fourths of Obelix's power, and then fused it with Metal Reflect Slime to make an almost indestructible monster. And what was even worse for Yugi was the Egyptian God Slime could work alongside Jam Defender. And so, when he tried to attack Merrick's Boganion to prevent it from gradually wood away Yugi's body, God Slime would infiltrate the attack, ensuring the immortality of Merrick's monsters and putting Yami Yugi under immense pressure as he tried to save his other self. But Egyptian God Slime in the actual game isn't the defensive wall the anime made him out to be. Its effects are pretty solid, especially since it protects your other monsters from card effects without the need of cards like Jam Defender, and could theoretically allow for some strategies to play around certain hand traps or targeted removal. But in practice, very few strategies are willing to jump through the hoops of summoning a level 10 Aqua Monster with zero attack, and so the only strategies that really use the card are ones focused around summoning Egyptian Gods, as these strategies can take advantage of Guardian Slime as a stall tool and then use it to summon Egyptian God Slime, which can provide three tributes necessary for an Egyptian God. So at the very least, it's cool that God Slime is still a useful defensive tool for the Egyptian God cards, and can let you mimic their power while helping you summon out their true boss monsters, even if this particular strategy is never going to be competitively viable. Contained in number 6 is Nightmare Steel Cage, one of Merrick's strongest stall tools that gave him enough turns to finalize his Slifer-focused strategy. Now, even though Steel Cage is a normal spell, it remains face up on the field for two of your opponent's turns, in a similar way to Swords of Revealing Light. And while it's on the field, no monsters on either player's field can declare an attack. This made Steel Cage an incredibly strong tool in Yugi's duel against Strings, who was yet another one of Merrick's mind puppets who had been entrusted with the power of Slifer the Sky Dragon to defeat the Pharaoh. But in order to bring out Slifer, Merrick had focused his early game strategy on stalling out Yugi so he could bring out enough tributes to the field to summon out the Egyptian God card. He did this in a couple of ways, such as with Revival Jam and Jam Defender to protect his tokens when summoned out with a Jam Breeding Machine. But the icing on the cake was Nightmare Steel Cage, which guaranteed that he would have enough turns to summon out Slifer. But Steel Cage was more than just a guarantee. As in Merrick's eyes, the cage that Yugi was now trapped under was the same cage he had been forced into by his destiny as a Tomb Keeper, never to have a hope of freedom. This allowed him to momentarily make the King of Games suffer the same hopelessness that Merrick and his siblings had to suffer through for their entire lives. Because after its activation, all Yugi could do was watch Merrick summon out the unstoppable Egyptian god monster, Slifer the Sky Dragon. But for as cathartic as this moment was for Merrick, Nightmare Steel Cage never had the same defining moment in the actual game. Floodgates that stop monsters from attacking have been quite useful across the game's history, and while they've mostly fallen out of favor in the current format, a few modern control strategies can still play these cards in a similar way to how Merrick used Steel Cage, 
since these kinds of cards can guarantee your survival while setting up your plays. But Steel Cage specifically has never seen any use. And the reason for that is because while its attack prevention can be helpful, there are a ton of similar cards that do what Steel Cage does, but better. With the best example being Swords of Revealing Light, which is purely just a better version of Steel Cage, that lets its controller monsters attack and stay in the field for a whole extra turn, making Steel Cage pretty redundant. Which is definitely a shame, because the anime made Steel Cage look as restrictive as Merrick's past by literally trapping the Pharaoh and all of his monsters beneath it. But at the very least, you can still technically use Steel Cage as an option to prevent your opponent's attacks, just like Merrick. But if you want to stall long enough to summon an Egyptian god, there are better tools available. And crashing at number 5, we have Meteor of Destruction, a card that was deemed so powerful that Kaiba actually banned it for official Battle City tournaments. And the reason why is because Meteor is a burn card capable of inflicting 1000 damage to an opponent, but you need to pay 500 life points to activate it. Although the TCG version of this card is a lot weaker, because while you don't need to pay a cost, your opponent's life points need to be 3000 or more to activate it, so it could never be used to finish off an opponent. But in the anime, that's exactly what it's used for. And in one of the most important duels in Battle City, where Yugi had to face off against his best friend Joey, who had been captured and brainwashed by the power of the Millennium Rod and given a bunch of banned cards to use against Yugi. This was a death duel where both players' lives were on the line, as they were shackled to an anchor that would drag both players to the bottom of the ocean, with the only way to free themselves being to reduce your opponent's life points to zero. Because if anyone tried to intervene, Teya would be the one to die instead. This was one of the most heart-wrenching duels of the original series, with Yugi constantly trying to reach out to Joey's inner duelist by summoning Joey's red eyes and even gifting him a Millennium Puzzle. Meanwhile, Merrick used Joey as an opportunity to channel his anger and hatred of the Pharaoh directly to Yugi. And this duel culminated when Joey drew Meteor of Destruction, where he fought against Merrick's brainwashing once more. This affirmed Yugi's belief in the strength of their friendship, but Merrick then used the full power of the rod to force Joey to activate Meteor and assure his victory. But, once again, Joey had broken free of Merrick's mind control, and with his mind returned, Yugi channeled Mystical Red Panel, and in a symbolic act of care for his friend, had Mystical Red Panel target himself so that his life points would be reduced to zero and Joey would be allowed to walk free. However, the newly free Joey refused to let Yugi die, and in a moment of haste realized the Meteor had a side effect which could force Yugi monsters to attack him, and so he begged for Red Eyes to attack, giving both players their freedom. But Yugi had already fainted, and the anchor had started to fall, which forced Joey to remain chained as he fell into the water with Yugi to save his friend. And while he succeeded, Joey struggled with his own luck. Thankfully, he was saved by the heroic actions of his sister Serenity. And so, in the end, everyone was safe. But only barely, as while Meteor did show Yugi and Joey just how strong their bond was, it could just have easily been the cause of their death. Now, in the TCG, Meteor Destruction hasn't had the same spotlight because most burn strategies are pretty gimmicky. To make a burn deck that's competitively viable, you either need to FDK your opponent for all 8,000 life points immediately, or you need a way to stall the game over multiple turns and survive your opponent's threats to continuously burn them. Now, there have been plenty of strategies across the years that have managed to turn burn into a real threat, but those decks quickly found themselves on the forbidden limited list as they're generally unfun to play against. But in these strategies, Meteor Destruction never saw any play. Most burn strategies have better burn cards they'll often build around that are capable of burning over 8,000 points of damage either by themselves or with certain combos. Meanwhile, Meteor's Burn is pretty small in comparison, and can't even be used to finish off an opponent because of its awkward activation requirement. But while it's unfortunate that such an important card isn't playable, it's probably for the best, as Kaiba was kind of right about certain burn cards being too powerful. At the very least, there's no denying how important Meteor was for almost assuring Merrick's victory, while giving Yujo's friendship a chance to shine. Constructing number 4 spot is Visor Des, one of Yami Merrick's most brutal monsters. And that's because Visor Death is capable of tightening its grip around the head of an opponent's monster. And while the monster it's targeting is still on the field, Visor Death is incapable of being destroyed by battle. But the result of this effect differs depending on the TCG in the original version of the card. Because the TCG's card effect causes the target monster to be destroyed during the third standby phase after its activation. While the manga version simply reduces the target's monster's attack by 500. Now, a lot of Yami Merrick's cards were focused on the idea of torturing his opponent's monsters because in the shadow games he would set up, one of the rules he would implement meant that a player would be forced to feel the same pain that was inflicted onto their monsters. As a result, Yummy Merrick's playstyle was slow and calculated, because instead of destroying his opponent and their monsters immediately, he preferred to gradually weaken them over the course of a duel to inflict as much pain as possible. But the most brutal card he used for his torture was Visor Death, a card that inflicted punishment that was so cruel it couldn't be adapted into the anime, as it would wrap around and tighten bolts into the skulls of whatever monster was affecting. 
This made it a terrifying creature every time you played it, such as in his duel against Joey, where Visor Death ended up being replaced by Plasma Eel in the anime. However, the most frightening use of Visor Death was in its first appearance in Merrick's Shadow Game against My Valentine, where it not only persecuted Mai's monsters, it tortured her directly, binding her alongside Visor Shock and holding her in place for the Winged Dragon of Ra's attack. But if you watch the anime, the cards that held Mai in place as Ra attacked were holding arms and holding legs, which were notably less cruel but still left Mai just as hopeless. Thankfully though, it's a lot harder to torture your opponent with cards in the modern TCG, especially with Visor Death. Its effect has always been quite slow, as it needs three of your standby phases to destroy a monster. And while it can't be destroyed by battle, it gives plenty of time for your opponent to figure out how to clear it from the field before its effect has a chance to be useful. However, one of Merrick's torture devices did actually see competitive success, holding legs which, upon its release, became a side deck staple for pendulum strategies, as a way to clear away your opponent's set spell and trap cards before you committed to your plays, as it was pretty much just a giant true nade on legs. And like giant true nade, once it activated, your opponent is forced to immediately use their back row, because if they don't, they return to the hand, and you can perform your plays without worrying about their potential interruptions. And so, while most of Merrick's cruel devices have never seen competitive success, it's actually pretty cool to see holding legs was strong in the TCG in the exact same way that Merrick used it, by clearing away my spell and trap cards in preparation for his boss monster. Oozing into number three is Revival Jam, Merrick's most iconic slime monster that was an integral part to both his and Yummy Merrick's strategy. And that's because Revival Jam represented one of the themes of Merrick's decks incredibly well, immortality. As whenever it was destroyed by battle, it would simply reform back to the field. In the TCG, this is represented by Revival Jam summoning itself back from the graveyard during next standby phase after it's destroyed by battle, if you pay 1000 life points. But in the anime and manga, Revival Jam would regenerate immediately, acting as an unkillable defensive option. A feat that was put on display in Yugi's duel against the Merrick-controlled strings. In this duel, Merrick was determined to defeat the Pharaoh and knew that by summoning out an Egyptian god card, Yugi would be left virtually defenseless. And so most of his early strategy was based around summoning out three slime tokens to prepare for the arrival of Slimer the Sky Dragon. The only issue was that these tokens were pretty weak, and so Yugi could easily beat over them with his stronger monsters. Which is why Merrick employed several stalling tactics, including the use of Revival Jam and Jam Defender, so that whenever Yugi declared an attack on Slime Token, Merrick would activate Jam Defender to switch the attack to Revival Jam, who would simply just regenerate, keeping his token safe and him enough time to summon out his Egyptian god. Slifer seemed unstoppable, and even though Yugi almost managed to defeat the god a couple of times, Revival Jam was there to immediately take the blow and revive itself. And because Merrick's card is safe returned, Merrick would draw cards each time Revival Jam reformed, which strengthened Slifer even more. But this illusion of infinity was precisely the key to defeating Merrick. Because after Yugi used Monster Reborn to revive Buster Blader, he attacked Slifer only for Merrick to defend with Revival Jam once more. But then Yugi activated Brain Control, taking control of Revival Jam before it regenerated and summoned it to his field, which triggered card to safe return to make Slifer even more powerful. And then this forced Slifer's second mouth attack to activate, which destroyed Revival Jam again, only for it to regenerate back to Yugi's field once more and activate Card to Safe Return, forcing Merrick to draw and Slifer's second mouth to activate to destroy Revival Jam again, forming an infinite loop. And so, even though Slifer's attack strength grew over 20,000, it couldn't attack, and Merrick was forced to draw more and more cards each time Revival Jam was brought back, until he had zero cards in his deck and couldn't draw anymore, winning Yugi the duel, and giving him his first Egyptian God card. Funnily enough, the way Yugi defeated Merrick in this duel is still fairly common, as in Master Duel, if you're locked under the effects of Max C, you could choose to give your opponent infinite cards by special summoning as many times as possible to leave them with nothing in deck. However, Revival Jam isn't likely to be involved in this process, as its CG effect is a lot slower and weaker than its anime version. But at the very least, one card from Merrick's infinite combo did see play, so much play that it ended up on the Forbidden Limited list in 2009 where it's remained ever since, Card of Safe Return because while this version of the card only drew one instead of three, the effect had no once per turn. So if you were a knight that could easily revive monsters from the graveyard, you could just keep drawing cards again and again to get a ton of card advantage for free, which can be game-winningly strong, especially by today's standards where reviving cards from the graveyard is a pretty common occurrence. So it makes sense that this part of Merrick's jam strategy was the one that ended up on the ban list as an easy-to-use generic tool that, for some strategies, is basically a better pot of greed. The same can't be said for Revival Jam, though, because while it led to one of Yugi's most iconic victories, it'd be impossible for the TCG version to be useful to either Merrick or Yugi in the same way. Reviving into the number two spot is Monster Reborn, one of Merrick's most feared cards, which makes sense as Monster Reborn effect is incredibly strong, allowing you to target a monster in either player's graveyard and special summon it to the field. But Yami Merrick only ever had one monster in mind when using Monster Reborn, the Winged Dragon of Ra, 
Now, this might seem like a bad idea at first, as Raw would be summoned with zero attack points and be forced to return to the graveyard during the end phase. But Yami Merrick could read the entirety of Raw's hieratic text, which told him of Raw's secret ability. The first ability was known as Point to Point Transfer, and allowed for Merrick to pay all but one of his life points to transfer every point paid into Raw's attack strength effectively fusing with the god card and allowing for Merrick to perform a one-turn kill. But Ra also had a third litany, which paired excellently with Reborn, Egyptian God Phoenix, which could only be used when Ra had been revived from the graveyard, and let Merrick incinerate his enemies by paying a thousand life points. These two modes put Ra above even the other Egyptian god cards. It made Reborn a genuine threat. So much so that by the end of Battle City, most of Merrick's strategy was around using cards with cards like Left Arm Offering to find Reborn as quickly as possible, and Dark Spell Regeneration so he could use Reborn from the graveyard. And in the TCG, Reborn is just as powerful as Merrick made it out to be, but not for the same reasons. Summoning Monster from the graveyard is generally a strong effect for a card to have, as it gives you a way of using cards in the graveyard as a resource, which is why a lot of modern strategies have their own archetypal ways of reborning a monster. But very few Arctobal Reborns can match the strength of the original with its main upside being its versatility and what it can revive, which was especially strong in the early days of the game where you could either revive your own boss monster or use your opponent's cards against them. And even in the modern day, Reborn is deemed to be so powerful that it's still limited to one copy, as it's an amazing extender that can either help a play through certain hand traps or help to build an even stronger board. Overall, Merrick's obsession with Monster Reborn was justified, as it's an amazing card that can be a boon in almost every deck, but it's rarely ever going to be used to summon out an Egyptian god. Speaking of which, Great beast of the sky, please hear my cry. Transform thyself, orb and sun, and on this list to be number one. Envelop the channel with your glow and show your text so we may know. Unlock your effect from deep inside so our brains may grow wide. Appear with flame as I call your name, the winged dragon of Ra. Now, these weren't exactly the sacred words used to summon Ra, but in the anime, Ra's chant was an incredibly important step in actually summoning the card. Because if you couldn't, Ra would just remain in its sphere mode. The anime and TCG versions of these cards have some major differences, but the things they both have in common are they both need three tributes. It's point-to-point -point transfer ability, and it's Egyptian god phoenix effects, which allows you to pay a thousand life points to send a monster in the field to the graveyard. But in the anime, Ra being an Egyptian god gave it access to a ton of powerful protections, and even an extra effect which allowed it to gain the attack and defense points of the monsters used for its tribute summon. But it's all of these effects combined that made Ra a near unstoppable force, and one that was deadly in Merrick's hands. Ra was his ultimate monster and was game ending almost every time it appeared in any one of its forms. Whether in the sphere bow that allowed for Merrick's victory over Mai, as an immortal phoenix that almost killed both Bakura and Joey, or as the sun god Ra, who Yami Merrick would fuse with to launch all of his hatred directly towards the pharaoh. But Ra was more than just a regular monster. It was a god, whose rage could be cast into those that misused the card. Such as Merrick's adopted older brother, Odeon, who was forced to use a counterfeit copy of Ra in his duel against Joey Wheeler. The counterfeit copy enraged Ra, and caused it to launch its judgment directly into Odeon, causing him to fall into a coma. And Odeon was the last bastion that was holding back the twisted alter ego that had been born after the tortured Merrick endured to become a Toon Keeper. The same alter ego that killed Merrick's father. And so when Odeon fell, Yami Merrick had the opportunity to take over and inflict the same suffering that Merrick had endured onto his enemies. Now, in the TCG, Ra doesn't hold the same godly powers that it had in the anime. So it's unlikely the card is going to cause you to be struck down if you misuse it. But it's pretty hard to use Ra in the right way, because even amongst the Egyptian gods, Ra isn't an amazing card. While it can be a decent OTK tool with a solid removal effect, it requires a ton of investment to actually summon, especially since it's the only god card that can't be special summoned by regular means. And what's worse is that Ra's one-turn kill capabilities isn't really that unique, as there are a ton of different ways to OTK an opponent without needing to spend your normal summon on Ra. Meanwhile, Obelisk managed to see play because of its target protection, and Slifer's second mouth effect can sometimes floodgate certain strategies out of the game. However, there is one form of Raw that's actually become a staple of modern strategies and played in a ton of different side decks as a way to easily clear the field of your opponent's monsters. The Winged Dragon of Raw, Sphere Mode. Because Sphere Mode can let you normal summon to your opponent's side of the field by tributing their monsters, essentially forcing them to summon Raw without knowing the chant. This replaces your opponent's boss monsters and interactions with a ball that does virtually nothing, and is capable of breaking an opponent's entire board by itself. Not every deck can run Sphere Mode because it requires you to give up your normal summon to use, but any deck that can play Sphere Mode should, as it gives you a tool to make going second incredibly easy, and was once so feared 
that people were once even willing to play the original Raw on their deck, just so they could actually use the ball for something. Overall though, it's genuinely cool to see that such an important monster from the anime has managed to become one of the most feared going second staples in the modern age, with the status has lived up to its game-ending nature, letting your opponent feel Raw's judgment, even if it's not in the form that most people expected. Almost no other character throughout the entire franchise loves dueling as much as Jaden Yuki, the headstrong but free-spirited prodigy of Duel Academy who constantly sought out powerful opponents just so he could face off against them in fun and interesting duels. But as the series progresses, he began to understand the responsibilities that came with growing up, and put so much weight on his shoulders that he almost lost his love of the game. At least until he fought against a certain duelist. So today, we're going to be taking a look at Jaden Yuki's 10 most important cards, how they helped him grow up, and whether or not they'll make him a hero in the TCG. Transmuting to number 10, we have Elemental Hero Electrum, the ultimate elemental hero that showed off Jaden's mastery over the elements as an alchemist. And that's because Electrum is the fusion of the four classic elements, earth, wind, fire, and water. But you need to be a master of alchemy to combine these elements, as it can't be summoned in any other way except by fusion summoning. And if you do manage to bring it out to the field, you have to shuffle back all banished cards into the deck. And that's not all, because Electrum gains 300 attack for every monster your opponent controls that shares an attribute with it, which can be a pretty substantial buff, especially because it's also treated as an earth, wind, fire, and water monster alongside its original light attribute. This made Electrum an impressively powerful hero that acted as Jaden's strongest trump card during the duels of the Shadow Riders arc, especially in Jaden's final face-off against Kagamaru, who wanted to use the power of the Sacred Beast to drain the power of the dual spirits to retain his youth. And he almost succeeded as he managed to bring out all three beasts, but with the power of the Philosopher's Stone, Jaden was able to bring out Elemental Hero Electrum and boost its attack to 14,500, enough to destroy Raviel and wipe out Kagamaru's life points. But Electrum's most interesting use wasn't as a beat stick, as Jaden also took advantage of its ability to recycle banished cards which came in clutch a couple of times throughout the series, such as in his duel against Amnil, where Jaden proved himself as the ultimate alchemist by shuffling back banished cards which reduced the attack of Helios Trismegistus to zero, allowing him to strike the final blow against Banner, releasing his spirit from the construct it was contained within, only for him to be swallowed by the Pharaoh. Now in the TCG, Electrum was never really an impressive beat stick. But the way Jaden used it to shuffle back resources is precisely what made it a strong tool that could easily OTK an opponent. Electrum has amazing synergy with both Fusion Gate, a fusion spell which not once per turn requires you to banish materials, and Chain Material, a trap card that makes it so whenever you perform a fusion summon, you banish monsters from your deck so long as those materials are listed on the monster you're summoning. These cards combined mean that you could summon Electrum by just banishing each of the materials from the deck, then uses effect to shuffle back the materials you just banished. Then you can summon a second Electrum to the field, shuffling back its materials once again, which would give you two level 10 monsters on board which can overlay for a super dreadnought rail cannon Gustav Max and burn your opponent for 2000 points of damage. But that's not where the combo ends, as like Jaden, you need to prove your mastery of the elements through the use of the Omni Heroes by banishing Gustav and the Electrum with Fusion Gate to summon out Elemental Hero Gaia, and then use Gaia and the Electrum to summon out Elemental Hero the Shining. And once you have all these cards banished, you can use the effect of Fusion Gate again to summon out a third copy of Electrum and shovel back all of your banished cards, which allows you to repeat the process infinitely to burn your opponent. And it's honestly really cool that the way Jaden used it in GX actually managed to showcase the strength of Electrum's effect, which allowed Jaden to prove his worth as the ultimate alchemist. Likewise, in order to use the card to its full potential in the TCG, you need to have mastery over almost every attribute. And making miracles number 9, we have Miracle Fusion, one of Jaden's strongest comeback cards that showcases his ability to turn duels around in his favor with a single miraculous draw. And that's because Miracle Fusion doesn't need you to have cards in hand to fusion summon, and can instead banish monsters from your field or graveyard to summon out Elemental Hero Fusion Monster, giving you another shot at fighting against your opponent even when you're completely out of resources. Which is exactly what made Miracle Fusion such an iconic part of Jaden's toolbox, as he'd often draw it after his other heroes had been defeated and his back was against the wall, which allowed him to stage a comeback in even the most dire of circumstances, because Miracle Fusion gives Jaden access to some of his most powerful boss monsters, even when he has no resources to summon them letting him easily access the likes of Electrum and Shining Flare Wingman with ease, who are often enough to win duels on their own. And the same is true in the actual TCG, as Miracle Fusion is a staple of hero strategies and it's been a key factor to the deck's historical success. There's tons of powerful elemental hero monsters in the extra deck that Miracle Fusion makes easier to access, including the Omni Heroes, a series of elemental heroes that only require one elemental hero, plus a monster of a specific attribute as its materials, with the most powerful of the Omni Heroes being Elemental Hero Absolute Zero, because whenever Absolute Zero leaves the field, it destroys all monsters your opponent controls, which made it an absolutely absurd monster for its time period, 
as dealing with it often meant a losing your entire field. As a result of Absolute Zero's success, a lot of classic hero strategies like Diva Hero and Bubble Beat consolidated around a small package of heroes, taking advantage of their individual strengths to gain advantage, and then using Miracle Fusion to access an absolute bomb of a boss monster. But Miracle Fusion can be used for far more than just Absolute Zero, especially modern hero strategies that appreciate the card's versatility and what it can summon, especially since the card is now searchable thanks to Elemental Hero Sunriser, a monster that mimics Jaden's iconic Gotcha Pose, who allows you to replicate the Duelist Miracle Draw by letting you add Miracle Fusion to your hand. It's amazing to see how Miracle Fusion has managed to stand the test of time as an amazing tool in classic hero strategies that's become a staple of the modern deck, while also being able to showcase that in the anime and in the TCG, sometimes all you need is one miraculous draw to turn things around. And swimming to number 8 is Neospatian Aqua Dolphin. The first of the Neospatians, an entire archetype that Jaden actually designed himself as a child that ended up being shot into space by Seto Kaiba. This allowed for these cards to absorb the power of space waves, giving them new abilities and creating a new type of hero. These abilities vary between each Neospatian, but in the case of Aqua Dolphin, you can discard a card to look at your opponent's hand and force them to discard a monster with less attack than or equal to the monster you control and inflict 500 damage to them. But if they don't have a monster with less attack than one you control, you take 500 damage instead. Each of the Neospatians also had an extra power that they shared amongst each other, the ability to perform a new kind of fusion known as Contact Fusion alongside Elemental Hero Neos by shuffling back the necessary materials from your field. These powers combined made the Neospatians a key evolution of Jaden's strategy that was necessary for him to defeat the Light of Destruction and those it controlled and manipulated, including the likes of Aster Phoenix. You see, prior to this duel, Jaden and Aster had actually faced off against each other before where Aster absolutely dominated Jaden's elemental heroes with the power of destiny. This defeat left Jaden lost and confused, as not only had the light attempted to break Jaden's spirit, but Aster made Jaden believe that he wasn't a true hero as he had nothing to fight for. As a result, Jaden lost sight of his reason for dueling and couldn't even see dual spirits or his cards anymore and opted to leave Duel Academy for good until he was abducted by the Moon of Lo, where he met a strange alien known as Dolphinian, who tried to restore Jaden's resolve by telling him of the power of the gentle darkness contained within him, and pushing him to duel an Emissary of Light with a deck that had crash-landed there. But that wasn't an ordinary deck, and these cards were actually the ones that Jaden designed himself, which reminded him of the love and excitement he felt for the heroes as a child, which was enough for Jaden to feel reinvigorated, healing his spirit enough to see his cards again and use the power of the Neospatians. From there, Jaden went on a small pilgrimage, meeting and collecting new Neospatians until he was ready to duel Aster again with this rediscovered joy for his heroes. A joy that carried Jaden to victory, because while Aster managed to quickly adapt to the Neospatians, the likes of Aqua Dolphin and Flare Scara proved their strength, and the duel culminated when Jaden used the power of Contact Fusion to summon him to hero Flare Neos, a hero that enthused Jaden so much that even Aster was reminded of his own childlike love of the new heroes. And strangely enough, this love of heroism might carry you to similar victories in the TCG, as quite a few Neospatians have seen genuine competitive success across the game's history. Now, as a standalone strategy, Neospatians are pretty weak and inconsistent, and don't really facilitate contact fusion well. But individually, a lot of them have actually pretty powerful effects. Neospatian Dark Panther manages to play in synchro cat strategies, since it could be summoned with the pre errata version of Rescue Cat, and uses effect to copy an opponent's effect and then use it against them. And a Neospatian Grand Mole managed to find its way into the game's limited list for years for being a really strong removal option that can deal with any problematic monster by attacking into it and bouncing both to the hand. And even in the modern era, Neospatians continue to prove themselves throughout the power of Aqua Dolphin, who has become a prominent feature in Infernoble decks because of its warrior typing, which allows you to summon with the effects of Neospace Connector to have enough link materials for your soul day from a single normal summon. But Aqua Dolphin isn't just vanilla. As before you make a soul day, you can use this effect to look at your opponent's hand and scout for powerful cards and even rip away your opponent's hand traps, allowing you to combo off without interruption. In general, the power of space waves really did give the Neospatians the strength to be viable in both Jaden's deck and the TCG, as while they're not amazing as a standalone strategy, they're excellent when splashed into other strategies, like Hero in the anime and Infernoble in the TCG, allowing for other decks to feel the same joy of being a hero that Jaden once felt. Shining into number 7 is Rainbow Neos, the representation of the bond shared between Jade and Yuki and Jesse Anderson. In order to summon Rainbow Neos, you need to fuse together Elemental Hero Neos with any ultimate crystal monster. And while it's on the field, you can activate one of three effects to shuffle opponent's cards into the deck, depending on the cost you pay. If you send a monster you control to the graveyard, you can shuffle away all of your opponent's monsters. If you send a spell or trap card you control to the graveyard, you can spin all spell and trap cards your opponent controls. And last but not least, you can send the top card of your deck to the graveyard to shuffle all cards in your opponent's graveyard back into their deck. 
These are all powerful effects, but in order for Jaden to bring Rainbow Neos to the field in the first place, he had to rely on the strength of his bond with Jesse Anderson. We saw the strength of his connection in Jaden and Jesse's Battle Royale duel against Fujiwara, where not only did Jesse refuse to betray Jaden, he even sacrificed his life points to protect him, and put Rainbow Dragon in his graveyard so that Jaden could form Rainbow Neos. But the moment where his bond shined the most was in Jaden's duel against Yubel possessed Jesse. This duel was the intense culmination of the Dimension World arc, an entire season dedicated to Jaden's quest to save Jesse from the Dark Dimension. This seemed like a pretty easy task for an ace duelist like Jaden, but even after a short while in the Dark World, Jaden began to struggle, and learning the meaning of sacrifice. At first, Jaden gave up the fun he had in duels to take things more seriously. But soon, Jaden began to sacrifice more and more until his heart had closed off completely, and allowed for a colder, more tactical personality known as the Supreme King to wake up within him. The only thing that managed to set Jaden free the Supreme King's control was Axel Brody reaching out to Jaden with Jim's Eye of Orichalcum. Axel was sent to the stars after this, but Ojama Yellow was able to confirm to Jaden that Jesse was alive. And the Ojama wasn't lying. Jesse was alive, but his body had been taken over by Yubel, a seemingly malevolent spirit who was obsessed with Jaden's love. But despite Yubel's cruel tactics, Jaden mustered up the courage to face off against them in a duel to free Jesse from their control. Yubel using Jesse's own crystal beast to summon out Rainbow Dark Dragon. But Jaden steeled himself against Jesse's ultimate monster and realized that this was an opportunity to reach out to Jesse, and put his trust into the dark power of super polymerization to fuse both Neos and Rainbow Dark Dragon into Rainbow Neos, which freed Jesse from the influence of Yubel, allowing for Jaden to finally save his friend. Now, in the TCG, Rainbow Neos is slightly nerfed since it doesn't have the power to free your friends from being possessed, but it's actually still quite a strong card in spite of that. Each of Rainbow Neos' options are absurd in their own way, since they're capable of wiping out an opponent's key resource. The only problem with it is that when it was first released, it was pretty difficult to bring out, as you need to have Elemental Hero Neos, an ultimate crystal monster, and a way to fusion summon in order to access it, which is a huge investment of very specific resources. But with the release of Neos Fusion, you can summon out Rainbow Neos by using both the Neos and ultimate crystal monster from your deck, instead with a trade-off that prevents you from special summoning monsters for the rest of the turn after you activate the card. This makes Rainbow a lot easier to use. You do have to worry about Neos Fusion's downsides, but that's what you get for its powerhouse going second tool that can leave your opponent with virtually nothing. And so it's really cool that the representation of the bond between Jaden and Jesse is just as strong as the anime made it out to be, since it's an excellent game ending tool that also signify the end of Jaden's quest to save one of his closest friends. And watching over the number 6 spot is Yubel, Jaden's sworn protector. In fact, Yubel was so loyal to Jaden that they were willing to replace their own body with that of a dragon, which prevents them from being destroyed by battle, and prevents battle damage if Yubel is attacked. And if they do end up being attacked by an opponent's monster, then you get to inflict damage to your opponent equal to the attack of that monster. But in order to keep Yubel on the field, you have to attribute a monster during the end phase. And if you don't, they destroy themselves. And last but not least, if Yubel happens to be destroyed by a card effect except their own, you can then evolve them by summoning Yubel, Terror Incarnate, from your hand deck or graveyard. Now, in the anime, Yubel wasn't used too much by Jaden as a card. However, they weren't just a regular card. They were a spirit who swore their life as a protector of the, the Supreme King. And as it turned out, the Supreme King's spirit was dormant in Jaden. So when Yubel was given to him as a child, they continued to keep their promise and did everything they could to protect him. However, Yubel's way of protecting Jaden meant that everyone who dueled him underwent misfortune, which caused everyone to fear him, which did keep him protected, but alone. Jaden knew that Yubel was the source of these tragedies, so when his designs were set off to be shut off into space, he requested that Yubel go with him. However, Yubel was placed in a separate satellite and ended up being exposed to the light of destruction, which tortured them and ended up driving them mad as they wondered why Jaden would put them through this torture only to come to the belief that this was his way of expressing their love for them. And so, when Yubel came back to Earth, they wanted to show Jaden that same love, and forced him through similar suffering, and pushed Jaden down the path to reawaken the Supreme King inside of him, so he can gain access to the super polarization and fuse together all 12 dimensions, so that Yubel and Jaden could be alone together forever. But during their final duel against one another, Jaden remembered his past life as a Supreme King, and the promises he made. And so, in an act of love, Jaden used Yubel's super polymerization to fuse their souls together, purging the light from Yubel and making their dream of being with Jaden forever become a reality. Then, once more, Yubel became Jaden's guardian angel, protecting him in season 4 from the memory alteration of Honest and Darkness, and was even an integral part of Jaden's duel against Nightshroud, who stole Yubel and tried to use them against Jaden, only for Jaden to use super poly once more to fuse with Neos and Yubel into Neos Wise Man representation of Jaden's newfound maturity. Unfortunately though, Yubel is entirely loyal to Jaden, 
and so no other duelist has been able to form the same bond with them as they had in the anime. And that shows with their viability, as the effects of Yubel and their evolutions are pretty lackluster, since their burn effects are heavily reliant on the battle phase, and they're all pretty difficult to bring out to the field, with both their evolutions needing their previous forms to bring out, and Yubel themselves having no reliable way to be put on the field. But despite Yubel's lackluster performance in the TCG, they'll soon be receiving support that does a ton of interesting things for the strategy, from the likes of Mature Chronicle, which can surge super polymerization, and their new form, Yubel, Das Egwig Liebe Watcher, an incredible super poly target that can use Yubel to fuse away a field of up to 12 monsters. So while Yubel has never been too competitively viable, their new support is breathing new life into their strategy, and could potentially even see real success with the right build, and could allow for them to act as the protector they always were meant to be. And merging to number 5 is Super Polymerization, the symbol of the Supreme King. Super Poly is a quick play spell that can only use fusion materials on the field, but lets you use monsters your opponent controls as well. And the best part is that neither player can activate any card or effect in response to it. Although in order to use Super Poly, you do have to pay the cost of discarding one card. Jaden, however, paid an even greater cost. The original wielder of Super Poly was actually Brawn, Mad King of the Dark World, who attempted to create the card by forcing Jaden to sacrifice his friends every time Brawn took battle damage. As this allowed him to use his Wicked Cannon to banish a Wicked Doctrine card from his deck, which corresponded with a negative emotion contained within Jaden's friends, who would be sent to the stars to create Super Polymerization. Brawn was ultimately unsuccessful in wielding Super Polymerization, as the final emotion he needed wasn't present. But Jaden still sacrificed both of his friends. And so, when he won the duel, Super Polymerization fell to Jaden and the Supreme King called out to him, telling him that in order to defeat evil, Jaden himself must become evil. Traumatized by the battle and unsure of his own actions, Jaden closed off his heart and gave up control to the Supreme King, who would use Super Polymerization as his ace card. After Jaden had reawoken, Super Polymerization had left him disturbed and uneasy as reminding him of the sacrifices of his friends and the evils he had committed. But despite being deemed such an evil card, Jaden had to accept both the Supreme King inside of him and Super Polymerization in order to save the people he cared for most, including Jesse, when he used the card to make Rainbow Dias. But this gave you Bell access to the card, which they use in their final duel against Jaden as a symbol of their love for them when they use a spell chronicle, which banished five cards from the deck and built up counters whenever Jaden activated a spell card. Yubel could then remove two of those counters and add a banished card to their hand of Jaden's choice. If Jaden accepted Yubel's love, the card he would choose to give them would be Super Polymerization, which would allow Yubel to fuse together all 12 dimensions so they could be along with Jaden forever by forming the Super Fusion God. So, Jaden went the entire duel trying to prevent Super Poly from reaching their hand. But after a vision of his past life with Yubel, Jaden made his final decision on the last turn of the duel and gifted them Super Polymerization. Yubel was still intent on merging the dimensions, and so activated Chain Material to use 12 monsters from their hand, deck, or graveyard, and activated Super Poly. But Jaden had activated Spiritual Fusion beforehand, letting him pick the targets for Yubel's fusion. And Jaden chose himself and Yubel, allowing their spirit to unite with the Supreme King and purge the influence of the light from their soul. Unfortunately, one of the big downsides of Super Polymerization the TCG is that you can't use it to fuse with your opponent, but it's still an astonishingly strong staple that's capable of wiping away an opponent's entire board, especially because no one can respond to it. So even if your opponent has a board of infinite negates, you can use Super Poly to clear it away and they won't be able to do anything to stop it. The only difficult thing about Super Poly is that you need to have appropriate targets in your extra deck to deal with different kinds of end boards. Now in the anime, Jaden's best super poly targets were somewhat generic, such as Dark Gaia and Malicious Bane. And this trend continues in the TCG, where the strongest monsters for super poly have generic materials that allows the card to have a wide coverage in what it can fuse away and be applicable against multiple different strategies. But the targets you usually choose will depend on the best decks of the current format, and sometimes even the strangest targets can prove how strong they are if their materials happen to match up the end board of a format's best strategies. So overall, Super Poly genuinely lives up to its anime status, to the point where in the TCG it was banned for several years for just how good it was, making it a card that's well worth the cost of both a discarding card and sacrificing your friends in order to use it. And the symbol of Supreme King is likely to see play so long as it's legal, as the more fusion monsters that are released, the stronger Super Polymerization becomes. And fusing to number 4 is the very foundation of Jaden's strategy in the card that established fusion as a core theme of GX, Polymerization. Polymerization was the game's first fusion spell, and allows you to fusion summon a monster by sending materials from your hand or field to the graveyard. 
Fusion summoning is the heart of heroes. Individually, each of Jaden's heroes are relatively weak, but fusion summoning allowed these monsters to combine into stronger monsters with powerful effects. Jaden had multiple ways of performing fusions with the likes of Miracle Fusion, Diffusion Gate, and even Contact Fusion once he obtained it Neos. But his most iconic way of fusion summoning was with Polymerization, which let him unleash the latent potential that was contained within heroes, and adapt to any situation thanks to the infinite potential Polymerization promises. And in the TCG, polymerization lives up to the same potential. You would think that it would be outclassed in the modern day because of the presence of stronger fusion cards that can use materials from the graveyard, banished pile, and the deck. But polymerization's strength is its sheer simplicity, which allows it to be a great option for any fusion-based strategy as a way to start and extend plays or even break boards. That's not all though, as polymerization also has a number of powerful support cards that have helped it remain competitively viable including powerful searchers like King of the Swamp, and Fright for Patchwork, which can be used at Poly and at Edge Imp Chain from your deck to your hand. And if you're looking to play polymerization heroes like Jaden, there are actually multiple support cards that make it a really strong option for the deck, and one that's almost mandatory to play modern heroes thanks to Vision Hero Vion. It's heartwarming to see that the game's first ever fusion spell hasn't been power crept at all, and in fact is actually one of the best fusion spells in the game thanks to its versatility and the support surrounding it. And it's even cooler that it's still a great part of the hero strategy, letting you summon out your heroes in 2023, much like how Jaden did in the anime. But out of all of Jaden's heroes, one of them was his favorite. Burning into number 3 spot, we have Elemental Hero Flame Wingman, Jaden's favorite hero and his original ace monster. In order to summon Flame Wingman, you need to fuse together Elemental Hero Avian and Elemental Hero Burst and Atrix. And if it destroys the monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, you can use its effect to inflict damage to your opponent equal to the attack of that destroyed monster. This gave Jaden a solid way to end duels by using the combination of Flame Wingman's attack to deal damage and their effect to deal burn damage, which was often just enough to finish the opponent off. The only issue with Flame Wingman was that for a fusion monster, its 2100 attack was pretty weak and could occasionally be overwhelmed by stronger monsters. But if that were the case, Jaden could make Flame Wingman even stronger by combining it with Sparkman to form Shining Flare Wingman, a monster capable of standing up to Zane, Cyber, and Dragon. But this hero's most iconic use has always been in Jaden's first duel of the series against Crowler, as Flame Wingman was the very reason Jaden got into Duel Academy. In this duel, Crowler was doing everything he could to prevent Jaden from having a fair chance at joining the Academy since he was late including playing his own deck that included a rare and powerful card, Ancient Gear Golem, which towered over most monsters at an impressive 3,000 attack. Jaden wasn't deterred, however. In fact, he was overjoyed that Crowler was willing to go all out against him and fired back by summoning Flame Wingman. Now, this may seem like a bad move at first, as Flame Wingman only has 2,100 attack, but Jaden had an extra trick up his sleeve and activated Skyscraper, a field spell that gave all heroes a 1,000 attack boost, which gave Flame Man just enough attack to defeat Gear Golem and burn Crowler for 3,000 life points, winning Jaden the duel and proving that he deserved to be enrolled. But despite how iconic this moment was, the original Flame Wing Man's burn effect isn't really that valuable in the TCG. It can technically be useful to end games in the same way as Jaden, but it's fairly awkward to use since it's so reliant on the battle phase and requires specific materials. But Flame Wingman teaches a really important concept that's important to a lot of duelists even in the modern day, the idea of the favorite card. That card could be anything, from the strongest boss monster to quirky gimmicks. Every duelist out there has a favorite card they love to use, win or lose, and are willing to play an entire deck just to facilitate it. But Wingman takes that idea to the next level, as its retrained formed Infernal Rage lets you search your deck for your favorite cards. Unfortunately, this won't let me add skill drain to my hand, but it does have the pretty solid pool of searching targets including Favorite Contact, Eternal Favorite, and Favorite Hero, which lets you activate any field spell from your deck including Skyscraper. But that's not all, as Infernal Rage's second effect lets you summon out any level 7 or lower elemental hero monster from your extra deck ignoring their summoning conditions. Modern hero strategies usually use this effect to summon out Sunriser, but you can also use it to bring out the original Flame Wingman, equipped with the favorite hero, and activate Skyscraper from your deck. And that's awesome that the card is capable of recreating Jaden's iconic combo while also being a versatile and competitive option that sees played in modern hero builds, letting his favorite hero have the spotlight it deserves. And flying into number 2, we have Wayne Karibo, Jaden's original dual spirit partner that established him as Yugi Moto's successor. Like Yugi's original Karibo, Wing Karibo has a defensive effect that can reduce damage to zero, but differs from its fiend counterpart as Wing Karibo needs to be destroyed by battle, but prevents you from taking battle damage for the rest of the turn. This made it the perfect guardian angel for Jaden, as whenever it seemed like he was guaranteed to lose, Wing Karibo's damage negation could come in clutch, especially when combined with the Flute of Summoning Karibo, which could bring them out from the deck to save Jaden the last minute. 
In fact, there were a number of duels across the series that Jaden would have lost if it hadn't been for the hidden power of Wayne Karibo, making Jaden quite lucky to have the card, as it wasn't originally part of his deck. It was gifted to him by Yugi Moto on their first day of Duel Academy, who believed that Wayne Karibo wanted to go with Jaden. And those weren't just hollow words, as Wayne Karibo's duel spirit began communicating with Jaden and guided him along the right path in both duels and day-to-day -day life whenever he was lost, such as when they led Jaden to Yugi Moto so that he could regain his love of dueling. But Win Kribo wasn't just an advisor, it even managed to hold its own in duels, but became particularly powerful during Jaden and Chaz's second duel against one another. In this duel, Chaz had been using rare cards gifted to him by Crowler to make Jaden fail his field test, and had gained the edge by bringing out VWXYZ Dragon Cannon Catapult. But Jaden managed to turn the duel around by activating a new card of his own that was gifted to him by Miss Tome, Transcended Winks. This transformed the regular Win Kribo and Win Kribo level 10, who despite its weak stats was a match for Dragon Catapult Cannon, using its effect to destroy and inflict 3000 damage to Chaz in the process. Unfortunately though, Wing Kribo's hidden power happens to be really well hidden in the TCG. Being able to negate battle damage for a turn can sometimes keep you in the game and help you stall out, but the best ways of doing this usually involve preventing attacks or skipping the battle phase to keep your monsters safe. Wing Kribo's effect is comparatively a lot weaker, especially since you have to commit it to the field in some way while hoping your opponent destroys it by battle rather than removing it from the field with a card effect. And its evolved forms level 9 and level 10 are just as awkward, as while they're definitely stronger than their original form, they're hard to summon consistently and rely too much on the battle phase. And that's definitely a shame, because in the show, Wing Kribo always seemed to appear whenever Jaden needed them most, both in and out of duels. It just happens to be a lot less reliable in the TCG. But it only makes sense as a successor of the King of Games would be one of the only duels in the world to be able to make Wing Kribo work. And contacting in from Neo Space number one is Jaden Yuki's ace monster and the symbol of his deck, Elemental Hero Neos. Now, Neos might seem really similar to Yuki's ace monster, the Dark Magician, as they both share the same level and attack stat and don't have any effect. But Neos's flavor text shows us a hint of his true power, as his text states that Neos is a new kind of hero that comes from Neos Space that can perform a contact fusion. This means that you can shuffle back Neos and other monsters you control in order to summon certain fusion monsters. And Jaden uses newfound power across the entire series as soon as he gained access to Neos, summoning new heroes that no one else could ever imagine. Literally, no one else, as Jaden also held a personal connection with Neos. As like Neospatians, Jaden had designed Neos as a child so to be shot into space by Kaiba. And so, from the moment Aqua Dolphin guided Jaden to his new cards, Neos and the Neospatians became a core part of his deck with the power of Neos being the main reason that Jaden was able to defeat the likes of the Society of Light, Yubel, and even Darkness itself. But Neos' coolest moment was in Jaden's final duel against Yugi Moto, where we not only got to see Neos and Dark Magician face off, we also got to see Neos charging in to attack Slifer the Sky Dragon. We never got to see who won this duel, but all that really mattered was that Jaden managed to prove his worth against the King of Games and have one last exciting duel. And the best part is that in the TCG, Neos can give you that same exact excitement that Jaden felt, as it's actually a pretty solid part of modern hero strategies. Historically speaking, Neos has never really seen too much use. Contact Fusion was competitively viable in non-hero strategies, but in hero decks, Neos was pretty hard to bring out, especially alongside another Neospatian. But Neos Alias, a de-evolution of Neos, was the star of a ton of hero-based beatdown strategies because of its solid attack stat and the fact that it was a Gemini monster, which meant that it paired excellently with Gemini Spark. But modern hero strategies can actually play the original Neos and use him to his full potential. By using extra hero Infernal Deceiver, you can search out Neos from your deck and use him to fusion summon Infernal Raids to search for favorite contact. Then, because Infernal Rage was summoned using a normal monster, you can use its second effect to summon out a Sunriser and use it to search Miracle Fusion to extend your plays. And now Neos is in the graveyard, you can set Favorite Contact and activate it during your opponent's turn to summon out Elemental Hero's Shiny Neos Wingman, which on summon can pop a bunch of your opponent's cards. So even though Neos isn't quite the ace monster it's made out to be, it's actually still a decently strong card upheld by modern hero support that makes it a pretty strong tool giving heroes yet another way of evolving, which is exactly how they helped Jaden evolve into the duelist he is today. Chaz Princeton, otherwise known as the Chaz, was a spoiled rich kid who believed that he was better than everyone else, but was especially arrogant towards his main rival, Jaden Yuki. But over time, and after many humiliating defeats, Chaz realized that it was better to carve out his own path in life rather than relying on his status, which was a change that brought him out of Jaden's shadow and made him a crowd favorite who constantly received thunderous applause. 
So today we're going to look at the Chaz's most important cards, how they let him Chaz it up, and whether or not they'd give him 1, 10, 100, or 1000 wins in the actual TCG. Then in the number 10 spot, we have the Ring of Destruction, an incredibly reckless trap card, strangely enough, showed off Chaz's softer side. Now, Ring's actual effect is pretty brutal, because it lets you target a face-up monster your opponent controls whose attack is less than or equal to their life points and destroys it. Then you take damage equal to that monster's attack in order to inflict the same damage to your opponent. But Chaz used the same version of the card as Kaiba, its pre-errata form, which could target any monster during either player's turn, and both players had to take the damage at the same time. The way Kaiba used Ring was to maximize its brutality to his opponents while minimizing the damage to himself with the use of Ring of Defense, showcasing his tactical genius. And Chaz actually echoed this genius as he performed the same combo in his duels against the North Academy students, where he used Ring on his own powered up panda to inflict over 4,000 damage to his opponents, while protecting himself with Ring of Defense. But Chaz wasn't as reliant on this combo as Kaiba, and would just use Ring on its own, which ended up inflicting burn damage to both players, and was a fairly important aspect of Chaz's love duel against Alexis. In this duel, Chaz had been encouraged by Atticus to make his romantic feelings known through a duel, and work together on a deck so that Chaz would show his love. And a lot of the new inclusions seemed like pretty strange choices, with the likes of Love Letter and Dramatic Crossroads, and he even made some crucial misplays purely out of love. But Ring of Destruction was actually an amazing choice for his strategy, as not only did it destroy Blader Skater, the damage both players took was, according to Atticus, symbolic of the pain that lovers share between one another. And, funnily enough, this was actually the main way of using Ring of Destruction in the actual game, rather than Kaiba's patented combo. But not because Ring was a symbol of love, quite the opposite actually, as it was a way to put your opponent at a disadvantage by removing their monsters from the field, and sometimes even end the game outright with its burn. And even if your opponent is doing their best to play around it, as you could have just summoned your own high attack monster and destroyed it to finish your opponent off, like how Chaz did in his duel against the North Academy students, that's not the only way that Ring can end a game. Because if you happen to be in a losing position, you can use the classic version of Ring to force a draw between you and your opponent, since the original version burned players at the exact same time. These factors combined to make Ring an astonishing tool in the early days of the game, and a staple that saw use in a ton of different decks until it was subsequently banned and spent a long time in the Forbidden Limited list up until its eventual errata, which nerfed Ring of Destruction into the ground by making it more awkward to use with its new activation requirements, while also guaranteeing that its user takes the damage first, preventing games from ending in a draw as a result. This once legendary card no longer sees much success in the modern day. Still, if you want to mirror the anime, there are definitely certain strategies that can take advantage of Ring in the same way that Chaz did, but you have to be as willing as he was to share the pain. Smash into the number 9 are Magical Mallet and Reload, two cards that let Chaz mulligan his hand so that he can guarantee he'd drawn to his best cards. Both Mallet and Reload let you shovel cards of your hand back into your deck and then draw the same number you put back, with the only difference between the two cards being that Reload is a quick play spell that requires you to shuffle back every card in your hand, while Mallet is a normal spell that lets you pick and choose what you return. Despite their differences though, both of these cards were features of Chad's decks that he would use to unbreak his hand during multiple points of the series. Magical Mallet, for example, was actually a rare card that had been gifted to Chaz by Dr. Crowler, who hoped that he would use it to make Jaden fail his tests, and he actually ended up using the card twice within the same turn to turbo out VWXYZ Dragon Catapult Cannon. Meanwhile, Reload was only ever used by Chaz while trapped by his visions of darkness. Within these illusions, Chaz was a pro duelist who had never won a sanctioned duel with his game being his last chance at proving himself. He and his opponent were down to the last few life points, and it was Chaz's turn. So all he needed was a strong normal summon to win the duel and reclaim his glory, only for that draw to be Ojama Yellow, who had zero attack points. But Chaz had a second card in hand, Reload, which gave him a choice. Either he could set Ojama Yellow to the field to survive an extra turn, or he could use Reload to shuffle back Yellow to hope for a new monster to finish off the duel. And Chaz chose both. You see, the visions made by Darkness played on Chaz's negative emotions and his fear of failure by showing him that no matter what choice he made, he would never succeed. Because if Chaz chose to set Ojama Yellow, his opponent would draw a monster with a piercing effect. And if he used Reload, then the card he'd end up drawing would be Level Up, bricking him since now he didn't have a monster to defend himself. Chaz had to repeat this hell over and over until he eventually chose to cheat, and he was immediately caught, allowing for the darkness in his heart to fully take over his mind. At least until Jaden managed to push back Night Shroud and inspire his friends to continue to fight. The sad thing is, cards like Reload might lead you to the same fate in the actual game. Mulligans are conceptually quite strong, and feature in a lot of other card games as a mechanic to ensure both players don't brick. Yu-Gi-Oh, however, doesn't have mulligans built in as a mechanic, and is instead reliant on cards like Reload and Mallet to refresh your hand. However, these cards are unreliable, and can't guarantee they'll show up to change your hand if you happen to brick. 
and even if you do draw them, there's a chance that the new hand you get is just as unplayable. As a result, most strategies would rather play more engine pieces and starter cards that would increase the chances of having a playable hand, rather than wasting a card with a mulligan. However, a couple of strategies have managed to make use of either Mallet or Reload with the likes of Magical Explosion and Spellbook decks using both because of the advantage they gain from the spell cards, with Mallet and Reload not only allowing these decks to unbreak their hands, but also bringing them closer to their particular win condition. Thankfully, the Powers of Darkness aren't too strong in the TCG, so you'll rarely have to rely on Mallet or Reload to save you from hell. But if you do, you'll have to pray that your luck is a lot better than Chaz's if you need to win a duel with him. And at number 8 is Masked Dragon, an amazing support card for Chaz's Armed Dragon strategy. And that's because Masked Dragon lets you special summon any dragon monster from your deck when it's destroyed by battle, so as long as that monster has 1500 or less attack. Which makes it excellent for Chaz's Armed Dragons, as he could use his effect to summon at Armed Dragon level 3 and begin leveling up all the way into level 7 and level 10. But notably, Masked Dragon itself is also a dragon with less than 1500 attack so it can summon another copy of itself, which is exactly what Chaz did in his final duel in the series against Aster Phoenix, where Chaz crashed his own masked dragon with Diamond Dude to ensure they were both destroyed by battle, which then allowed Chaz to summon a second copy to attack again and deal with Aster's Dread Servant. Then, when this second copy was destroyed, he summoned a third copy, and when that masked dragon was destroyed, finally he summoned out level 3, which began Chaz's climb into level 10, a monster so strong it can compete with Destiny and Dragon, and helped Chaz win the duel, so in a way, Mass Dragon represents the shining future Chaz had as a pro. But it also represents a potentially ruinous path as well. As in Darkness's world, when Chaz was driven to cheat after so many losses, the card he ended up drawing was Mass Dragon, which would have allowed him to win the duel at the cost of his pride if he hadn't been caught. Thankfully, in the TCG, Mass Dragon only represents a good future because it actually is a pretty solid recruiter. Now, in the modern era, recruiters like Mass Dragon aren't used much anymore because they're very slow and unreliable and most decks prefer cards that can special summon from the deck immediately without relying on the battle phase. But in the past, cards like Mystic Tomato, Mother Grizzly, and even Mass Dragon were staples that gave you easy access to some of the best cards that were sleeping within your deck. The most popular of these recruiters was Mystic Tomato because of the huge pool of powerful dark monsters it could summon. But Mass Dragon was also a useful staple in dragon strategies as the game had a lot of great monsters, and getting easy access to them could put you at a huge advantage. In fact, the monsters you could summon were so strong that often Chaz's move of crashing his unmasked dragon was actually worth it, as it gave you immediate access to these powerful monsters at the cost of a few life points. And so it's cool to see that Masked Dragon's hidden potential has actually been unlocked in the TCG, and for similar reasons to why Chaz used it, while showcasing his potential as a Duel Academy graduate and pro duelist. Returning to the number 10 spot is Return from the Different Dimension, a card that proved that Chaz could work his way up from the bottom of the barrel. Likewise, even if a card is in the banished pile, Return proves that they can work their way back, as by paying half of your life points you can special summon as many of your banished monsters as possible. But during the end phase of the turn, the monster you summon will be banished once more. Now technically, Return wasn't part of Chaz's usual strategy. In fact, most of his original Cathodian deck had actually been destroyed by water damage when he tried to leave Duel Academy for good after his humiliating defeat to Bastion. But after almost drowning, Chaz met a strange figure who guided him to North Academy. The only issue was that in order to enter the school, you had to have a 40 card deck. So Chaz had to assemble a new strategy by foraging and performing death defined stunts to form a new deck, with Return for the Different Dimension being one of those cards. And it ended up being a vile pickup. You see, when Chaz first entered the school, he was forced into initiation to determine where he ranked, and moved his way up from the very bottom, defeating every single duelist until he faced the final boss of the school. Despite how low Chaz thought of himself, he exuded confidence in this duel and managed to completely outsmart the Tsar, who walked right into Chaz's trap by dealing 3000 damage to him. This let Chaz use Infernal Tempest to banish every monster from both players' decks, which seemed like a strange move at first, but it was a genius ploy as after clearing Tsar's monster in the field, Chaz then used Return to bring back all five of his banished monsters and immediately OTK the Tsar, establishing him as North Academy's new number one student. And in the TCG, Return for the Different Dimension holds a similar capability. A lot of strong decks throughout Yu-Gi-Oh's history have needed to banish cards in some way in order to use their most powerful monsters. From the likes of Dark Armed Dragon, who could banish dark monsters to pop cards, to Chaos Monsters and Dragon Rulers that could banish monsters to specific attributes and types to bring themselves out. And it's within these strategies where Return excelled, as it gave these decks a way to recur their banished monsters so they could be used again. You see, it's usually pretty common to see a deck using the graveyard as a resource in some way, but it's considerably more niche and much more difficult to use the banished pile in a similar way. But cards like Return opened up that resource and gave any deck that banishes access to an amazing turnaround tool. 
What returned would be used for varies on the era, with its earliest uses taking advantage of the individual strength of monsters summoned and as an OTK tool to swiftly put up an end to an opponent. But during the Dragon Ruler era, we got to see how busted return truly was, as instead of just being an OTK tool, the monsters summoned by return could be used as materials for extra deck summons, which gave you the chance to rebuild into an impressive board off of a single card. It's for all of these reasons that return was eventually banned as the way Chaz used the card ended up being just too strong for TCG use. So it's no wonder that this was the card that allowed him to return to the top of the pecking order. Spelling out Doom at number 6 is VWXYZ Dragon Catapult Cannon, the upgraded form of Seto Kaiba's XYZ Dragon Cannon. Catapult Cannon is actually a fusion of the original XYZ boss monster and VW Tiger Jet, a combination of two new light machine monsters that were unique to Chaz's arsenal. Like its weaker counterparts, you don't actually use polymerization to summon this card, because instead you have to banish its materials from the field to perform a contact fusion. And because it's an even stronger version of XYZ, Catapult Cannon has a similar but better effect which lets you discard a card to banish any opponent's card, and even has an extra effect that lets you change the battle position of a monster that this card attacks. This meant that no one was safe from Catapult Cannon's onslaught, a fact that Jaden Yuki learned the hard way during his field test against Chaz, where it almost gave Chaz a victory against the Slifer Slacker thanks to its powerful removal effect. However, the thing that made Dragon Catapult Cannon so formidable was Chaz's skill. A lesser duelist would have struggled to bring out such a complicated mech, but Chaz often found a way to bring it out during the early stages of a duel, and even summoned it during his very first duel against Adrian Gecko, where it seemed almost unstoppable, especially when paired with Hyper Coat, which not only boosted its attack stat, but made it completely unaffected by all card effects. Unfortunately though, very few duelists in the TCG can claim to have Chaz's skill set as most people have struggled to make use of Dragon Catapult Cannon. Its removal effect is really strong since it can deal with any card in the field and even banishes it, dodging destruction protection, and preventing any graveyard effects which makes it a solid upgrade from its XYZ's effects. But it's a really difficult monster to summon, even when compared to XYZ Dragon Cannon, as VWXYZ needs 5 specific monsters to hit the field so they can be turned into its fusion components, but these monsters don't have any effects to make the swarming easier. Now, there are a few cards in the modern era that support unions and make the likes of Catapult Cannon easier to bring out, but it's pretty hard to bring out as both X-Head Cannon and V-Tiger Jet aren't union monsters, so they don't benefit from this new support. Thankfully though, the VDO XYZ monsters have a sister series of union monsters known as the ABC monsters, who can contact fuse into ABC Dragon Buster, an incredibly powerful boss monster with a similarly strong removal effect that can be used during either player's turn at quick effect speed, and an ability to tag out into its components. And as a result, ABC-focused strategies have been a competitively viable deck for years, and constantly evolve and adapt into new variants to suit different metas, including Ojama ABC, a deck that takes advantage of Ojama Simulation to easily bring out all three components of this excellent boss monster. And so, while Chaz and Kaiba's main mechs have never really seen too much success, it's very cool that their concepts are kept alive in the modern day through ABC strategies, and their synergy with Ojamas specifically allows you to Chaz it up against even the toughest meta opponents. And giving life to the number 5 spot is Chaos Necromancer, a card that served as evidence that Chaz could carve his own path in life and didn't need to rely on the help of his family. Now, Necromancer has an interesting effect that allows it to gain attack equal to the number of your monsters in your graveyard, which could potentially turn it into a powerful beat stick. But with no cards in the grave, Necromancer is a pitiful monster, with zero attack and defense, which made it useless to most duelists. But the Chaz isn't most duelists, a fact that he proved to his brothers. You see, the Princeton brothers had hoped that Chaz would rule over the dueling world so their family could exert their influence across the globe. But because of Chaz's many losses and humiliations, he's been deemed a failure by his brothers. So they took matters into their own hands and attempted to gain power over the world of duel monsters by buying Duel Academy from its current owner, Seto Kaiba. Kaiba isn't a man that can be bought with money, so instead, the Princeton brothers proposed a duel for the Academy, to which Kaiba agreed and stated that any duelist from his school could beat them. And the student that the Princeton brothers chose to face was their own brother, Chaz, who was forced to duel the stipulation that disallowed him from using any monsters with 500 or more attack to make it fair for his less experienced brothers. Chaz didn't shy away from this challenge. In fact, he one upped it even further by only playing monsters with zero attack. These monsters were the bottom of the barrel, the worst of the worst. Cards deemed so terrible by the people that played them, they threw them down a well to never be seen again. At least until Chaz came and rescued those lost spirits so he could use them in his duel against his brother, whose deck was made up of extremely rare and powerful dragon monsters. But despite being at a disadvantage, Chaz crushed his brothers with an OTK consisting of the reunited Ojama trio and the power of Chaos Necromancer, 
which now had an absurd 3300 attack which won Chance the duel, saving Duel Academy and showing Chance's brothers that he wasn't a failure that they thought he was. In the TCG though, Chaos Necromancer holds a similar status to its anime counterpart. It's not a good card, and has never seen any competitive success whatsoever. But this duel managed to prove one thing, that even the weakest cards in the game can be a genuine threat with the right duelist using them. Now, there are definitely a lot of powerful monsters with zero attack in Yu-Gi-Oh, but even beyond stats, cards that a lot of people think are useless can have a lot of hidden utility that most people can't see. And this utility could be anything, from an enabler for cards like Small World to being a necessary engine piece, to even being a staple whose effects can counter one of the best decks of the format. Essentially, even if a card has never had a competitive spotlight, Yu-Gi-Oh! was a game centered around innovation, so those previously useless cards might just be the secret to solving a format. Chaos Necromancer might not be a good card right now, but one day there may even be a deck centered around it, just like how Grand Maju, a similar card that gains attack based on banished monsters, ended up seeing solid success in the modern day purely by being a strong beat stick. And in a way, that represents Chaz perfectly. He was deemed a terrible duelist by his brothers but through sheer sure determination, managed to prove that he was worthy of their respect. So if there's ever a card you're tempted to write off, just remember that even the worst monsters or effects out there could be a secret powerhouse. And shining into number 4 is White Veil, the calling card of the Society of Light. And that makes sense as White Veil envelops the monsters equipped to with a shiny glow that staves off the effects of spell and trap cards. Because if the monsters equipped to battles, it prevents your opponent from activating back row until the end of the damage step, and the moment that monster attacks, face up a back row controlled by your opponent also have their effects negated until the end of the damage step. But that's not all, as if the monster White Veil is equipped to destroys a monster by battle, you get to destroy all spell and trap cards your opponent controls. However, White Veil also comes with a small but noticeable downside, as if it ever leaves the field while face up in the spell and trap card zone, you take 3000 damage. This made White Veil an intense card that gave its wielder a huge advantage, as it made any battle phase oriented back row entirely useless. So it only made sense for Sartorius to gift this card to his most trusted members, with Chance Princeton being the first to receive it as he was the first person in Duel Academy brought under the Light of Destruction's influence. And at first, it didn't seem like the new Chaz was a legitimate threat, but as time passed, he grew comfortable in his new role and even took over the entirety of the Obelisk Blue Dorm, with each win bringing another student under the control of the Light until Obelisk Blue was painted white. Now, Chaz hadn't been Sartorius' first pick to spearhead the society, but he had shown that he was capable as a servant, and one who almost managed to induct every student in the school into the society, with the only exceptions being Jaden and his friends. But not everyone was so lucky, as when Alexis dueled Chaz to defend the honor of Obelisk Blue, Chaz not only forced Alexis into a desperate position by summoning Armed Dragon level 10, he also prevented Alexis from ending the duel in a draw with the effect of White Veil, which allowed Chaz to attack and destroy Cyber Angel Dakini without the interference of Double Passe and caused Alexis to fall under the control of the light. But in the TCG, the Society of Light would have never stood a chance. White Veil is an interesting card because it can invalidate a lot of battle traps, and the fact that it can clear away an opponent's entire back row is an amazing effect. And the best part is that it's generic, so any monster can be protected by the light. But the issue is that even prior to the release of White Veil, there were a ton of back row removal options that allowed you to sweep away your opponent's threats that were just way easier to use. As instead of being to destroy an opponent's monster by battle, these cards could deal with a bunch of back row for the low cost of a normal summon, a discard, or sometimes even no cost at all. So White Veil was redundant even before it was released, as less awkward and stronger cards were already available. Still, if you want to shine as bright as Chaz did, you can at least rely on the power of one of his latest Armed Dragon monsters, Armed Dragon Level 10 White, a monster that's actually capable of searching White Veil. But for now, it's probably a good thing the Society of Lysis 8 card is more of a novelty than a genuine threat, as otherwise your locals might be getting a bright makeover. Burning to number 3 is Thonian Polymer, a part of Chaz's initial Thonian strategy that almost allowed him to defeat his longtime rival. And that's because Polymer actually counters Jaden's biggest strength, Fusion Summoning. As whenever an opponent Fusion Summons a monster, you can activate Thonian Polymer by tributing one monster in order to take control of their Fusion Monster permanently. This made it one of Chaz's best anti-Jaden options, as no matter how he combined his heroes, Thony and Polymer gave Chaz a way to bring out their dark side. And we got to see this during Chaz and Jaden's very first duel, where Chaz stole Jaden's Flame Wingman, a play that put him at a huge advantage. But Polymer's most important moment in the series was actually when it wasn't used at all in Jaden and Chaz's final face-off, where Chaz was actually dueling in Aster's place to fulfill his obligation to a TV producer. 
But this particular producer had a terrible dueling philosophy, as he believed that making an entertaining duel was much more important than two duelists trying their hardest. And so forced Chaz into a costume and made him humiliate himself for laughs under the new title of Ojimed Jome. This culminated in Jaden and Chaz's final duel, where the hero summoned out his favorite card, Flame Wingman. Chaz was prepared and had Thonian Polymer set, which would have let him steal Flame Wingman and win the duel. But before he could activate the card, the producer whispered to him and told him he had to lose in an embarrassing way. So Thonian Polymer essentially represented Chaz's pride as a duelist. He could either activate the card to defeat Jade and hold on to that pride, or he could swallow it for the sake of entertainment. And so Chaz activated Ojama Trio. To get laughs out of the audience, this won him the TV producer's favor, but made Jaden disappointed in him. And what's worse is that Aster had staked his future as a pro duelist on Chaz's win, so even though Chaz was trying to help Aster, he almost ruined his career. Thankfully, after this duel, the TV producer was exposed as a criminal that stole the ultimate D card, so Aster could return to pro dueling and Chaz was able to shed his Ojama costume and even win his next duel against Aster, showcasing that he never needed to rely on silly gimmicks to be a pro duelist, he just needed his pride. Unfortunately though, Thonian Polymer isn't likely to give you the same competitive edge against a pro duelist in the TCG. Stealing an opponent's fusion monster permanently is actually a pretty strong effect, and well worth the cost of a tribute. But it's an incredibly specific counter. Meanwhile, a card like Enemy Controller with a similar cost and effect can be used against virtually every strategy. And even with the niche of countering fusions, there are a ton of cards that do a way better job. And so it's definitely a shame that the representation of Chaz's Pride, a card that would have beaten Jade and Yuki, isn't really that amazing in the real game. So if you want to hold on to your pride like Chaz, there are better options out there. Armed and ready at number two are the Armed Dragon Monsters from level three all the way up to level 10. These monsters are all level monsters and so go upgrade into the higher levels whenever a specific condition is met. The first armored dragon is level 3, which can easily be brought out to the field whose only effect is to summon out armed dragon level 5 during the standby phase by sending it to the graveyard. Armed dragon level 5 has an effect upgrade, where during the end phase it can be leveled up to level 7 during the turn where it destroyed a monster by battle. However, it also has an effect to send a monster from your hand to the graveyard to destroy a monster in the field with an attack less than or equal to the monster sent. And level 5's upgrades have stronger variants of this effect. With level 7, you get to destroy all monsters your opponent controls with attack less than or equal to the monster you sent, while level 10 can use any card as costs and can destroy all face-up monsters no matter their attack stat. And when these dragons were all used in tandem, they were a deadly part of Chaz's arsenal, allowing him to easily snowball from weak level 3s all the way up into the dominant level 10s. And in a way, that makes the armed dragons the perfect representation of Chaz as they start off as weak monsters that, if given the chance to grow, can go on to do extraordinary things. Funnily enough though, the Armed Dragons weren't originally part of Chaz's deck. They were actually awarded to him when he became North Academy's number one student, so that he'd have an extra boost in power against Jade and Yuki in the inter-school duel. But make no mistake, Chaz wasn't just gifted these cards. He'd earned them by fighting every single North Academy student, working his way up from the bottom with a deck made up of scraps. This victory earned him a lot the Armed Dragon cards, and the right to face off against Jade and Yugi, but it also earned him the favor of North Academy students who came up with a chant to support their new king. In the English version, this chant is the iconic Chaz It Up, while in the Japanese anime, the chant was 1, 10, 1000, 1000, Manjom Thunder. And given that the Armed Dragons are analogous to Chaz's journey, it only makes sense for them to also have retrains of each Armed Dragon to include Thunder within their name. But even with this new title, none of the original Armed Dragons or their Thunder counterparts have ever been too successful, because of their unfortunate reliance on needing to level up. This made it so that you had to go out of your way to keep your weaker armored dragons on the field so that you could eventually upgrade them and make them stronger. But these upgraded forms were incredibly bricky and were never worth the payoff. Because while a field wipe is an amazing effect to have, reaching even level 7 requires a ton of resources and time investment. The modern Thunder Monsters do a good job of making the level mechanic easier to give, and stronger payoffs, but outside of brief experimentation in Dragon Link, the strategy hasn't been able to keep up with the modern game. However, there is one armed dragon that stands above the rest and terrorized the game for years, Dark Armed Dragon. Dark Arm was a boss monster amongst boss monsters, thanks to its easy summoning condition and absurd removal effect, which lets you banish a dark monster from your graveyard to target and destroy any card in the field, which had no once per turn. So a single Dark Arm could wipe away most of a field and was so strong that one of Yu-Gi-Oh's first tier zero formats was consolidated around the deck that could use Dark Arm to its full potential, Teledad. So while it's definitely a shame that neither the original or Thunder versions of the Armed Dragons, Chaz's growth as a duelist is well represented in Dark Armed. But there's a trio of monsters that represent Chaz's journey even better than the Armed Dragons. And butting into number one is Ojama Yellow. 
the leader of the Ojama Trio, and Chaz Princeton's ace monster. For an ace card though, Ojama Yellow is extraordinarily weak with 0 attack and 1000 defense, but supposedly the Ojamas contain a hidden power as if the Ojama trio ever reunited, something is said to happen. Now at first glance, Ojama Yellow seems like an unfitting ace for a powerful duelist like the Chaz, and initially he would have agreed, as even with the spirit of Ojama Yellow revealing itself to him and the promise that the card would help him grow stronger, he saw it as a zero attack trash that only served to annoy him. He was correct, really correct, as Ojama Yellow clearly aggravated him as both a monster and as a dual spirit partner and grew even more annoyed after he reunited with the Ojama Trio, as instead of just dealing with one cowardly and weak spirit, he had to deal with three. But Chaz seemed to have some strange affinity for his trash, because no matter how much the Ojama Trio irritated him, they were a mainstay of his strategy because his philosophy on the cards had shifted. They were still garbage to him, but they were garbage that served as testaments to his strength as a duelist, as only someone as intelligent and as bold as him would be able to reveal the hidden strength of an Ojama. And this wasn't just his arrogance, as Chaz showed an incredible proficiency when using the Ojama Trio, and even managed to reveal the hidden power their flavor text described, not only with the strength of Ojama Delta Hurricane, but also by combining them to form Ojama Kink, who could be a pretty impressive beatstick when paired with Oja Muscle. In fact, no matter how much Chaz seemed to dismay the thought of his dual spirits, his confidence bloomed whenever he used them, as if he were proud of them, because in a way, Chaz saw a lot of himself within these rejects, because like him, they were mocked and treated as failures, so any win they got was proof that even Trash can be strong. And with Ojama Yellow by his side, he achieved his greatest victory of the series against Aster Phoenix, with Chaz's trust and pride in Yellow being put on full display as his ace monsters delivered the final blow. The only sad part about this movement was that Chaz was right. Only someone like him was capable of going pro with Ojamas, as in the TCG, the deck is terrible. Now, there are a ton of creative and interesting ways to unlock the hidden power contained with the Ojama strategy, from its synergy to ABC Dragon Buster, to a surprisingly effectiveness at link climbing, to even blocking your opponent's zone so they can't be used at all. But the main issue with most Ojama decks is that they are all reliant on you playing the original three Ojama monsters, who, despite how Chaz used them, are all terrible vanilla monsters that are incredibly bricky and do virtually nothing on their own for the most part, are treated as a joke by both competitive and casual players alike. In fact, the Ojama Trio are so terrible that the only way they've seen play is when they were given to your opponent through the effect of Ojama Trio, a trap card that can clog up your opponent's monster zones with worthless tokens that end up burning an opponent each time they're destroyed, and once had the potential to stop an opponent from playing entirely, upholding the Ojama's annoying nature. But even Ojama Trio fell from grace in the modern day, because while it did have a ton of synergy with Mystic Mind decks, once Mind was banned, there was no reason for any deck to play Trio, as it just gave your opponent three monsters they could use for a free Link monster. So, as it currently stands, the Ojamas really do live up to how they were portrayed in the anime. They're annoying, useless, and downright ugly, to the point where their only real success was being so bad that it was better to give your opponent an Ojama rather than keeping them on your own field. And pretty much no duelist has ever been able to make the deck work. No duelist except the chance, as the Ojamas embody his will to climb up from the bottom of the barrel his intelligence as a duelist to win with such worthless cards, and his pride because no matter how worthless these cards are, he is always going to be proud of his particular trio.